theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight is a story of the Golden West with Lorne Green as your host. Here's a preview. I'm not from this neck of the woods. I, I'm from Liberia in Africa. Hey, well, what's your, what's your handle? Mine's Charlie C. Reed. My handle is Joseph Jenkins Roberts. Okay, J.J., from Liberia, Africa. Let's climb up on old nail gal here and make some slow moves around town. The Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. This is Lucille Ball, here to make a personal appeal to every American. Since the 1880s, the American Red Cross has been stepping in when there's been big trouble, like a hurricane. But nobody has to tell you the Red Cross is there when a hurricane strikes. So let's talk about the other Red Cross, your neighborhood Red Cross. They teach kids to swim. That's good, Eddie. And they train about every lifeguard on every beach. it's possible to look into it. We can get in touch with the local chapter. They help veterans get on their feet. They help people relocate after fires. Are you comfortable? Okay, now relax. They collect and distribute blood. They give a hand to the older folks in your town and do scores of other jobs. It's running very nicely. It's easy to see why we've got to have Red Cross, and only you can keep Red Cross ready for the little emergencies in your neighborhood and the big ones. Help keep Red Cross ready. This is Lorne Green. The country we're traveling through is beautiful. No other word could describe it any better. It's spring, 1875, and we're in Wyoming Territory. In 15 years, it'll be the 44th state in the Union and the first state in the world to give women the right to vote and hold office. The Battle of the Little Big Horn is a year away, and in March of this year, the Congress enacted the Civil Rights Law that guarantees everyone equal access to public inns, public conveyances, and the like. I don't think my fellow passengers would be terribly interested in these odds and ends. They all seem to be more interested in what they see out of the window. One of them shows an intense interest. He's had his nose almost pressed to the glass for an hour. Interesting looking young fellow, about 20 or so. Aside from being a black man, he's dressed in a very colorful robe, green, sky blue, yellow, and red. He has a red, green, and black skull cap perched on the back of his head. It would be really interesting to know what he feels about the wild, wide, open West. So much space. The land stretches as far as the eye can see. And when it is no longer level, it becomes hilly, and the hills become pyramids with sugar on the tops. Grandfather and grandmother were right. There is no country like this western country. The sky seems even bluer than our Liberian sky, and there is more land than I ever thought possible. I must sink myself deeply into an understanding of this place, because it is my ancestral home as much as Africa, because this is where grandfather and grandmother came from. Perhaps I will find some relatives. It does not seem likely. I've only seen ten black people since we left Lincoln, Nebraska. Incredibly, an African tourist of American descent is checking out a branch of his roots. And that's how we begin this particular story, which, though fictional, has a basis in fact. Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening, brought to you five nights a week by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops. Your hosts, Lorne Green. I'll bring you stories of the Old West and the New. Andy Griffith with a look at the funny side of life. Vincent Price with tales of mystery and suspense. Cicely Tyson with stories about love hate, and related things. Richard Whitmark. I'll bring you stories of pure adventure. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis' production of 
the Sears Radio Theater. Our story, The Afro-Westerner, by Odie Hawkins. Our star, Brock Peters. The word's out and spreading fast about the jeans from Sears Men's Store that grow old beautifully. It's a sure sign they're fitting fine and feeling good. For the denim that keeps going strong a long time. Get them trim cut, regular cut, even get them pre-washed. The jeans that grow old beautifully. Now at most Sears retail stores. What would it cost to replace your car's muffler, including installation? Oh, I'd say about $50. No, wait, $45. It'd be around $30. I guess about $40. The Illuminized Sears muzzler is only $19.99. That's half of what I guessed. It's hard to believe. On a Cadillac? That's a terrific price. With installation included. Yes. Should have known it. Sears. The muzzler, just $19.99 installed. Clamps if needed, 99 cents each extra. Sizes to fit most American-made cars. Prices may vary in Alaska and Hawaii at most Sears Tire and Auto Centers. Clinging jerseys, tight satin tops, they only look good if they hug your body smoothly. Sears Best Abra Light helps you and your clothes look good. How? Abra Light has no seam cups and straps adjust in the back so you look great up front. Whatever you do, whether it's dashing around town or simmering with disco fever in that slinky dress, it's flattering fun with the Sears Abra Light. Available at most larger Sears retail stores. Oh, here I go again. It's time to rent one of those steam-type carpet cleaners. Why rent? Now Sears puts power in a carpet cleaner you can own yourself. The Power Spray from Sears for easy home carpet cleaning. Power Spray sprays hot water into your carpet, then sucks up the dirty water. You can see the dirt you get out. Dirt you didn't even know was there. The Power Spray Carpet Cleaner, a convenient carpet cleaner you can own yourself. Available at most Sears retail stores. Kenmore. <coughs> Solid as Sears. The brakes are applied and the train slows down. Ahead, a place that's more than a settlement. The young black man stares out the window. Laramie! Laramie! Is this truly Laramie, sir? As you live and breathe, young fella. Thank you. Joseph Jenkins Roberts of Monrovia, Liberia hopped from the train with three overstuffed carpet bags and stood on the train platform looking and feeling completely lost. Howdy, stranger. My name is Homer Judson, better known to some people hereabouts as Nosy Judson. I'm a reporter for the Laramie Sentinel, and I couldn't help thinking, Homer, this is your human interest story of the week. How about an exchange? You give me your story, and I'll help you find a place to stay. A deal? A deal? Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Joseph Jenkins Roberts, and I could certainly use some help. Couldn't we all? Beg pardon? Uh, never mind. This all your luggage? Yes, I, I decided to travel light. Well, yeah, let's thank the Lord for lightweight things. Come on, partner, follow me. Thank you, I, I appreciate your help. Yeah, well, I hope you'll be thanking me when we get to Mrs. O'Leary's boarding house, but meanwhile, since I seem to have picked up the bag you packed with boulders, why don't you give me your story? Won't you need a pencil and pad? As unusual as your story is sure to be, I'm sure my photographic memory will retain it. All you have to do is talk as we walk and don't leave anything out. Now, remember, the, the Sentinel prints all the news it's fit to print, and that means all the news it's news. Well, first of all, I, I am the nephew of the current vice president of Liberia. Liberia? Yes, Liberia, West Africa. Ah. You, you see, it, it happened like this. Oh. And stay the hell out of here, Charlie Reed. Can you learn how to behave yourself? Hey, go on, Joe. This is Laramie. And lots of people misbehave all the time. Uh, yes. Yes, I know. My grandfather told me about it. You, your grandfather? Yes. My, my grandfather and grandmother were born to slavery on a plantation in Louisiana. Uh, they escaped when she was 15 and he was 18. They have told me their story many times. Don't 
Don't let that throw you. Laramie is full of cowboys, especially on Saturday night. Go on. <laughs> I, I, I must say, the, the atmosphere is much more lively than Monrovia. Uh, you were saying about your grandparents? Oh, oh, yes. They knew that the only way to be free was to make it to a free territory. In addition, grandmother says, grandfather had seen some pictures of a cowboy and, and wanted to become one. Your grandfather had seen some pictures of a cowboy and wanted to become one? Yes, Grandmother always smiles when she says that. At, at any rate, after a, an incredible number of hardships, they made it to this town, to Laramie. They say it is where they began to be human beings for the first time. Oh, it, it would take several hours to tell all the things they went through. Yeah, I can imagine. What year was it that they made it here? It was 1807. They built a cabin near a place called uh, Misty. Oh, yeah, that's about 30, 35 miles northeast of here. That close? Oh, I, I would like to see it very much this evening. Whoa, 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 take it easy. Why not tomorrow, after you've had a chance to get a good night's sleep? Uh, you were saying? Oh, oh, yes, yes, well, they lived in, in this place, Misty. My grandfather, being a curious man one day, found some small nuggets of gold in the stream behind their cabin. Gold? yes. He found gold, but he didn't tell anyone, only my grandmother. For ten years, they secretly panned gold from this stream and others near, and when they got news of people being given a chance to resettle in Africa, they decided to go. I recall that. It was in 1820-something, and the American Colonization Society was behind it. A bunch of hypocrites. Uh, uh, yes, 1822 to be exact. My grandfather and grandmother say that many free people of color were not happy about being offered a chance to return to Africa. They felt, since they had been born here, that no one should think of leaving, or that no one should think of asking them to leave. And there were those, like my grandparents, who welcomed the chance to go. To them, Africa represented a new frontier. They were born slaves and emigrated to Africa as free people with $15,000 in gold. That's quite a story. My grandfather thinks so, too. His talking about his life here made me want to see the land of his birth. My mother and father didn't want me to come, but my grandparents did. Go, they said. Go and tell us what you see. So I came here. And here we are. Now... Don't let Mrs. O'Leary frighten you. She's always a bit much at first, but you'll find she's not as dreadful as she appears. This is the living room dining room where everybody gathers for the five o'clock meal. The guest rooms are upstairs and And here's what Mrs. have you O'Leary. brought me this time, Armor Judson? A wishy donny complicated looking fella in a triple colored nightgown with a Yiddish cap on his head. <laughs> Glory be to heaven. His name is Joseph Jenkins Roberts, and he hails from Liberia, West Africa. And I've already told him that you make the best son of a gun stew and deep dish apple pie this side of the Mississippi. Oh, there you go again, Homer Judson, wrapping your spit around a bunch of words that sound sweet to my ears. <laughs> <laughs> well, how long are you going to be staying with this young fella? Uh, well, about two weeks or so, I guess. Oh, primi fashy, that'll give you just enough time to become part of the family. <laughs> Well, come along. Let me show you to your room. I'll take those bags oh, for you. Oh, no, 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 thank you. I, I, I can manage... Come on, hand them, me boy -o. In Mrs. O'Leary's house, Mrs. O'Leary makes the rules. Homer, will you be coming in for dinner this evening? Uh, not this evening, Mrs. O'Leary. I've got a great human interest piece to write up for the morning edition. See you later, Joe. Writers... They always got something to write. Well, come along, Joseph Jenkins Roberts. I'll be showing you to your room. So, you got three names rolled into one, huh? Well, why not? Whoever said we should only be afflicted with two names? Now, you can eat three meals a day, if you like, or only dinner, depending on what your appetite is like. Now, <clears throat> most of my boarders eat breakfast at 6.30 and dinner at 5. Have you a man-sized appetite, Joseph Jenkins Roberts? Uh, well, Good. I, uh... Now then, it'll be $2 for your rent for the week and $3 with meals. 
No fancy women whiskey drinking beyond certain points or serious card playing allowed. And here's your room. Dinner's in 20 minutes, and we're having chicken and dumplings this evening. <laughs> Dear Mother, you must read this letter to Grandfather and Grandmother to tell them that I am finding everything that they have spoken of to be true. I've been here in Laramie for five days now, and so much has happened already that I hardly know where to begin. I am living in a boarding house, owned and operated by a, an Irish lady. She She's very tall has hair the color of rusty pipes, talks very quickly, cooks huge pots of food, and, and is very nice. I think she drinks whiskey when no one is watching. I was taken to this place by Homer, a reporter on the Laramie Sentinel that I met at the train station. I'm enclosing the article he wrote about me. It's the first ever written about an African in Wyoming territory. Homer Johnson is a very nice person. I have not run into any problems of race, Mother, so far. Most of the people are well informed as to who I am and, and what I am doing here. It seems that even those who don't read the newspaper know my name and where I'm from and everything. I guess Mrs. O'Leary is responsible for that. She's like the drums we have at home. Taking Homer Judson's advice, I have purchased a pair of boots to go riding in. I did not tell him that I did not know how to ride. But I will learn. It is late now and I must go to sleep. Mrs. O'Leary expects everyone to attend breakfast. I send my deepest love and respect. Joseph. Join millions of Americans and shop the easy way with a Sears credit card. All you do to apply is call toll-free 800-526-0444. It's your entry to shopping convenience and quality merchandise. Your card will be accepted at over 3,600 Sears stores across the nation. And you can choose from over 100,000 Sears products and services. Even use it for your catalog orders. In the store or over the phone, just say charge it. Call 800-526-0444. New Jersey residents call 800-652-2777 for your Sears credit card. The word's out and spreading fast about the jeans from Sears Men's Store that grow old beautifully. It's a sure sign they're feeling fine and feeling good. For the denim that keeps going strong a long time. Get them trim cut, regular cut, even get them pre-washed. The jeans that grow old beautifully. Now at most Sears retail stores. Can't believe you owe the IRS that much. Well, when things just don't add up, you can count on a Sears desk calculator to help you. Add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Then read the figures two different ways. 12-digit lighted display and tape printout for your records. There's a two-memory system that helps ease multi-step problems, plus its many extras make it a great time saver. Now at most Sears retail stores. Sears two-memory desk calculator. Cut $25, just $99.99 through March 10th. Prices and dates may vary in Alaska and Hawaii. To look the height of fashion wherever I go requires many coats. But for home, I need only one coat fashion surrounding me. Sears Best Easy Living Interior Paint. One coat of easy living on the walls and every room looks stunning. While I entertain or just relax. Choose from 24 decorator colors in easy living flat latex and semi-gloss. Plus bright white ceiling paint for your home. Because with Sears Easy Living Paint, all you need is one coat. When used as directed at most Sears retail stores. Joseph Jenkins Roberts settled in and became a part of the community. It wasn't an instant process. It took a while. There were things to learn, customs to observe. Watching Joe wobble down the street in a pair of the fanciest boots ever cobbled has got to be one of my all-time favorite memories. Being the adventurous type he was, it didn't take much to convince him, being in the West and all, that he should saddle up 
I had a strong suspicion that he might wind up sitting backwards on the creature. I've seen tenderfoots do everything. <laughs> hey, I wouldn't try to climb up on that ornery old saddle sore if I was you. You wouldn't? Why not? Because it just might be the last ride you'll ever have. Now, you just take a peek at that devil's eyes. He's just waiting for you to mount up so he can buck your little old dark body through the roof. Now, you come on over here, bub. Let's pick out a piece of crow bait that'll put up with your inexperience. Old Nelly looks like a good choice. How long you been riding? I, uh, I, I, I never been riding. I, on a horse. What? You pulling my leg? Beg your pardon? I said, are you pulling my leg? You got buffalo snot in your ears or something? <laughs> no. It, it, it's just that you say things in a funny way. Well, come to think of it, you sound a shade strange yourself. That there nightshirt on and that there beanie cap on your head. I take it you ain't from around this neck of the woods. Uh, no, I, I'm i not from this neck of the woods. I, I'm from Liberia in Africa. Yeah, I kind of figured you was from somewhere else. Hey, well, what's your, what's your handle? Mine's Charlie C. Reed, a cowpokes card player fresh out of the calaboose after celebrating a month's trail pay down the drain. My handle is Joseph Jenkins Roberts. Okay, J.J. from Liberia, Africa. Let's climb up on old nail gal here and make some slow moves around town. I'd advise you to hold her down to a gallop till we get to the edge of town. Uh, uh, not from that side, J.J. I see you wasn't joking when you said you never rode a horse. I told you. <laughs> oh, well, we all had to learn sometime. Yeah, let's give it our best shot. Who knows, you might get to liking the feel of a fast horse under you. Charlie, how can I make it slow down? You can't. If you went any slower, you'd be standing still. And quit squeezing that old gal's neck so hard, she'll think you're in love with her. <laughs> Dear Father, I am addressing this especially to you. It is what might be called a man's letter. A few days ago, I met two new people. They are both now my friends. It seems that this is the way it is here. You can be strangers one day and friends the next day, or enemies. My two new friends are named Charlie Reed and Alfred Wong. Charlie is a cowboy. The other day, after we rode to the edge of town and back, Charlie asked me if I had any money. I said yes. He was quite pleased and said, great, let's go into the dirty garter saloon for a little sipping, spitting and cussing. There was tension when we walked into the saloon. From the way the people lined up at the bar stared at me, I felt self-conscious. I will have to buy cowboy clothes and a wide-brimmed hat to go with my boots. Charlie ended the tension by saying, My buddy J.J. here from Liberia, Africa, is buying a round for the house. <sighs> Many of them patted me on the back and said nice things as, as they rushed to get their round. And then someone else bought another round. And someone else another. I, I had to walk my horse back to the stable because I, I felt too wobbly to, to, to ride. I, I don't think I like sipping, spitting and cussing very much because it, it makes your head hurt the next day. Charlie has promised to teach me the secret of roping and, and also how to shoot straight. Respectfully, your son, Joe. I must admit that I was very curious about this person. I had seen him about town. I had heard much about him, but I had not had a chance to talk with him. Yesterday, he came into my laundry with some of his native robes to be cleaned. The dust of Laramie was ruining them. He wanted to know how I became a laundry owner in Laramie. I told him that I and many other Chinese helped build the railroad that links east and west. After the railroad was finished, I decided to invest in a business and retire here. I can't say that this is a real retirement, but it beats working on the railroad. I have invited him to have tea with me. I forgot to ask him if there were any Chinese in Liberia. 
None of us in the boarding house tried to exaggerate the dangers of riding beyond Laramie city limits. However, we did warn Joe more than once that the outskirts of Laramie had its normal collection of outlaws, just like any other city. He smiled and told me, don't worry, Homer. Charlie has taught me how to ride well. Dad, blast it, Jake. Why'd you have to fill your hand a hundred yards away? Oh, shut up. We've lost him. You and your big mouth. Well, where do we go from here? We keep heading for Texas. As many wanted posters they got hung up in this territory on us. We'd be sitting ducks to stick around here. She spooked that little dude. <laughs> That's downright funny, Jake. Wonder if he can find his way in the dark. Who is there? Who is it? Strong wolf. Wait, don't run. I will not harm you. I have your horse. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was smart to jump off this old nag and hide rather than try to outrun the bad ones. Did you see them, the crooks? I have seen many crooks. Uh, over there is Laramie. I, I guess this is where we part company. Thanks again, Mr. Strongwolf, for, for catching my horse. I... It was not very hard. Well, thanks anyway. What is your name? Oh... My handle is Joseph Jenkins Roberts. My friends call me J.J. J.J., uh, would you like to have a good Shoshone dinner this evening? Uh, yes. Yes, I, I would. <clears throat> Excuse me. That was very good. I, I have never eaten rabbit before. Dog. I, I'm talking about the food we just ate. I know. It was dog meat, one that we had fattened for a guest such as yourself. Oh. <laughs> Moonfeather, bring my pipe and tobacco. I knew she was the one I would marry when I first saw her. Somewhere in a book it is called Love at First Sight. I could tell from the way she returned my look that she too felt the same feeling. My heart was in my throat. Also because I feared the consequences of being attracted to another man's wife. In my country, that is considered something a person should not do. Strong Wolf lit the pipe and passed it to me. <coughs> it's a bit strong, isn't it? For one who smokes it properly, it is not strong. Here, do it slowly, with feeling, peacefully. I see what you mean. It, it is better when you puff slowly. Uh, uh, tell me, Strong Wolf, do, does your wife always spy on you around the corner of your teepee? Oh, Moonfeather is not my wife. She's my niece. And uh, you are the first buffalo man she has ever seen up close. Oh, I, I didn't know. She's very pretty. Already, after only 17 snows, she can skin a deer or put up a teepee faster than many more experienced women. I am proud to be her uncle. Yes. Yes, I, I can see that you would be. Moonfeather. Her name is pretty, too. We Shoshone women have always been known to be direct and honest. I had to let the Dark One know that I had received his eye and returned it. For the course of the evening, he spent talking to my uncle. I made certain that he was aware of my presence. For the first time since I had been taken through the ceremonies for coming into womanhood, I really felt like a woman. This man, J.J., made me feel this way. I looked forward, after that first time, to his visits with my uncle. The women of our camp laughed and made jokes about how much of my heart they could see in my eyes. What have we here skulking around with such heavy circles under his eyes? 
Good morning, Mrs. O'Leary. Am I too late for breakfast? Well, I think we ought to be able to scrape a bit of batter together for a flapjack or two. How's it going with yourself? You look as though you just drank the hair of the dog that bit you. Please, Mrs. O'Leary, don't say that. Morning, J.J. Got a telegram for you. Morning, Homer. What is it? Well? Well, what is it? My grandfather has had a stroke and he wants to see me. Oh. He wants to hear about what I've seen before oh, he... No, no, lad, chin up. I, I must leave right away. Yes, of course, J.J., we will. We'll pray that everything works out all right. How dreadfully cruel the fates can be at 7.30 on some mornings. Truer words were never spoken, Mrs. O'Leary. <laughs> Toward the middle of the basket, you got boiled corn and a bunch of blueberry muffins. And the chicken should last you for a week if you're careful not to eat more than six pieces a day. Now you take care of yourself and don't you forget to write us. I'll be back. We hope so. I could use another Liberian human interest story. All aboard! Aboard! But, J.J., I come as soon as I hear it. I sleep and went off under a table in the dirty garden. See you later, bub. J.J., you left two ropes. I'll be back. I'll be back. I hate to see J.J. go. You know what I mean. He's, he's been like a son to me. Yep, he's a nice guy. <laughs> but don't worry. He'll be back. He's got a reason to come back, too, or my otherwise unimpeachable sources are out of their trees. <laughs> Moonfeather! Moonfeather! What seems to be the problem here, young fella? There! There! Riding the speckled horse! Oh, uh-huh, so that's Moonfeather. Well, you better best get on the observation platform before that poor engine rides that pony to death trying to keep up with the Union Pacific here. Observation platform? Where? Well, to the rear. Now, careful you don't fall off. <laughs> Moonfeather, I'll be back. I promise you, I'll be back. Here, keep this ring. I'll be back. I'll be back. I had to let him know how I felt, openly. I rode alongside the train, praying to the person above us that he would see me and understand. My prayer was answered. He saw me and threw me his ring. I knew we would be together then. I did not know how long it would take, but no matter. I knew it would come to pass someday. Sears Radio Theater will return after this message from your local station. certain foods, plants, and animal products you can't bring back to the U.S. You can't because they're prohibited. They're prohibited because even one of these foods, plants, or animal products might carry a disease or pest that could spread to our crops and gardens and animals with devastating results. You haven't been everywhere on the globe yet, but there's always tomorrow. And before you go again, write for the free booklet that explains the law. Even one can hurt, write for traveler's tips. Write to Traveler's Tips, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington, D.C., 20250. It's free. I gained 20 pounds in two months. Chocolate and bean and butter. Yeah, I never lost that weight either. Uh, with me, it was different. I was climbing the walls, yelling at the kids. I just couldn't live with myself. Mm, neither could Dan, could he? <laughs> no, not really. He said having a wife that smoked was better than being terrorized day and night. Huh, better a friendly dragon than a nasty dragon, huh? Right. 
So anyway, I'm back to a pack and a half a day, addicted just like I was Let's before. Let's hold it right there. The American Heart Association wants you to know that smoking cigarettes becomes a habit, not an addiction. Habits can be broken. Smoking is a matter of choice, not destiny. We can help you quit. You don't have to gain weight or climb the walls. Contact your American Heart Association for a free booklet that explains how to break your cigarette habits step by step. The American Heart Association wants you to know we're fighting for your life. This is Lorne Green, and here's the concluding act of the Afro-Westerner. J.J. stayed home for four months after his grandpa's death, doing as much as he could. Him, the youngest in the family. He returned after six months, no longer the complete tenderfoot. His granddad had left him a handsome sum of money, but he didn't let it interfere with his life. One of the first things he did when he got back was get himself a job, working for the Circle Bar B spread. Oh, there ain't nothing to it, J.J. Once you get past the sipping, cussing, and spitting part, all you have to do is learn how to stay in the saddle till your backside turns to calluses. Try to think one step ahead of a bunch of dumb cows that are apt to stampede at the drop of a coffee cup. Forget about all the comforts of Ms. O'Leary's boarding house. Be on the lookout for wrestlers and don't spend all your money in one saloon. I don't have to tell you how to survive cookie son of a gun stew. You already survived Ms. O'Leary's cooking. I learned. I was determined because I had decided with the money I had inherited from my grandfather to buy some land, buy some cattle, and marry Moonfeather. She was always on my mind, but I, I could not find her. Wherever I came across Shoshone people, I would ask them about Strong Wolf and Moonfeather. I even learned some Shoshone in order to ask questions. They would always tell me that they had seen them in the last moon or ten sleeps away, but they didn't know exactly where they were now. My heart ached to see Moonfeather again. I used to have terrible dreams thinking that maybe she had married someone else. My friends were very sympathetic. Would you like another cup of tea, J.J.? Uh, no, 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 thank you, I. Nothing like a good cup of tea. Yeah. So you still have not been able to find Moonfeather, huh? No, and I... I've run out of places to look. Do not fear that way. There are always other places. I know. I, I, I know. It just seems... Uh... Uh, I understand. I don't know if I told you when we last talked. I'm going through a romantic period myself. You are? Yes, my father has selected a bride for me from our village. And I am anxiously awaiting her arrival. Oh, I'm, I'm happy for you. Uh, here is a picture of her. Her name is Cynthia. She is very pretty. My father says she is a good worker and will make a good wife. Are you sure you wouldn't like another cup of tea? One day... Out of the blue, it happened. I had been working the South Range, rounding up mavericks, and was just sort of stumbling back to town, thinking about how good it would be to have a hot bath in Mrs. O'Leary's big brass tub. A couple of Indian braves suddenly appeared and quietly rode alongside me. One of them was Strong Wolf. The other was Eagle Eyes, his brother, Moonfeather's father. I was so excited, I, I could hardly keep from shouting, Where is Moonfeather? but I thought it best to do things the Indian way. They had gotten the word from others about me. I rode into their small camp of 20 teepees, my heart beating like a drum. I saw a smile in the corner of Strong Wolf's mouth. He knew what my feelings were. We dismounted, still without talking, washed our hands in a buffalo hide bucket and sat down to eat. I remember we had wild greens and trout because I was so nervous. I, I choked on a bone. After the meal, Eagle Eyes called out, Moonfeather, bring my pipe and tobacco. She was more beautiful than the first time I saw her. And she was wearing my ring. I could not contain myself. I said to her, you're wearing my ring. She nodded, telling me yes, and went back to where the women were. I was so happy, I, I felt like crying. So you returned. I said that I would, 
Good. We like a person who keeps his word. We sat for an hour talking about different things. How scarce the buffalo were. What my plans were for the future. Eagle eyes pierced me with his look. Listened closely and only asked one question. Will you always stay in this land? Up to that point, I had not really thought about whether I intended to stay or not. But I said yes, because that's how I felt. After a while, I, I felt I had stayed long enough and decided to leave, asking if I could return for a visit the next day. Strong Wolf looked at Eagle Eyes, and he nodded, ever so slightly. I felt good. I felt even better as I rode out of camp when Moonfeather stepped around the teepee and waved and smiled at me openly. I rode hard and fast to get back to Laramie. I felt I, I needed some courtship advice. My father was far away and, and could offer no advice in this matter, so I, I spoke with my friends. So our little old African buckaroos discovered skirts. Well, well, well. I am serious, Charlie. We are serious. What does a man do in a situation like this? Really stomp down serious, huh? Yes. Well, in that case, I'd suggest you do the following. Get yourself duded up. You know, slick your hair down. We'll skip that part. Take a half-hour bath, sprinkle a heap of sweet me sniff on you, you where your whiskers should be, and take her for a stroll in the moonlight. Charlie, I'm in love with her, and I want to marry her. <laughs> well, in that case, you better take a full hour's bath. An Indian woman, huh? I think that would make an interesting column. When's the date? I don't know. I, I haven't proposed yet. Well, if I were you, I wouldn't waste much time. Looks like we're in for a cold winter, if you know what I mean. See you later. I gotta run. Oh, I'll leave your dinner on the back of the stove, Homer. Thanks, Miss O. Luck to you, J.J. Tell me, what do you think I should do, Mrs. O'Leary? Oh, well, now you take that darling girl an armful of flowers. There's not a female heart on the planet that doesn't think well of flowers. Mrs. O'Leary, you're right. That's exactly what I'll do. Oh, the beauty and sweetness of youth. My brother and I had discussed the possibility of J.J. the African and Moonfeather getting married. We knew that he was going to return to her after she was given his ring. We approved of the match. I knew him to be sincere and honest, and I believed with the experience that years give that he would become a well-seasoned man. We were not prepared to deal with his appearance when he asked for Moonfeather with a tall hat on, a beetle coat, and a bunch of dead flowers. We laughed, and afterwards we had a feast, and my brother gave his permission. Later on, after he understood our customs better, he gave my brother fifty good horses, and me, a robe, like the one he had worn when I first met him. Joseph Jenkins Roberts became an authentic cowhand Used the money he inherited from his grandfather to buy a ranch Just a few miles from where his grandparents had lived, incidentally And settled down to raise six beautiful Afro-Indian children and beef cattle I'm proud to say the oldest boy's name is Homer Homer Jenkins Roberts Who at the age of 20 made his pilgrimage to his grandparents in Liberia Liked what he saw and stayed. As the West African proverb says, what comes around goes around. When my brother was my age, being in style meant wearing old jeans and about a pound of dirt. But today, us guys are more sophisticated in our style. And that's why Sears has Style Works. A guy can pick up on the latest styles in jeans, tops, sweaters, and dress your clothes like vested suits. I can depend on the Style Works shop at Sears for just about everything to keep me looking great. And the prices? Pretty reasonable. My folks like that. Style Works. Today's style's all in one place. At most larger Sears retail stores. 
I've been working with furniture for 25 years, so I know about quality. And that's why I recommend a Sears Benchmade sofa for your family. There's a heavy-duty hardwood frame braced to withstand stress. The coil spring construction gives long-lasting comfort. And you can choose from fabrics and attractive solids or bright prints, all treated with Scotchgard brand fabric protector. Compare the quality of a Sears Benchmade with other fine sofas, and you'll be surprised. Styling, durability, and comfort. Benchmade, a great place to relax. Now at most Sears retail stores. This spring for women, the fashion place at Sears suggests these up-to-date separates. They're comfortably casual, yet dressy and light-hearted enough to go anywhere this spring. Margaret mixes Sears textured blazer and a small collar striped shirt with trousers. While Wendy wears a shawl collar blouse and a slim-down dirndl skirt. Color coordinated, these great-looking separates will come together beautifully for you. Spring's mixable, matchable, up-to-date separates. Get them at most larger Sears retail stores. Come, spin the wheel of fashion. Discover a fortune of spring separates at Sears Junior Bazaar. Ah, silk blend skirt and pants in dusty pastels. A blend of polyester, rayon, and silk, making them easy care, wrinkle resistant. Top them off with white on white polyester and cotton blouses. Fashion is your fate at Junior Bazaar. Available at most larger Sears retail stores. You've been listening to Sears Radio Theater, brought to you five nights a week by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops. The Afro-Westerner was written by Odie Hawkins, produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Lorne Green. Our star was Brock Peters. Also heard were Parley Bear, Peggy Weber, Norman Alden, Len Berman, William Lally, and Marvin Miller. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. Art Gilmore speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. What if you went off to college and found that you were different from everyone else and everything was designed for them, not for you? Suppose you went to the library and all the books you needed were in Braille and you were the only one who couldn't read. You'd feel left out, wouldn't you? And what if you went to class and found that there were no chairs because all the other students rolled in with their own wheelchairs? Suppose one of your professors gave his lectures talking with his hands, only his hands, and everyone understood sign language except you. You'd think it wasn't fair. Well, that's how handicapped people feel now when they go to college and find extra handicaps. But things are changing, and we have free information that can help. Write Closer Look, Box 1492, Washington, D.C., 20013. A public service message on behalf of the United States Office of Education. Here's an important tax tip from the Internal Revenue Service. If you're 65 or older, there are some special tax breaks that you can claim. Like a double personal exemption. That's right, an extra $750 for yourself, and still another if your spouse also is 65 or older. And there are advantages if you decide to sell your home and move to a smaller place. There's also a tax credit for the elderly. They're all spelled out in one of IRS's free publications, number 554, Tax Benefits for Older Americans. You can get copies by calling the IRS toll-free number listed in your telephone directory, or you can order by mail. There's even an order form just for that purpose in each tax package. Use it to send for the Older American publication or any other IRS publication or form you need. Tax Benefits for Older Americans. Get all the details now so you can take advantage of the benefits on your tax return. Tomorrow, the Sears Radio Theater is a comedy with Andy Griffith as your host. Let's listen. I am a talent agent, and I'd like to, excuse the expression, handle you. Why? I mean, why me? I've been around a while and haven't made any headlines of variety yet. I looked at some film on you the other day and, well, I... I thought I saw something. 
So be sure and tune in tomorrow to the Sears Radio Theater. That's the theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight is a comedy with Andy Griffith as your host. Here's a preview. I am a talent agent, and I'd like to, excuse the expression, handle you. Why? I mean, why me? The Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. Tell them plants are out anyway. Yeah, we'll back order his silly trousers. We get the peace goods on the, on the 4th, we finish them on the 15th, we ship them on the 15th. That means you receive shipment on the 18th. Oh, no, 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 no. That's, that's, a, that's a Sunday. Uh, uh, the 19th, at the absolute latest. <laughs> I'm, I'm very sorry. Thank you. Uh, no, nobody, no, nobody but nobody is showing cuffs this year. They're a waste of good polyester, which, by the way, no one's buying either this year. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, baby, ciao. Boy, the, the things people expect from you these days. Here's that invoice, Mr. Stanley. Are, are you feeling all right? You're sweating. Uh, uh it's it's heartburn or something. Uh, get me a salsa. I, I I feel nauseous. It could be heartburn. It could be heart attack. Know the symptoms of heart attack. Contact your American Heart Association. We're fighting for your life. What's your trivia specialty? Entertainment, sports, recent world history, or maybe potluck? Hi, I'm Bill St. James, and beginning Monday between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. on my show and the William B. Williams Show, you'll get a chance to test your skills when we play the trivia game. To become eligible, just send a card to Trivia, WNEW, 565 Fifth Avenue, New York, 10017. Be sure to include your name, address, phone number, and the category you'd like to be trivial in. Entertainment, sports, recent world history, or potluck. If your card is selected, Willie or myself will ask you a trivia quickie. If your answer is correct, according to our sources, you'll win $10 and a shot at a Jim Lowe trivia tuppy worth $100. And all contestants who play become eligible for a weekly drawing when we'll give away a complete AMFM stereo music system. The triviality starts Monday. So get your name, address, phone number, and trivia category in the mail to Trivia, WNEW, 565 Fifth Avenue, New York. It's fun. The price is right, and who knows? You might even learn something. This is Andy Griffith. Now you take a dark room, send a beam of light across it, and let me tell you, you just may see some magic. At least that's what our friend Harry Silverman hopes every time he steps into our Hollywood studio projection room. That pot of gold at the end of the rainbow may be one thing to you and another thing to me. But to Harry Silverman, it's something else altogether. Harry's rainbow is that beam of light. And the pot of gold he hopes to find at the end of it, well, who knows? One time, Harry thought he had found it when he saw a screen test of a Siamese cat who could disco dance. But that's where Harry is right now, in fact sitting alone with his ulcer in a projection room at the studio, watching a cloud of smoke from his panatella drift along that special rainbow of his to... Well, Harry has his eye on a different breed of cat today as he sinks back in the deep leather chair and ponders the lives and legends of Hollywood's sex kittens. There was something they all had, besides guts and bravado and a sense of humor. Underneath, where they hoped it didn't show, no matter how much they took off, there was always that little girl lost, lonely and scared and looking for daddy. Pardon me. Uh, could you help me, please? Something's caught Harry's eye. A shapely honey blonde sizzling the right-hand corner of the screen, coming on a little like Monroe, a little like Harlow, and a lot like that pot of gold Harry's been waiting for. Harry pushes his horn rims against the bridge of his nose. Takes a long squint through his bifocals. Yep, it's there, all right. That little girl lost look. That blonde is giving Harry the feeling he'd like to go right out and adopt her. That is, if it's okay with his wife and kids. Which is how we begin our story. Radio 
Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Brought to you five nights a week by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops. Your hosts, Lorne Green. I'll bring you stories of the Old West and the New. Andy Griffith with a look at the funny side of life. Vincent Price with tales of mystery and suspense. Cicely Tyson with stories about love, hate, and related things. Richard Whitmark. I'll bring you stories of pure adventure. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis' production of The Sears Radio Theater. Our story, The Care and Feeding of a Sex Symbol, by Shirley Gordon. Our star, Alan Young. Come, spin the wheel of fashion. Discover a fortune of spring separates at Sears Junior Bazaar. Ah, silk blend skirt and pants in dusty pastels. A blend of polyester, rayon, and silk, making them easy care, wrinkle resistant. Top them off with white on white polyester and cotton blouses. Fashion is your fate at Junior Bazaar. Available at most larger Sears retail stores. The word's out and spreading fast about the jeans from Sears Men's Store that grow old beautifully. It's a sure sign they're feeling fine and feeling good. For the denim that keeps going strong a long time. Get them trim cut, regular cut, even get them pre-washed. The jeans that grow old beautifully. Now at most Sears retail stores. Generations ago, families dined by the warmth of the open hearth. Today, Sears rekindles this spirit with its open hearth dining room furniture. Faithfully rendered early American designs and careful workmanship give it an heirloom quality. The satin glow and warm highlighting of Sears open hearth take 26 steps to achieve. There's no shorter method to bring out the beauty of the wood. And like all good furniture, open hearth is made to last for a long time with sturdy tongue and groove and mortise and tenon construction. Choose from 16 different pieces of open hearth at most Sears retail stores. Oh, here I go again. It's time to rent one of those steam-type carpet cleaners. Why rent? Now Sears puts power in a carpet cleaner you can own yourself. The Power Spray from Sears for easy home carpet cleaning. Power Spray sprays hot water into your carpet, then sucks up the dirty water. You can see the dirt you get out. Dirt you didn't even know was there. The Power Spray Carpet Cleaner, a convenient carpet cleaner you can own yourself. Available at most Sears retail stores. Kenmore. <coughs> Solid as Sears. I'd like to share a notion. If you have a dream, pursue it. Agreed? If you know a way to better yourself, get on with it. Charge, onward, and so forth. Perfect example of that notion put into practice is what Harry Silverman did after he saw that beautiful young woman on the projection room screen. Are you, um, uh, Mr. Silverman? Yes, and you're Miss... Sim Susie, my astrological advisor says I should use only one name. It'll be lucky for me. You know, like Einstein. Einstein didn't have just one... Uh, never mind. Uh, sit down, uh, uh, Susie. I'm, I'm sorry I'm late. I ran out of gas. That's all right. I'm glad you could make it. Me too. I'm starved. Uh, yeah. Oh, here's the waiter. You want a drink first? Oh, sure, but I, I want something to eat with it. You know, Carl, my usual appetizer. Yes, miss. And I'll have whatever Mr. Silverman's having to drink. But you don't even know what it is. I like surprises. Is that why you drive around with an empty gas tank? My car stopped right in the middle of Sunset Boulevard. There were all these cars honking and yelling behind me. And you know what they were mad about? You were in their way? They were mad because I didn't have my hood up. You know, the front part of the car that the engine is under. The hood, yeah, yeah. Listen, Susie, the reason I... How was I supposed to know what you're supposed to do when your car stops in the middle of the street? They don't tell you that when you buy the car. You've got a point. It should be in every new car manual. Look, Susie... This policeman comes along and hollers at me. Lady, why haven't you got your hood up? I don't even know how. Ladies shouldn't have to do such things. That's just what that nice policeman said. Later. 
chivalry is still with us. Listen, Susie. Did you know that most policemen are over six feet tall? Anybody in a uniform looks big to me. <laughs> me too. Uh, here are your appetizers, miss. Oh, good. Help yourself, Mr. Silverman. No, thanks. I have a little stomach problem. You probably don't eat enough. Susie, don't you have to watch your diet? I mean, in your business... Please, don't talk about dieting when I'm eating. It makes me nervous. What did you want to see me about, Mr. Silverman? Harry. Harry. Well, I think you and I could make a beautiful symphony together. What I mean is... I may not know how to put the hood up on a car, Mr. Silverman, but now you're speaking a language I understand. Wait a minute. I'm talking strictly business. Okay. I'm listening. You uh, sure you can eat and listen at the same time? Just let me hear your... Excuse the expression. Proposition. Very simple. I am a talent agent, and I'd like to... Excuse the expression. Handle you. Why? I mean, why me? I've been around a while and haven't made any headlines of variety yet. I looked at some film on you the other day and, well, I... I thought I saw something. Like what? Oh, I'll tell you sometime. When we get to know each other better. How better? We could become friends, Susie, you and I. Good friends. Uh-huh. I don't blame you. I guess you've had guys hand you every line in the book. Since I was 12, I could walk around in a Mother Hubbard and it would still happen to me. I don't know. There just seems to be something about me. Is that the something you mean? No, Susie, it isn't. I don't know. Every agent I've had, they were all alike. I don't expect you to make up your mind this minute. We should get better acquainted. <laughs> Why is it everything I say sounds like a pitch? Because you're saying it to me. I told you I've got a problem. I tell you what. Why don't you come out to my place tonight and... Uh, no etchings. Just my wife and kids. You're married? And you admit it? And my wife does understand me. I think you like Myra. I do. If this is a line, at least it's a new one. You come out to the house tonight for dinner. Okay. Now, let's order lunch. I'm famished. <laughs> One lamb chop and a lettuce leaf? Well, don't you think that's kind of a skimpy meal to offer a guest? If lunch today was an example, this girl's calorie intake per day must look like the national debt. Well, isn't that kind of her business? Not if she becomes my business. You're really sold on this girl. Let me put it succinctly. This better be it. What are you talking about? They let me know at the office in no uncertain terms I better bring in money. I'm not earning my phone bill, is what they said. Find someone, sign someone who gets big money or look elsewhere for employment. You never told me. Yeah, I didn't want to worry you. But now you can understand that this girl is very important to our future welfare because my head's on the chopping block. And also, you know how long I've been trying to get something going in our savings account. I know. And all I've ever brought in is peanuts. If it weren't for your job, your salary... Oh, Harry, you know I like working. But you shouldn't have to. It should just be the frosting. For the last year, I haven't brought home any cake. But now this girl may finally be our lucky angel. Oh, Harry. Uh... Myra, you're not ashamed of what I do for a living, are you? Maybe even a hard-working agent is a dirty word. Flesh peddler? Darling, if you decide to take on this girl, she's going to be the... Well, she's going to be so lucky to have you. I don't know. Say I helped to make her the hottest thing at the box office. Another Monroe, maybe. Oh, now, just because poor Marilyn... But that doesn't mean... After all, there have been lots of others. Jean Harlow ended up better at 27. And remember Clara Bull, the it girl? Forty years later, she still couldn't sleep nights. Well, what's wrong with the way Shirley Temple's turned out? And she was the hottest thing at Shirley the... Shirley Temple? What kind of sex symbol was she? Well, that brings up a point, my loving husband. How come this time you've latched onto a sex symbol to make it big with? Why not some adoring mother's little ruffle darling or a, a nice, lovable, baggy-pants comic? Well, a man spends the better part of his life on his job. He ought to try to make it as pleasant as possible. Hey, what's that you're sticking in the oven, anyway? A coconut custard pie for dessert tonight. A coconut custard pie? But I just told for you... For our children. It's all right if they eat, isn't it? Mm. They have a few years before they have to worry about becoming sex symbols. I hope. Well, just keep it out of Susie's sight. Oh, don't worry. Our kids are very good at making a pie disappear. And speaking of our offspring, it's about that time. And it's your turn, Dad. 
Hmm? Where are they at today? Lisa's at ballet and Buddy's at Little League. Well, I should be grateful. At least it's not the other way around. It's the other way around tomorrow. <laughs> Who's the extra place for? Daddy's bringing a business friend home. Why don't you get out an extra napkin? I hope he doesn't like coconut custard pie. Daddy says we have to have our dessert upstairs after dinner. How come? I'll get it. And remember now, kids, ten years off of good behavior. Hi. Susie. I'm sorry I'm late. Is that always your opening line? You're not late, you're right on time. I am? I said 7.30 and you're practically on the dot. Oh, well, that explains it. I thought you said 7. I got lost trying to find your house. So I would have been late if I hadn't been early. You should let me come and get you. Oh, it was all right. There was this nice man at the gas station. Here, let me take your coat. Oh, you could just throw it any place. Oh, you can throw it my way. Hello, I'm Myra. The woman who makes it safe for me to be out at night. You are for real. <laughs> and two kids, just like you said. Lisa and Buddy, this is Susie, kids. How do you do? Fine, thanks. Hi. Hey, you're cute. I hope you're not going to mind a rather plain meal. Harry's stomach, you know. But there's a coconut custard pie for dessert. You want to have it upstairs with us? Why don't you have it downstairs with me? Uh, why not? Come on, Susie. I'll show you where you can freshen up while Harry fixes the drinks. I think you had the most beautiful mink I've ever seen. It was a present. Oh? To myself. A heck of a lot of six o'clock calls earned me that little number. Dad? Yeah, buddy? I forgot. What kind of business did you say you're in? <laughs> my dressing table to powder your nose. Thanks. Oh, this sure is a cozy room. Oh, we like it. A mink's okay, but it doesn't keep your feet warm in bed at night. Looks like you're the one who's found the answer. Harry, you mean? There's nothing like a good man. Oh, I'm not complaining. Like my mother always says, we get what we ask for in this life. Of course, I haven't exactly gotten what I've asked for so far. But maybe now that I have your husband, uh, professionally, that is. Check. Who knows? I may set this town on its ear yet. I don't see why not. And I guess that wouldn't be too bad for Harry either, would it? No. I guess it wouldn't be too bad. Then let's go drink a toast to Harry and me with your blessing. Ten for good, buddy. <laughs> This spring for women, the fashion place at Sears suggests these up-to-date separates. They're comfortably casual, yet dressy and light-hearted enough to go anywhere this spring. Margaret mixes Sears textured blazer and the small collar striped shirt with trousers. While Wendy wears a shawl collar blouse and the slim-down dirndl skirt. Color coordinated, these great-looking separates will come together beautifully for you. Spring's mixable, matchable, up-to-date separates. Get them at most larger Sears retail stores. My brother was my age. Being in style meant wearing old jeans and about a pound of dirt. But today, us guys are more sophisticated in our style. And that's why Sears has Style Works. A guy can pick up on the latest styles in jeans, tops, sweaters, and dress your clothes like vested suits. I can depend on the Style Works shop at Sears for just about everything to keep me looking great. And the prices? Pretty reasonable. My folks like that. Style Works. Today, style's all in one place. At most larger Sears retail stores. Can't believe you owe the IRS that much? Well, when things just don't add up, you can count on a Sears desk calculator to help you. Add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Then read the figures two different ways. 12-digit lighted display and tape printout for your records. There's a two-memory system that helps ease multi-step problems, plus its many extras make it a great time saver. Now at most Sears retail stores. Sears two-memory desk calculator. Cut $25, just $99.99 through March 10th. Prices and dates may vary in Alaska and Hawaii. All right, now let's get this squared away. Harry's made his move, brought Susie home to meet the wife and kids, got her to sign his agent management contract, and 
now it's full speed ahead. Now Harry's got to produce. Come in. Susie, don't you even keep your door locked? <laughs> Don't worry, I told her you were okay. Well, what is it? Baby, my pet cheetah. Isn't she beautiful? Yeah. My father sent her from Queens. He doesn't think a girl should live alone in Hollywood. I'd say you've reduced the risk considerably. Look, Susie, I brought a contract for you to go over. Will you agree I'm going to represent you? And then I want to set up a series of interviews for you right after... Ah! Oh! Ah! <laughs> Down, Pierre. Down. Sorry, Harry. You better sit on the other side of the room. <laughs> Pierre always thinks a guy is going to make a grab for me. Another present from your father? Uh-huh. Only trouble is, every once in a while, there's a guy I'd like to grab me. It must complicate things. Now, about these interviews, Susie. Of course, my mother doesn't think a girl should live alone either. Only, she keeps sending me two-legged animals. Whenever she runs across an eligible male back home, she talks him into a vacation in California and gives him my phone number. Must keep you pretty busy. Honey, you don't know what busy is until you've shared a bobsled on the Matterhorn with a truck driver from Queens. Now, that's another thing, Susie. From now on, truck drivers from Queens are out. You've got to be seen only in the right places with the right people. You got something against Disneyland? We got to work up some hot items in the gossip columns, and I'll see who I can fix you up with. Thanks. Ah, there you are. You must be Mr. Pisces. Uh, the Silverman... Harry Silverman. This is Madame Clara. She's my astrological advisor. Ah, how do you do? Susie, we have a lot of business to discuss. Now, this contract... I know. Now, that's why Madame Clara's been up on the sun deck. Communing with the stars. It's daylight. Ah, but the stars are there. The stars are always there, Mr. Pisces. Silverman. I've cautioned my impulsive little Miss Sagittarius about you. According to the stars, you're the wrong sign for me. How do you know what sign I am? I asked Myra. Oh, well, she's prejudiced. You shouldn't listen to anything she says about me. She told me you were the wrong sign for her, too. And yet she's given me the best years of her life. All I'm asking you for is the... The best years of my life. It's the nature of a Pisces to make promises he can't keep. I'm an agent. That's my job. Now, if you'll just sign... I suppose your honesty is what my little Sagittarius finds so attractive. You have to admit it doesn't grow on palm trees. Well, perhaps it is possible for two people to adjust astrologically. But remember, Susie, if you need me, any hour of the day or night, I shall be at the ready. Thanks, Madam Clara. Keep in mind, Mr. Pisces, the planets and I will be watching. Yes, ma'am. Now, as I was saying... Getting a new agent is like getting married. A girl can't be too careful. And Madam Clara's right. Our signs don't go together. Together, they're going to turn into a dollar sign. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? No, it's important. I have to think about when I get old. Well, that's a long way off. No, it isn't. Not for somebody in my line of work. All of a sudden, you're too old for the part. Hmm. Sex symbols and prize fighters. Okay, then. Let's get the ball rolling. If you'll just sign this... Okay. Okay. Then afterwards, we'll celebrate with some champagne and... Hey, you like spaghetti. Why do you taste the sauce I've got simmering on the stove? I'm a good cook, you know. The figures. Listen, Susie, before you start worrying about getting old, you better start worrying about getting fat. I don't know. <laughs> if you look frumpy enough in a part, they give you an Oscar. I'm a good actress, but nobody notices. They're gonna start noticing, Susie. You just leave it to me. All right, Harry. That's my girl. <laughs> down here, down. Just, just. Sign here, sweetheart. I'm Andy Fisher, and this has been a WNEW News update. News and sports in detail coming up after the Sears Radio Theater. That's the theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight is a mystery story with Vincent Price as your host. Here's a preview. Everyone considers this a textbook case. Everyone but you. You're right. I don't. And if you continue following textbook therapeutic procedures, Jane is going to go into withdrawal or do something destructive, maybe even to herself. What do you propose, Doctor? Exorcism? I want two weeks. And during that period, I want custody of her. The Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station.
What if you went off to college and found that you were different from everyone else and everything was designed for them, not for you? Suppose you went to the library and all the books you needed were in Braille and you were the only one who couldn't read. You'd feel left out, wouldn't you? And what if you went to class and found that there were no chairs because all the other students rolled in with their own wheelchairs? Suppose one of your professors gave his lectures talking with his hands, only his hands, and everyone understood sign language except you. You'd think it wasn't fair. Well, that's how handicapped people feel now when they go to college and find extra handicaps. But things are changing, and we have free information that can help. Write Closer Look, Box 1492, Washington, D.C., 20013. A public service message on behalf of the United States Office of Education. This is Vincent Price. We all hear these sounds at one time or another. Children at play, the screeching of car brakes, a dog barking, an ambulance siren. Our feelings about them are not always personal. But in this case, these sounds, whether alone or in combination, have a special significance. When they are tied to something inexplicable in a child's memory, the child will never forget. I've got to go look for my sister. Jane, you don't have a sister. I've got to find Wanda. There is no Wanda. <laughs> Jane Lytle is 14 years old. Jane's mother, Mildred, is a nurse. Her father, Jack Lytle, is a postman. Mildred and Jack are concerned parents. The Lytle home should be a happy one. But Jane insists that she has a sister named Wanda. The sister Wanda does not exist. Not for Mildred, not for her husband, Jack. Only for their only daughter, Jane. Mildred cannot cope with it any longer. She feels she has come to the end. But Mildred doesn't know that this is only the beginning of our story. Sears Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Brought to you five nights a week by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops. Your hosts, Lorne Green. I'll bring you stories of the Old West and the New. Andy Griffith with a look at the funny side of life. Vincent Price with tales of mystery and suspense. Cicely Tyson with stories about love, hate, and related things. Richard Whitmark. I'll bring you stories of pure adventure. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis production of The Sears Radio Theater. Our story, Wanda, by Bernard Gerard. Our stars, Lynn Berman, Peggy Weber, and Rusie Taylor. On guard. Effective fencing demands style and endurance. That includes fencing around your home. Sears Armadillo Chain Link Fencing has both, setting off your house and helping protect your home. How? For starters, Sears Armadillo Framework has three protective coatings that work together for a lustrous, highly rust-resistant frame. Gates even match the fencing design for uniformity. So call your local Sears soon for your free home estimate. Armadillo Chain Link Fencing at most larger Sears retail stores. Join millions of Americans and shop the easy way with a Sears credit card. All you do to apply is call toll-free 800-526-0444. It's your entry to shopping convenience and quality merchandise. Your card will be accepted at over 3,600 Sears stores across the nation. And you can choose from over 100,000 Sears products and services. Even use it for your catalog orders. In the store or over the phone, just say charge it. Call 800-526-0444. New Jersey residents call 800-652-2777 for your Sears credit card. 
nearly everyone at our party mentioned our new Sears Dream Supreme carpeting. Didn't anyone say anything about my rutabaga dip? Marvin said Dream Supreme looks so thick and luxurious. He loved its velvety soft plush pile. What about my rutabaga dip? Eloise adored the color. Of my rutabaga dip? I told her that avocado lime is just one of Dream Supreme's 20 lustrous colors, and when Doris heard the Dream Supreme is so reasonably priced and treated with Scotchgard brand fabric protector... Okay, what about my tuna fish upside down cake? Dream Supreme carpeting in most larger Sears retail stores. The word's out and spreading fast about the jeans from Sears Men's Store that grow old beautifully. Thumbs up. It's a sure sign they're feeling fine and feeling good. Thumbs up. For the denim that keeps going strong a long time. Thumbs up. Get them trim cut, regular cut, even get them pre-washed. The jeans that grow old beautifully. Now at most Sears retail stores. I want you to listen once again, and listen carefully. And remember what you heard. A life depends on it. Jane? Jane, are you in the kitchen? Are you talking to me? Just turn off the tea kettle. Didn't you hear me? Were you talking to me? Oh, never mind. I'll do it myself. Did you finish your homework? I haven't started. You've been sitting at that table for two hours. What time is it, Mildred? Jane, stop looking out the window. I want you to look at me. Now, take a good look. What do you see? Your mother's just too tired to play games. You didn't tell me the time. <sighs> it's ten after six. Please, will you set the table? Your father will be home any minute now. I've got to go look for my sister. Uh, you don't have a sister. I've got to find Wanda. There is no Wanda. I've got to find Wanda. Jane, come back here. Wanda! Jane! Wanda! Wanda! I'm home. Mildred, where are you? In the kitchen. I made it again today. It's now eight days, four hours, and 22 minutes since I've had a cigarette. Well, have a drink and make mine a double. What's, what's wrong? Jane. Wanda? Who else? Where is she? Probably in the park. Isn't that where she always looks for Wanda? Will you please fix me a drink? How long has she been gone? About an hour. Jack, I can't take it anymore. The look on her face, the way she calls me Mildred. I just can't handle it anymore. It goes on and on. We've been through the doctors, the clinics, you name it. And she still thinks she has a sister named Wanda. <laughs> Could you help me, please? Oh, I don't know. I I'm looking for my sister. I've been all over the park and I can't find her. Maybe she went home. You don't understand. I lost her in the park. I'm afraid to go home without her. Sh she's only six. She was wearing a red coat. Her name is Wanda. I haven't seen her, but I think you'd better go home and tell your parents. I can't go home until I find Wanda. <laughs> She always goes to the park. I covered every inch of it. And maybe she went to Ann's house. Oh, I called there. I was about to call the pizza parlor when you drove in. I was there twice. Jack, it's not like when she used to run off when she was five or six. Now she looks older than 14. Nobody's going to take her by the hand and bring her home. I'm going to call the police. <laughs> You 
can't keep going up and down the aisle, young lady. Intermission's almost over. If you want to stay in here, you'll have to buy a ticket and sit down. She was wearing a red coat. We came here before we went to the park. Her name is Wanda. She's only six years old. Well, we'd better go out to the lobby. Look, I've been on duty all day. There's been no little girl in a red coat. She's very tiny for her age. The manager said you could come in and look for your sister during intermission. The feature picture is going to start in a minute. If she was in here, you would have found her by now. What's that got to do with the feature picture? The lights are on. There isn't even a line in front of the popcorn counter. This picture is so bad, if your sister was here, she'd have to be hiding under the empty seats. I'm afraid to go home without her. Oh, but that's not really true. Mildred and Jack think I made up Wanda. Who are Mildred and Jack? My mom and dad. I don't know what you're on, but you'd better go trip out someplace else. Rossfield Clinic. One moment, please. You still there, Dr. Shaker? Yes, operator. This is the front desk. Mr. and Ms. Lytle are here. Well, have them go to the lounge and tell them I'll be right there. Mr. and Mrs. Lytle. Yes. Please sit down. Where is Jane? She all right? She's fine. You'll be able to see her. She's in a dormitory. My name is Crane Shaker. I'm a parapsychologist. I felt it was important that I talk to you personally first. I can understand your fears because your daughter is being held in a psychiatric ward. I know you've been through this before, but please listen to my point of view. Well... Uh, you know the pattern. The police found her. Juvenile hall center here. She'll be held for observation. There'll be the usual recommendation, a state hospital. But I'm going to fight it. I think that Jane is telling the truth. That can't be. I've only had one child. Nevertheless, Mrs. Lytle, it's possible that Jane did have a sister named Wanda. <laughs> What is it? Didn't I tell you I don't want to take any calls? For the moment, just say I'm not in my office. Yes, Crane Shaker is still here. We don't want to be disturbed. Dr. Rossfield, why don't we talk this out later in the day when you're not so busy? You're not leaving this office, Shaker. Not till we've come to an understanding. Chronologically, that's the way I want to take it. Step by step. I didn't want you here in the first place. I reminded the board of directors that they picked me to run this clinic. I made it clear to them right from the beginning that I believe parapsychology is an unfounded, unproven, bastardized pseudoscience with absolutely no connection to psychology and psychiatric treatment. But, Doctor... Unfortunately, this clinic is dependent upon donors. And one of our biggest contributors felt that this new form of quackery should be represented on our staff. That's why you're here. Doctor, I don't want to have to defend my credentials. You know very well I have a medical degree. I'm a psychiatrist. You also know my work in research. I'm all for science, but I don't wish to confine it. There are no limits. Parapsychology, which I embrace, is the scientific investigation of paranormal phenomena, events which cannot be explained in terms of what is already known. Tell me, what is paranormal about Jane? We've documented conclusively that Mildred Lytle has only one child, and her name is Jane. She's been here five weeks. The staff has concluded that she suffers from an obsessional delusion. Everyone considers this a textbook case. Everyone but you. You're right. I don't. And if you continue following textbook therapeutic procedures, Jane is going to go into withdrawal or do something destructive, maybe even to herself. What do you propose, Doctor? Exorcism? I want two weeks. And during that period, I want custody of her. And I'm going to give it to you. So that you can make a fool of yourself. And then I can get rid of you. What's the best way to save on new clothes? Sew them. Start by saving $40 on a Kenmore sewing machine at Sears with a convertible free arm for narrow sleeves, cuffs, and legs, a built-in button holder, even six stretch stitches. This free arm Kenmore, just $199.95, and save $30 on a wood veneer sewing cabinet. Sale ends March 31st. Prices and dates may vary in Alaska and Hawaii. Available at most Sears retail stores. Kenmore. Solid as Sears. 
Come, spin the wheel of fashion. Discover a fortune of spring separates at Sears Junior Bazaar. Ah, silk blend skirt and pants in dusty pastels. A blend of polyester, rayon, and silk, making them easy care, wrinkle resistant. Top them off with white on white polyester and cotton blouses. Fashion is your fate at Junior Bazaar. Available at most larger Sears retail stores. Convenience and security. The Sears Best Garage Door Opener is just that. Digital control lets you select your own key signal from 512 different transmitting codes. Sears Best Garage Door Opener has a vacation switch that'll lock out stray signals when you're away from home for long periods of time. Of course, when you're home, you won't have to get out of your car to open up that heavy door. Sears Best Garage Door Opener, featuring digital control, gives you convenience and helps you feel secure. Available at most larger Sears retail stores. Clinging jerseys, tight satin tops, they only look good if they hug your body smoothly. Sears Best Abra Light helps you and your clothes look good. How? Abra Light has no seam cups and straps adjust in the back so you look great up front. Whatever you do, whether it's dashing around town or simmering with disco fever in that slinky dress, it's flattering fun with the Sears Abra Light. Available at most larger Sears retail stores. <laughs> Jane is once again being held for psychiatric observation. The staff all agree that Jane is a victim of a neurotic obsession, except one. His name is Dr. Crane Shaker. Come in. I've been waiting for you, Jane. Would you like to take a walk? It's not necessary. I like your office. We could talk here. That's all right with me. I've been through this before, all the questions. I know what you're going to ask me. I know all the answers. You're not going to believe me, uh, but go ahead. I'll cooperate. When was the last time you saw Wanda? Uh, we went to a movie, then to the park. Mama liked to have dinner at five. I promised I'd bring her home by then. I lost her in the park. I know it wasn't at the Royal. I'm sure of it now. What is the Royal? It's the theater. What theater? On the corner. What corner? Next to Newberry's. Do you know the name of the street? Colby Street. Colby. How far is that from the park? It's just around the corner. What do you do in the park? Wanda's six. We always had to go to the swings first. I'd push her till my arms fell off. <laughs> I bet I know what you did next. The snack bar, right? No. We'd go sit with the Indian. Who is the Indian? He was smaller than Wanda. He held his hands out. Water ran out of his hands and filled the pool. Did he talk to you? How could a statue talk to you? He must have had a friendly face. I liked his hands. What did Wanda like? Water, mostly. When no one was looking, I let Wanda and the dog splash in the pool. I'll never forget one day. It was really gray. I couldn't see across the street. Did you hear it? Hear what? You know, when a car has to stop fast. No, I didn't hear it. I heard it. Somebody was laughing. It seemed funny to me because I could hear the sound of a siren. One thing I can be sure of, it wasn't Wanda laughing. I was alone. I couldn't find her or the dog. Your dog? Not really. It was more Wanda's. He was always in the park and he would follow Wanda. What was the dog's name? I don't remember. But he was gone too. What did you do then? I've said this before, and I'll say it again. None of it makes sense, not even to me. I went home. I said to Mom and Dad, I can't find Wanda. What more can I say? You know the rest. Nobody believes me. There's no Wanda, they say. I'm a freak. Jane, parks are green. They have trees. They have fountains and statues. Can you remember anything else about this park? Um... Uh, Hairs would fall off the trees. They were soft and ripe, but they were green. I've never seen green pears that were soft and ripe. I have. Jane, I believe you have or have had a sister named Wanda. Nobody else believes me. I think you're trying to trick me <laughs> so you can have me put away. Uh, we have something in common. They'd like to put me away, too. But I'll tell you how we can beat them. All we have to do is find Wanda. But we're going to have to work together. 
Are you with me? I'll try. Okay. For now, you're in my custody, and I'm willing to take you home. But, Jane, if you run off without me, I won't be able to help you. Now, hold on to this card and don't lose it. What is it? That's my phone exchange. You can reach me 24 hours a day. Why are you doing this? You don't even know me. You remember your sister, Wanda, right? Yes, I really do. Sometimes, Jane, our memories go back farther than just this present life we're living. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, not really. Well, I hope you will understand soon. <laughs> Dr. Shaker's office. This is Dr. Rossfield. Oh, Dr. Shaker is not in today. He was supposed to give me a report on Jane Lytle. He promised it would be on my desk this morning. Oh, uh, he's in San Diego. Oh, I expect to hear from him later this afternoon. If it's an emergency, Dr. Rossfield, I'm sure I can reach him. Have him call me. Operator. Alice, I've got to track down Dr. Shaker. I I've got his schedule in front of me. It's He's, um... He's at the Grant Hotel in San Diego. Try there first. And then the uh, County Hall of Records. <laughs> I can hardly read my own writing. The um, San Diego Union. That's a newspaper. Now, if he gets to that point, he would be in the Department of Dead Files. Good luck. <laughs> Dr. Shaker, you're hmm? wanted on the telephone. Oh, where can I take it? Uh, you can use the phone on the desk next to the window. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is Dr. Shaker. This is Judy. You better call Dr. Rossfield. He sounded very uptight. Oh, I can't be bothered now. I'm still in the Hall of Records. I'm close, very close. Judy, I found the Indian. I'm going through the obituary files. I don't envy you. Oh, I've got it narrowed down to four years. Jane said she took Wanda to the Royal Theater, then went to the park. The Royal Theater was converted into a movie house in 1958, and it was torn down in 62. What'll I tell Dr. Rossfield? Be my guest. <laughs> I'm fixing your tea, Dad. Do you want some toast? No, uh, tea is enough this morning. Is Mom coming in for breakfast? She's still on duty. The hospital transferred her to the intensive care ward. Oh, one sugar. I could make cinnamon toast. No, I'm not hungry, Jane. Sit down. I want to talk to you. Talk? Jane, you know I'm not an educated man, but I try to have an open mind. We've been through it so much, you know, Wanda, Wanda, Wanda. Well, yesterday, this Dr. Shaker called me. He hammered me with questions. What in the world did you tell him? No more than what I've told you. I went to a movie, then I took Wanda to the park. I started getting sleepy. I said to Wanda, we're going to sit under this tree and take a nap. The last thing I remember was a dog barking. When I woke up, Wanda was gone. I lost her. Jane, you and I are sitting in this kitchen. There are two bedrooms in this house. Your mother and I sleep in one, and you sleep in the other. Where does Wanda sleep? I know it's weird. I can't explain it. It's a feeling I can't control. I can't sleep. I can't rest. I know there's no Wanda in this house. There never has been. But there is a Wanda someplace in my life. And I have to find her. Help me, Dad. Yes? Dr. Shaker's here. Send him in. You, uh, wanted to see me, Dr. Rossville? You asked for two weeks, Shaker. I gave them to you. The two weeks ended yesterday. I'm very close now, Dr. Rossfield. I need a few more days. You act like I'm some kind of administrator in an accounting office. You're putting this on a personal level. My interest is in Jane. My interest is in Jane, too. And this clinic. And what I believe in. What is best for Jane? I had a long talk with Jane's parents this morning. For your information, Jane is back in the clinic. She is going to receive the treatment the staff recommended. You didn't put her back on Ward 3. Yes, 
And the committal has my full endorsement. I know, Jane. I know where I'm going with her. If you keep her here under these conditions, there may be appalling repercussions. I hate to repeat myself, but you asked for two weeks. And Jane's still looking for her sister, Wanda. You believe that Jane is not telling the truth. I believe that she did have a sister named Wanda. <laughs> Think about it. She talked about a park with an Indian statue. Water ran out of his hands. Three blocks from the park, she said her house was on a street called Colby. So far, I've located the park. It's in San Diego. There is a statue just as Jane described it. And there is a street named Colby. And it is three blocks from the park. I think you should take your psychic act and put it in a carnival where it belongs. I want to take Jane to San Diego with me. You're not taking her anywhere. You don't understand. We're fighting time. There could be a complete breakdown. I've got to go to the ward and talk to her right now. You don't understand, Shaker. You're off the case. I've given specific instructions that she's not to be exposed to you and your idiotic ideas. This Monday, there is a meeting of the board. Not only will you be off this case, but you'll be out of this clinic once and for all. <laughs> Radio Theater will return after this message from your local station. Yeah, that was about two weeks after Dad had his stroke. Did he have high blood pressure? Don't know. He's doing a little better now, but he can't speak too well. Has trouble walking too, doesn't he? Yeah, it's truly a shame. You have high blood pressure? I don't know. I feel okay. I'm not high-strung like Dad. Whether you're high-strung or low-strung, whether you feel just fine or not, has nothing to do with high blood pressure. High blood pressure is a major risk factor in stroke and heart attack, but it has no obvious symptoms. It can only be detected by a simple, quick, and painless test. The American Heart Association also wants you to know that black Americans, as a group, are more likely to have high blood pressure than whites. We don't know why. But high blood pressure can usually be controlled if it's detected. For more information, contact your American Heart Association. We're fighting for your life. Here's a tip from your Better Business Bureau. Each year, medical quackery takes many dollars from unsuspecting people as well as endangering the health of innocent victims. Watch out for the telltale signs. There are several different types of quackery to look out for. For example, false claims for drugs, food fads, and unnecessary food supplements, as well as fake medical devices. Remember that their promoters are much more interested in making money than in preserving health. Quackery and drugs include so-called cures for arthritis, rheumatism, baldness, and pills that supposedly melt away fat. Drug quackery can be very dangerous in that the victim is sometimes kept from seeing a doctor and obtaining life-saving treatment. The food quack attempts to convince the dieter that vitamin supplements are the only way to a thinner body. And once again, only a doctor should diagnose a vitamin deficiency and write up the necessary prescription. A tip from your Better Business Bureau. <laughs> Vincent Price again, and here's the concluding act of Wanda. Mildred, Mildred? What is it? Would you please join us? Dr. Shaker is here. He wants to talk to both of us. I'll be right there. I don't know what to tell you, Dr. Shaker. I know it's hard for you and your wife to understand. Believe me, I know you're trying to do what is right, but the last place for Jane to be right now is in that clinic. Listen, I want to cut this short. Jack and I have had all we can take... You came here twice a day for two weeks. We went along with it. Jane is still looking for Wanda. And you, you call yourself a doctor. And you're looking for Wanda, too. Mrs. Lytle. We love Jane. But Dr. Rossfield is right. She needs psychiatric help. And we're going to have to live with it. <sighs> for Jane's sake, I wish I could convince you you're making a big mistake. Well, it's not like she's four or five anymore. She's 14 years old. I was willing to try anything, even this far-fetched notion of yours that she might have had another life. But I realize now that we have to be realistic and objective about Jane's sickness. Oh, I'll get it. Believe me, Dr. Shaker, it, it's nothing personal. I certainly have an open mind, but what you're asking is just beyond me. 
Yes, this is Mrs. Lowe. It's a concept that most no. people have difficulty accepting. Wait, this is not mysticism. Our research I is scientific. Of Cases course, like Jane's have been well documented. Oh, well, for right me, here. it's unreal. It's not my belief. Please, I have nothing to base it on. Jack. Jack. What is it? That was the clinic. They... Well, don't just stand there. What are you trying to tell me? It's Jane. She ran away from the clinic. She broke a window to get out. Oh, no. Jack, there was blood on the floor. She must have cut herself. Uh, pardon me, could you tell me uh, what time does the feature start? In about ten minutes. Oh, thank you. I can't get in the ladies' room. It's locked. Mm -hmm. But I can hear someone in there. It sounds like she's crying. <laughs> Open the door. You hear me? Open the door. Tell Wanda to wait for me in the lobby. You'll have to open the door. I can hardly hear you. Tell Wanda I'll be right out. What did she say? Slide the lock back. And I mean now. What? What's she doing? It's that freak again. I'm going to call the police. What is it? Mr. and Mrs. Lytle are back. Have them come in. Uh, come in. Oh. I've had a report from the police. Have they found her? No, not yet, but she was in the theater. We just came from the park, and not a sign of her. Yeah, we know her pattern, her habits. It's just a question of time. I'll, I beg of you, please, wait at home. Oh, but if she's cut herself... It couldn't have been too bad, Mrs. Lytle. It was nearly two hours after she broke out when she caused a disturbance in the theater. It's obvious she's quite active... Now, the best way you can help her is to wait at home. Oh, this is so different. She's run off, but she's never done anything violent. Well, I've been studying the staff report. Jane's behavior at this point is not unexpected. She needs help, and it's going to take time. Now, I know your concern. We'll find her. Have no fears. But if you want to help Jane, then my advice is for you to go home. Oh, well, Supposing can... Jane decides to return to the house, and you're not there waiting for her. We're closed. Can't you read the sign? Uh, my name is Crane Shaker. Now listen, I'm a doctor and I'm looking for a young girl. I don't make the rules, doctor. The animal shelter is run by the county. Now it's spelled out right there. Closing hour is six o'clock. I just want to come in and look for this girl. If you will let me explain. I, I, a... I can't do it. The supervisor is gone. There's just me and one other security guard. Her name is Jane. She's 14 years old. She's in trouble. She needs me. She could be hiding in there. Well, we always do a check before we lock the gate. Now, if she was here, I'd know it. But it's possible that you may... All right, all right. You, you wait here. I'll, I'll, I'll take a look around. Doctor, doctor, I found her. She was in the storage house. Uh, come to the side gate and I'll let you in. Go away. Go away. Jane, I've come here to help you. I don't believe you anymore. You lied to me. No, Jane. Dr. Rossfield believed I was lying to him. You were going to help me find Wanda. I haven't stopped, Jane. I'm still looking for Wanda. <laughs> Who's this one? Does he drive the ambulance? No, Jane. He works here. He helps take care of the animals. I, I had to call the police. I can't help it. They, they got a rule for everything around what here. What does that mean? Well, if you're not her legal guardian, then I have to wait on the police. <laughs> Do you mind if I make use of your first aid kit? No rule says you can. I'm not leaving. That, that cut on her hand, that don't look too good. It's not too deep. No, Jane, don't take your hand away. I want to fix no, this bandage. go away. Sir, I'm sorry. Have you got a pair of scissors? Oh, wasn't there one in the kit? No, I couldn't find one. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be right back. Jane, I know where to find Wanda. Hold out your hand. No, it's telling me stories. Wanda is sleeping. No, you, you double-crossed me. Jane, listen to me. I'll take you to Wanda. I believe in you. I can prove it. Now, Jane, I'm going to open the door. Can you hear them, Jane? Listen, Jane. Wanda can't be too far away. Hello? Mr. Lytle, this is Dr. Shaker. I found Jane. You don't have to worry. She's all right. Mildred, it's Dr. Shaker. He found Jane. He says she's all right. Jack, listen to me. 
Jane and I are going to stop someplace, have some ice cream. We're going to talk. Then I don't want to take her to the clinic. I want to bring her home. Home? Now, remember, Jack, I knew where to find her. You know I'm not going to hurt her. And I need your cooperation for Jane's sake. If you insist on her going back to the clinic, then I have no choice. Where'd you find her? At the dog pound. Hey, wait a minute. Why are you holding your hand over the receiver? I want to talk to you. What's wrong? This is Dr. Shaker, and I know you think he's crazy. Oh, this is all so weird. But he knew where to go and find her. What are you trying to tell me? He wants to bring Jane home. Dr. Rossfield took him off the case. Off the case. Well, maybe Shaker is right. Maybe it's not a case. How will we ever know unless we give Shaker a chance? I don't know. Who? Well, what have we got to lose? What are you taking your tea, Doctor? Oh, just a little milk and sugar, please. I still don't understand the dog pound. The minute she got in bed, she fell asleep like a baby. Wanda supposedly had a dog that used to follow her around the park. Jane couldn't remember the dog's name. Well, after she left the theater, the police at one point spotted her on the south side, but they lost her. At that point, I knew she was looking for Wanda's dog. When I found her at the pound, she was very close to a complete breakdown. Now, please understand, we have to be very careful now. What are you asking of us? Well, I have to state to you, even though you're aware of it, that Dr. Rossfield doesn't believe in anything I'm doing for Jane. As you know, I've been taken off the case. First, I can't do anything for Jane unless you give me permission. Well, just tell me what you want me to do. To begin with... I want your full approval, and yours, Mrs. Lytle. I'd like Jane to feel she's being supported on all sides. Well, I know you're on Jane's side, but I just don't understand well, this. Well, the only way we're going to help Jane is to release her from feeling responsible about losing her sister. Well, I'm so tired of saying it. She doesn't have a sister. No, sir. There was a sister. Her name was Wanda. But it was in another life. What? Another life? Yes. There are many names for it. Some people call it reincarnation. Some people call it transcending. Some people call it transmigration of souls. I would be lying if I told you I really understood it, but I have located a Wanda, and it could be Jane's sister. Well, it's beyond me. I don't know what to say. There have been many cases recorded all over the world. It's not that uncommon. There are many institutions doing research. Try to accept it. Jane is not sick. Let's start out now by taking her statements as possible facts. Like what? Well, Jane talked about an Indian statue. Soft, ripe green pears. The park was gray. There was a street named Colby. And there was a theater named The Royal. And she talked about hearing a siren. Could have been a fire engine, an ambulance. Those are the clues. The siren, the movie theater, tell me we don't have to go back to the dark ages. It establishes the time as the present. The next step was to find the place. Jane and I both agreed that a ripe green pear is an avocado. That limited the area in which I had to search. There are not that many places that grow avocados. What did I need next? In that area, there had to be a park with an Indian statue that had water running out of its hands. There had to be a street three blocks from the park named Colby. I found such a place. It's in San Diego. The whole idea scares me. There's nothing to be afraid of, Mrs. Lytle. We can't let ourselves be trained animals, school to perform in an isolated ring. We have to open our minds. There are so many rings out there to explore. It was hard for me in the beginning to make the break. We're like computers. We've been programmed as to what to accept and what to reject. The first step is to tell yourself you are not a computer. I'll try. Well, what do you want to do, Dr. Shaker? I'd like to take Jane to San Diego, and I want you and your wife to come with me. Yes? Mrs. Weber, I'm Crane Shaker. Oh, please, come in. Would you like some coffee? Tea? I'd like you to feel comfortable with Thank me. Thank you. Nothing for me. Oh, all right. When you um, called yesterday, I must confess I was very confused. Today, I would have to say that's an understatement. What has this got to do with Wanda? I hope it's not too difficult for you to talk about. Oh, it's still difficult, even though it happened 18 years ago. I know. And I still don't know what you're talking about. Once I pinpointed the location, I went through all the obituaries. Mrs. Weber, you had two daughters named Wanda and Jane. They were killed in an automobile accident on Colby Street. I don't need you to remind me of that. 
true. Who are you? You told me on the phone you were trying to help some girl. Now, what in the world do you want from me? The cemetery, where your daughters are buried. Jane, I've brought you and your mother and father to this graveyard for a reason. Jane, look at this gravestone and tell me what you see written on it. Wanda Weber, age six. It was not your fault, Jane. The driver lost control of his car. He jumped the curb. The car tore into the swings. Wanda died in the ambulance. I can hear the siren. That Wanda died 18 years ago. Jane wasn't even born then. Wanda had a sister who was named Jane. She was also killed in the accident. You can look at the dates. It's clear to all of us that it happened 18 years ago. Jane, we have found Wanda. You don't have to look for her anymore. Y you mean another Jane? Come over here. Now, read this stone. Jane Weber, age nine. That's hard to believe. I know. It takes a while for these kinds of revelations to sink in. There were two sisters, Jane and Wanda Weber, ages six and nine. They were in the park playing on the swings. The dog started across the street. The driver of the car tried to swing around the dog. Unfortunately, he hit the curb and couldn't control the car. The car smashed into the swings. Oh. The Webbers lost both their children. And as you can see, that was 18 years ago. Oh, do come in. Mrs. Weber, this is Mr. and Mrs. Lytle. Oh, how do you do? And this is Jane. How do you do, Mrs. Weber? Well, this is strange to me, but Dr. Shaker is very compelling. And I agree we should be candid. Jane, you don't look like my Jane. You don't look like Mildred. Mildred? There was a Mildred. She was our housekeeper. Uh, I remember that door. Oh, uh, that is a closet. But... But you have to go in the closet to reach the basement door. I remember, because that's where I used to hide my toys from Wanda. That's amazing. The door to the basement is in the closet. Mrs. Weber, don't look for coincidence. And don't any of you be frightened by this. There's nothing to fear in that we are all subject to previous lives. <laughs> The door's open, Shaker. Why are you knocking on it? It was a matter of courtesy, Dr. Rossville. Well, that's the last thing I expected from you. <clears throat> you sent for me? Uh, yes. I can't deny the end results are what count. <clears throat> We've closed the book on Jane Lytle. All the symptoms have disappeared. Wanda is a figure of the past for Jane. But in all honesty, Shaker... Do you really believe in reincarnation? Do you really believe in reincarnation? There is the correct, absolute truth. And there is the truth that satisfies. Can't believe you owe the IRS that much. Well, when things just don't add up, you can count on a Sears desk calculator to help you. Add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Then read the figures two different ways. 12-digit lighted display and tape printout for your records. There's a two-memory system that helps ease multi-step problems, plus its many extras make it a great time saver. Now at most Sears retail stores. Sears two-memory desk calculator. Cut $25, just $99.99 through March 10th. Prices and dates may vary in Alaska and Hawaii. You want to buy some radios, but time's all with the same. You've got to have good feelings, you've got to trust the name. You know our reputation, remember what we said. When Sears is behind you, you come out ahead. When my brother...
brother was my age, being in style meant wearing old jeans and about a pound of dirt. But today, us guys are more sophisticated in our style. And that's why Sears has Style Works. A guy can pick up on the latest styles in jeans, tops, sweaters, and dress your clothes like vested suits. I can depend on the Style Works shop at Sears for just about everything to keep me looking great. And the prices? Pretty reasonable. My folks like that. Style Works. Today, style's all in one place. At most larger Sears retail stores. To look the height of fashion wherever I go requires many coats. But for home, I need only one coat fashion surrounding me. Sears Best Easy Living Interior Paint. One coat of easy living on the walls and every room looks stunning while I entertain or just relax. Choose from 24 decorator colors in easy living flat latex and semi-gloss, plus bright white ceiling paint for your home. Because with Sears Easy Living Paint, all you need is one coat when used as directed at most Sears retail stores. You've been listening to Sears Radio Theater, brought to you five nights a week by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops. Wanda was written by Bernard Girard. Produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Lynn Berman, Peggy Weber, and Rusi Taylor. Also heard were Barney Phillips, Michael Gelman, Byron Kane, Sarah Selby, Herb Vigran, Barbara Townsend, and Lorene Tuttle. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. Art Gilmore speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. I'm Andy Fisher, WNEW News. At seven minutes past ten, time for the Sears Radio Theater. That's the theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight is a love story with Cicely Tyson as your host. Here's a preview. I think Ernie's finally gone to sleep. I'm glad. Being trapped in this elevator has done something to him. It's done something to us all. Yes, it's true. It's done something to us. But what made Ernie into what he is happened long ago. Not tonight in this elevator. You're as bad as Ernie. You're so bitter. The Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. This is Lucille Ball, here to make a personal appeal to every American. Since the 1880s, the American Red Cross has been stepping in when there's been big trouble, like a hurricane. But nobody has to tell you the Red Cross is there when a hurricane strikes. So let's talk about the other Red Cross, your neighborhood Red Cross. They teach kids to swim. Hey, that's good, Eddie. And they train about every lifeguard on every beach. I think it's possible to look into it. We can get in touch with the local chapter. They help again. veterans get on their feet. They help people relocate after fires. Are you comfortable? Okay, now relax. They collect and distribute blood. They give a hand to the older folks in your town and do scores of other jobs. It's running very nicely. It's easy to see why we've got to have Red Cross, and only you can keep Red Cross ready for the little emergencies in your neighborhood. And the big ones. Help keep Red Cross ready. This is Cicely Tyson. Most of the lights on most of the floors of this glass and steel monolith have gone out. It's late. The workday is over for nearly everyone in this building. Only three people remain. They stand together, silent, waiting for the elevator. Anna Kaufman, 62 years old, her mop and bucket at her feet, is the cleaning woman here. Nightly, she scrubs and dusts and empties the waste baskets and ashtrays. Ernie Matrano, is adjusting the belt of his ill-fitting dark blue security officer's uniform. He shifts from foot to foot, pushing the elevator button every few seconds, unable to stay still for very long. Barney Albers stares straight ahead, unaware of her companions, thinking of the subway ride home. She's rehearsing in her mind how she will make sure she hasn't been followed before she steps inside her apartment building. 
Bonnie lives alone, and she's frightened. She carries her fears with her always, and often works late at the office to avoid going home to the emptiness. And now it begins. Finally, these three silent people will speak. What floor? Nine, please. Ground. <laughs> What's happened? We've stopped. I don't know. We're stuck. We're stuck in here. Just hold on. That's what this here alarm's for, you know. There's no one to hear. We're alone. Now, these three will speak as they never have before or ever will again. Sears Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Brought to you five nights a week by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops. Your hosts, Lorne Green. I'll bring you stories of the Old West and the New. Andy Griffith with a look at the funny side of life. Vincent Price with tales of mystery and suspense. Cicely Tyson with stories about love, hate, and related things. Richard Whitmark. I'll bring you stories of pure adventure. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis' production of The Sears Radio Theater. Our story, The Long Night, by Pamela Russell. Our stars, Naomi Stevens, Vic Perrin, and Jennifer Penny. I sell draperies at Sears. Yesterday, a lady came in and said that she'd been in and out of about every store in town looking for draperies and at this point didn't know what she wanted anymore. I asked questions about her tastes and decor and then made suggestions. She was thrilled. She found what she wanted and learned a little too. It made me feel good to know that I helped her out. Sears people are friendly people who help you find what you want. Sears, 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 where America shops. Well, this spring for women, the fashion place at Sears suggests these up-to-date separates. They're comfortably casual yet dressy and light-hearted enough to go anywhere this spring. Margaret mixes Sears textured blazer and the small collar striped shirt with trousers. While Wendy wears a shawl collar blouse and the slim down dirndl skirt. Color coordinated, these great looking separates will come together beautifully for you. Spring's mixable, matchable, up-to-date separates. Get them at most larger Sears retail stores. Convenience and security. The Sears Best Garage Door Opener is just that. Digital control lets you select your own key signal from 512 different transmitting codes. Sears Best Garage Door Opener has a vacation switch that'll lock out stray signals when you're away from home for long periods of time. Of course, when you're home, you won't have to get out of your car to open up that heavy door. Sears Best Garage Door Opener, featuring digital control, gives you convenience and helps you feel secure. Available at most larger Sears retail stores. When my brother was my age, being in style meant wearing old jeans and about a pound of dirt. But today, us guys are more sophisticated in our style. And that's why Sears has Style Works. A guy can pick up on the latest styles in jeans, tops, sweaters, and dress your clothes like vested suits. I can depend on the Style Works shop at Sears for just about everything to keep me looking great. And the prices? Pretty reasonable. My folks like that. Style Works. Today, style's all in one place. At most larger Sears retail stores. They stand in the unmoving elevator, these three. They've never before spoken, never before paid any particular attention to one another, probably never knew the others existed. Yet, here they are, locked together in a tiny room, a stalled elevator in an enormous dark office building. Everyone's gone home. There's no one, no one to hear us. There's got to be somebody. Hey! Hey, somebody! Anybody! We're stuck in here. Hey, can anybody hear me? Hey, hey, somebody! If they did 
didn't hear the alarm, they won't hear you shouting. There is no one to hear. How do you know? How come you're so sure? You have a watch. What is the time? It's almost ten. Well, who else would be here on this floor on a Thursday night? Who else but people like you and me? People who clean and guard. Well, and what's she doing here, huh? What are you doing here? Well, there's always so much work in our office. Sometimes I stay late. Well, maybe there's somebody else around as hardworking as you, huh? Hey, hey, somebody! We're stuck in here. Hey! I think there's something else you could do. Like what? I don't know. Fix it or something. Huh, that's real good. That's real good thinking. I'm a security guard, not an elevator repairman, you know. What about that telephone? You got me calling myself. This is a direct line down to the security desk on the ground floor, which is where I ought to be right now. Couldn't you crawl up through the shaft? Oh, you've been watching too many movies. I ain't Spider-Man, you know. I just thought that there might be something else you could do. Something besides screaming and pounding. That's making me very nervous. I ain't exactly feeling serene myself. But tell you what, you get any more of them bright ideas climbing shafts and stuff, you be sure and tell them to me, okay? So what are we supposed to do now? Wait. For what? For how long? <laughs> you got me. I think I'm just going to sit down and get comfortable. What you do is up to you. Could it be that this is one of those blackouts? No, we still got the lights. It's just this elevator that's stuck, that's all. And I had to get in it. It figures. Just my luck. My name is Anna Kaufman. Bonnie. Bonnie Albers. <laughs> what do you two think this is, a tea party or something? We may be here for many hours. It's good to know who we are with, yes? Right. Anything you say. And what is your name? Matrano. And your given name? Ernie. You talk funny, lady. You talk like some of them Polacks I grew up with in the old neighborhood. Are you a Polak? Why do you ask? Because you talk funny. You ain't an American. Yes, I am. I'm an American citizen, Ernie. Ah, uh, not born here, you weren't. Don't tell me that. I know better. You're very quick, Ernie. Yes, a long time ago, I... I... I came from Poland. I was a Pole. Yeah, I knew it. You can't fool me. I was not trying to, Ernie. Have you been here in America a very long time, Mrs. Kaufman? Oh, please, call me Anna. 32 years I've lived in America, more than half of my life. I've lived here all my life. You are proud, Ernie, to have been born in America? Yeah, I guess. My old man, he was the one who was proud. All his sons born in America. He used to say that. My mom told me. I don't remember much about him. Your father, he, he's dead? Yeah, he worked on the docks. He got killed on the docks. I was just a little kid when he died. And your mother? She's still around. You sure ask a lot of questions, lady. Anna, please call me Anna. Yeah, all right. You ask a lot of questions. How come? I'm sorry. I, I'm a little uneasy being here like this. I, I try to make it easier. That That's why I talk so much. I'm frightened too, Anna. And so quiet, so silent in your fear. You remind me of someone, Bonnie. Who? My daughter. Is she about my age? I'm 27. No, she would have been older than that now, had she lived. Oh, I'm sorry. Anna, why don't we sit down? I'm used to standing, but yes, it's a good idea. We'll sit down, Bonnie, and we'll talk. Oh, haven't you been talking enough already? I have a son, an all-American boy born in America, very like Ernie. I have not seen him in a long time. It's sad when families drift apart. My folks live in Oregon, my little sister and brother, mom and dad. It's been five years since I've been out there to see them. I miss them. My son has his own family now. He has no need of me. I, I'm his past, and like most Americans, he has a little time for the past. Oh, you're right there, lady. Forget the past. It's over and done with. Today, that's what matters. I am what I am now. I ain't what I used to be. Do you like who you are now, Ernie? Yeah, sure I do. And did you like who you used to be? I don't know what you're talking about, lady. Anna. Yeah, right. Anna, what was your daughter's name? Margit. Little Margit. Sweet child. She had eyes just the color of yours, Bonnie. I remember everything about her. Please, tell me about her. She was so good on the train. She never once cried. I held her in my arms and she looked up at me with her big dark eyes. She never cried. But she was so 
so afraid. We were all afraid on that train. There were no windows, so we couldn't see where we were going, and none of us, not in our worst nightmares, could have imagined our destination. And finally, the train stopped. They opened the doors, and they began shouting at us, and we all got out as quickly as we could, but some didn't move because they died on the train, and outside, my young husband stood beside me, and I held Margie tightly. I thought, what is this place? What is this horrible place? Where was it? Where was it that that happened? It was Auschwitz. Do you know of it? Auschwitz, Bunny? No. It was one of them camps the Germans had during the war. A death camp, yes, where Jews and others were killed, gassed by the Nazis. You were in one of them? Yes. I was in Auschwitz for eight months. But your husband, your little girl... My husband had tuberculosis. He, he made no effort to conceal it from the Germans. They had doctors there. They separated the sick, and we thought that he'd be taken to a hospital. We didn't know that the sick died first in Auschwitz. The sick and the old, then the children. Well, they couldn't work. They were of no use, so they were gassed. They marched my husband directly from the train to the chambers, and... Then they began taking the little ones. I tried to hide Margit. She was so small. I, I thought they wouldn't see her under my coat. But they did. They pulled her from me. Still, she didn't cry. As they led her away, she looked back at me. I can see her eyes now, even now. It's the last time I ever saw her. It's so hard to believe. How could anything like that have happened? That is it, Bonnie. That is why so many died. They could not, they would not believe that human beings were capable of doing the things that were being done to other human beings. It was so unreal, but it happened. Now, that's something I never could understand. Why so many of them just walked to the ovens? Why didn't they fight? You don't know, Ernie, and I can't tell you, and I can't make you see what we faced. But I also cannot listen while you condemn all those who died. You don't know, Ernie. And you can't, but you must not condemn. Well, it's like I say. It's the past, you know. There ain't no use crying over spilt milk. Spilt milk? You're talking about millions of lives. Little children, innocent babies, millions of them murdered. That's too bad. It had to happen. I'm real sorry for them kids, but it, it's more than 30 years ago. They're dead. There's no saving them now, lady. My name is Anna, Anna Kaufman. You will not call me lady. You will not take my name from me and give me a number as they did. I am Anna Kaufman. Okay, okay. It's all right, Anna. It's all right now. Please don't cry. No, it's not all right, but I won't cry. I cried all of my tears many years ago. How did you get to America, Anna? I married an American soldier, the father of my son. Harold was a good man. He's gone now, too. He didn't understand either, Ernie. I was younger then. I, I tried to explain it to him, but there's no explaining it. There's no true understanding of it if you didn't live it. But at least it can be remembered. And what good is that going to do? If it's remembered, then it can't happen again. Nothing like that could ever happen in America anyway. No good at all comes from remembering stuff like that. Do you know, Ernie, that I can still see the faces of the German guards at Auschwitz? They look just like Americans. It would have been easier if they'd been devils with horns and tails, but they were just men, some of them young boys. They wore uniforms and they followed orders. Well, you wore an army uniform once, too, didn't you, Ernie? Huh? Stop jiggling your keys. I asked you, weren't you in the army? The tattoo on the back of your hand, it says Vietnam. Were you in Vietnam, Ernie? Yeah, I did a tour of duty in Nam. What of it? You went? You fought in Vietnam? Was there anything wrong with that? I was 18 when I got drafted. Listen, I was proud to do my duty. I, I want to get out of here. Why did you do that? You know there's no one to hear it. I got to get out of here. You two are driving me nuts. A couple of weirdos talking all the time about dying and killing and stuff like that. What's the matter with you? Nobody's done anything to you. Yeah? Well, I don't like the way she looks at me. 
Joanna's not bothering you. Oh, yes, she is. She thinks I did something. She thinks I killed gook women and kids, don't you? Did you, Ernie? I never did nothing like that. I never did. I gotta get out of here. Somebody! Get me out of here! Somebody, anybody! I gotta get out of here! Words out and spreading fast about the jeans from Sears Men's Store that grow old beautifully. Thumbs up. It's a sure sign they're feeling fine and feeling good. Thumbs up. For the denim that keeps going strong a long time. Thumbs up. Get them trim cut, regular cut, even get them pre-washed. Thumbs up. The jeans that grow old beautifully. Now at most Sears retail stores. Thumbs up. Oh, here I go again. It's time to rent one of those steam-type carpet cleaners. Why rent? Now Sears puts power in a carpet cleaner you can own yourself. The power spray from Sears for easy home carpet cleaning. Power spray sprays hot water into your carpet, then sucks up the dirty water. You can see the dirt you get out. Dirt you didn't even know was there. The Power Spray Carpet Cleaner, a convenient carpet cleaner you can own yourself. Available at most Sears retail stores. Kenmore. <coughs> Solid as Sears. Come, spin the wheel of fashion. Discover a fortune of spring separates at Sears Junior Bazaar. Ah, silk blend skirt and pants in dusty pastels. A blend of polyester, rayon, and silk, making them easy care, wrinkle resistant. Top them off with white on white polyester and cotton blouses. Fashion is your fate at Junior Bazaar. Available at most larger Sears retail stores. Can't believe you owe the IRS that much? Well, when things just don't add up, you can count on a Sears desk calculator to help you. Add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Then read the figures two different ways. 12-digit lighted display and tape printout for your records. There's a two-memory system that helps ease multi-step problems, plus its many extras make it a great time saver. Now at most Sears retail stores. Sears two-memory desk calculator. Cut $25, just $99.99 through March 10th. Prices and dates may vary in Alaska and Hawaii. The two women silently watch Ernie pound out his frustration. He stops finally and stares, eyes unblinking, seeing something in his memory, something ghastly. Ernie. Ernie! Don't, don't touch me. Leave me alone, will you? But I can't, Ernie. We are all here together, remember? Yeah, I remember. How am I going to forget it? Maybe I can do something about it, though. Stop it. What do you think you're doing? Uh, you wanted a hero? Maybe I can loosen one of them panels and climb up through. I got to get out of here. You can't. You might as well forget it. There's no way out. We're trapped here. <sighs> Stop it! Stop it, I said! Stop! All right. All right. It ain't working anyway. Nothing works for me. Me, a hero. Oh, that's pretty funny. What is the time now? Hmm? It's almost midnight. And when will someone come and find us? My shift's over at six. The guy that relieves me, Bascom, he's always late... One thing for sure, he won't know how to get us out of here. But he can get someone who will know. Oh, Bascom's as dumb as a lunch bucket, but yeah, you can probably find somebody. Maybe. Ernie, before, you were talking about when you were in the army. I don't want to talk about it. Why are you so rude? I ain't rude. I just mind my own business, and I expect other people to do the same. Anna, I'm sorry that I asked you about your daughter. I know how painful it must be for you to talk about it. No, no, Bonnie, it's good. It's not easy, but it helps me. It's good to know that someone listens, someone hears you. I know so little about those times. In school, they taught us dates and the names of battles and generals, but nothing about the camps and what people suffered in them. Some people want to believe that if they don't talk about something, then it never happened. They hope their silence will make it disappear. Do you believe, Anna, it could ever happen here? I believe it could happen anywhere. 
Even here. Oh, come on. We ain't Nazis or whatever. Them Krauts, they was born knowing how to follow orders and stuff. They do what they're told. So some crazy guy like Hitler comes along and tells them to start killing people, and they do it. Well, we ain't Krauts here. We're Americans. Nothing like that could ever happen here. You're so sure of that, Ernie? Yes, I am. Perhaps it could not happen in America, but do you think that Americans are not capable of doing what the Germans did somewhere else? Not here, not home, in America, but in a place like Vietnam? I told you I didn't want to talk about Nam, about the army. I told you that. Why don't you just try and get some sleep, Ernie? We all should. We won't talk anymore. No, she wants to talk, don't you? Anna. She wants to hear all about Vietnam. She wants me to spill my guts, don't you, Anna? No, Ernie, you want to. You need to very badly. I don't need nothing or nobody. Yes, you do. We all do. Not me. Nobody never helped me. Nobody never gave me a break. My old man, he got croaked before I ever knew him. And my ma, all she ever did was yell at me like it was my fault or something. Well, I didn't want him to die and leave us. It wasn't my fault. I've been alone my whole life. And I like it like that. You hear me? I like to be alone. All right, we believe you. I don't believe that you like being alone, Ernie. Being lonely. I ain't lonely. Why don't you get off my back? What do you want from me anyway? I don't have any stories like yours to tell about people dying and getting killed, kids and people. I don't have any stories like that. No, not everyone has stories like mine, Ernie. I'm very happy they don't. Yeah? Well, I don't know. You hit me as a type that likes misery, sort of like my ma. You're too smart to be a cleaning lady. You could have done something else if you wanted to. Maybe you like being miserable, feeling sorry for yourself, wanting everybody else to feel sorry for you, too. That's not true. How do you know? Who are you defending? You don't know her. Neither do you. You're just so bitter you can't see anything but bad. I've seen guys like you. I've worked in a veteran's hospital. Oh, yeah? A couple of afternoons a week and Sundays maybe, I'll bet, huh? Cute little volunteer do-gooder. Come for a few hours, make yourself feel real good about yourself, and then leave it all behind. You've seen guys like me, huh? Well, I've seen little girls like you. I was in one of them hospitals. Were you wounded, Ernie? <sighs> Always with the questions. No, I didn't get shot. I went nuts. I tried psycho. I was in the psycho ward. They didn't let little girls like you visit there. Not on afternoons, not on Sunday, not never. But I seen you. I seen you making nice with the respectable guys, the guys in wheelchairs or, or blind or with hooks for hands. I worked with the mental patients, too, Ernie. Oh, did you? I bet you really helped them a lot, too. I did what I could. Some of them guys were just playing at being nuts, you know? You ever run into any of them that was just playing at it? Yes. I bet you thought they was real smart, them guys that was playing crazy to get out of going over, huh? No, I didn't think they were very smart. But I could understand why they did what they did. I wouldn't have wanted to go either. Yeah, but you didn't have to worry about it because you ain't a man. Sure is a broad's world. I don't know about that. <laughs> well, I do. Oh, I tell you, I was glad to get out of that place. I'll be almost as glad when I get out of this here elevator. There was this one guy in the hospital, you know. He thought he was a snake. He'd hide under your bed, and if you didn't watch yourself when you got up in the morning, he'd bite your feet. I guess that sounds kind of funny, huh? Well, it sure wasn't funny at the time. No, I suppose not. Well, you suppose right. Come to think of it, though, it wasn't really any crazier in that hospital than it was in Nam. Nothing made any sense there, either. And those gooks, there was no figure in them. They all looked the same, they all dressed the same. Some old gook grandma would be coming down the road and she'd reach into her old baggy coat and bring out a machine gun and you were dead. Grandma would run off into the jungle and he'd never find her. And there's Andy. Never knew what hit him. Lying in the road, bleeding like a stuck pig, dying. And for what? For what? I don't know. You and me both. Who was Andy? How'd you know about Andy? You just said his name. Who was he? Oh, uh, just a guy, a guy I knew. He died? Yeah. He was a friend of yours? I told you, he was a guy I knew. He was not your friend, Ernie? Why do you keep harping at me? I knew him, okay? Anna, I don't think Ernie wants to talk about it anymore. I never did, you know. I never did want to talk about it. It's water under the bridge. There ain't no use talking or thinking about it no more. It's over and done with. But you do think about it, don't you, Ernie? Anna, please. What do you want from me, huh? What do you want? 
I want to know about Andy. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about Andy. He was my buddy. He was the only friend I ever had. And I was walking right next to him when he bought it. One minute he was there and laughing, and the next minute he was down, dead. I should have gone after that old lady then, but all I could do was stand there and look at Andy. I, I, I couldn't believe it. I kept thinking he was going to get up and laugh and say it was all a joke. I couldn't believe it. Andy was dead. My buddy was dead. And then what happened? Well, what do you think happened? They shipped him home in a shiny box all wrapped up in a pretty flag. And you, they put you in the hospital then? No, that was later, after we went into that village. It was later, Ernie? No, no, it was then, right after Andy got it. I went kind of nutso for a while. They sent me back to the States to a hospital. No, Ernie, before you went home, before you went mad nuts, as you call it, before any of that, you went to a village, Ernie. What happened in that village? Nothing. Nothing happened. Ernie. Anna, please. Stop, please, Anna. Ernie. Anna. Ernie. Get me out of here. Get me out. Get me out of here. Don't shoot. Don't shoot her. Don't shoot him. Don't shoot him. They're just kids. Don't shoot. Don't, don't, don't. Ernie. Ernie. Come. Sit down. It was just a crummy little place. Not fit for pigs, much less people. Word come down there was Viet Cong hidden there. And that they was operating out of this village. We went in to find him. I don't know how it started. All of a sudden, everybody was shooting. It was like, I don't know, like they got a taste of it or something. I didn't want to do it. There was this old lady, and she was running, and her old coat was flopping around, and she looked just like the one that killed Andy. So, so, so I took aim, real careful, and I shot her. She fell, and I ran over to her, and I shot her again, and again, and again, and again. And I don't know why I kept firing like that. I, I didn't want to. I didn't mean to. It was all a mistake. I didn't really want to kill that old lady. Yes, you did, Ernie. Anna! Now, don't you say that to me. Don't you ever say that to me. I'll kill you. You ever say that to me again, you hear me? I'll kill you. Sears Radio Theater will return after this message from your local station. What if you went off to college and found that you were different from everyone else and everything was designed for them, not for you? Suppose you went to the library and all the books you needed were in Braille and you were the only one who couldn't read. You'd feel left out, wouldn't you? And what if you went to class and found that there were no chairs because all the other students rolled in with their own wheelchairs? Suppose one of your professors gave his lectures talking with his hands only his hands, and everyone understood sign language except you, you'd think it wasn't fair. Well, that's how handicapped people feel now when they go to college and find extra handicaps. But things are changing, and we have free information that can help. Write Closer Look, Box 1492, Washington, D.C., 20013. A public service message on behalf of the United States Office of Education. There's a million stories in this city, and it's my job to see they have happy endings. I'm Sam Hart. I was working the warehouse district with Shorty and Kitten on a bleary-eyed 4 a.m. Wednesday. Walking down an alley, I could swear I was being followed. I turned a corner and waited. Nothing. As I moved on, I felt a sudden fullness, pressure in my chest. I felt nauseous. Somehow, I knew that the big one, heart attack, had caught up to me. Shorty! Shorty! Heart! Heart! It can't be. Kitten, call for help. I'm starting CPR. I'm gone already. Without Kitten and Shorty around the corner, I would have taken the deep six. You think it'll never happen to you, but I had it coming. I knew I had high blood pressure, but I wasn't taking my medicine. A lot of people don't. Contact your American Heart Association for information on heart attack and high blood pressure. They're fighting for your life. Cicely Tyson.
Tyson again. And here's the concluding act of The Long Night. I think Ernie's finally gone to sleep. I'm glad. Being trapped in this elevator has done something to him. It's done something to us all. Yes, it's true. It's done something to us. But what made Ernie into what he is happened long ago. Not tonight in this elevator. You're as bad as Ernie. You're so bitter. Can't you accept that what happened in Vietnam was a horrible mistake on Ernie's part? Can't you believe him when he says he didn't mean to do it? No, I can't believe or accept that. Has your whole world become a death camp? Do you think that everyone is cruel and evil and that we're all murderers? I don't believe that, Bonnie. Shall I tell you what I do believe? I'm not sure I want to hear it. I do. I ain't been sleeping. I've been listening and I want to hear what she says now. It's not true that my world is all in Auschwitz. Not anymore. There was a time when it was, but no longer. I believe that there is within the best of men, within all men, all human beings, the possibility of inhumanity, of evil. It is within us all. I saw it in Auschwitz. And Ernie has told us of it in a tiny village in a little country very far away. It was not a mistake that Ernie shot that woman. It was not a mistake. It was hatred and revenge. He meant to do it. He wanted to do it. Ernie knows that, and he knows that I'm not afraid to confront him. Don't you, Ernie? Yeah, I know it. The knowledge, the admission of the deed must come first. Then comes forgiveness. Have you ever been forgiven, Ernie? No, never. Nobody never forgave me because there ain't nobody who can. Yes, there is. I forgive you, Ernie. I know what you did, and I forgive you. Well, why should you? You, of all people. Who better than I? I'm a survivor. I lost everything and everyone that's dear to me. What good is a person like me, a survivor, but to remember and to forgive? Then life may go on. I know that some people think forgiveness is God's alone to give, but God seems so far away sometimes. Where was God in Auschwitz? He was in the survivors. That's where. Where was God in Vietnam? He was in the boys who were driven mad with guilt for what they'd done. You, Ernie, you too are a survivor of a holocaust. You must remember and you must give your forgiveness with mine. You must forgive yourself, Ernie, as I do. Thank you, Anna. Anna, I'm so sorry for what I said to you. I didn't understand. I know. I know. It's difficult for a girl like you to even imagine such horrors as death camps and massacres. And how could you know of such things? How could you be expected to understand them? A girl like you. It might be easier for me than you realize. The summer that I turned 19, something happened to me. Something happened that I'll never forget. Yes, Bonnie. My parents thought that I was in California attending the summer session of my college. They thought that was why I wasn't coming home in June. And I wasn't lying to them, not in the beginning. I really was going to take some classes. I hadn't done very well my first year, nothing like I had in high school. In high school, I, I did everything. I was always involved in activity, straight-A student. But it didn't help. I still felt so alone and isolated. I put all my hopes into college. I thought it would be a kind of miracle. Finally, I'd be inside. I'd belong. But it didn't work out that way. What happened that summer? I'm trying to tell you. I knew it wouldn't be easy, but I didn't think it would be this hard. Look, kid, maybe it just ain't the right time for you to talk. No, I have to. I want to tell you. Just before the summer session was to begin, I met this girl. You see, I lived in a dorm on campus. I used to eat all my meals there. But I'd heard some kids talking about a little health food restaurant a few blocks away. I decided to go there. That's where I met Monica. She was a waitress there. She was really friendly and nice to me. I think she talked to me more in just a few minutes than my roommate in the dorm had all year. She dressed a little strange. She wore her hair all wild, long, and frizzy. But I didn't think very much about the way she looked. I was so happy to have a friend. She lived close by in a big old house with a lot of other kids. All I could think about as we walked over there was 
that I hoped that they all liked me as much as Monica seemed to. On the front porch, a boy with a beard and no shirt sat and played a guitar. <laughs> Inside, there were old bare mattresses everywhere and murals on the walls, painted sunrises and clouds and people floating through the clouds. Strange and beautiful pictures like I'd never seen before. Yeah, it sounds like one of them hippie pads. I didn't know what it was. It was all so different and strange. I guess I was pretty backward coming from Oregon. My hometown was such a little out of the way place. We didn't know what a hippie was. Oh, sure, we saw the news on television, student riots, and people burning their draft cards. But that was television. It was hard for me to believe there really were people like that. Anyway, Monica and I sat on one of those mattresses and talked for hours. I should say I talked. Monica listened. Nobody had ever really listened to me before. Then this man came up and sat down between Monica and me. He had long hair and a mustache. But he looked different, older. There was something in his eyes. He just sat there and watched me. When he left, Monica turned to me and smiled. That was Larry, she said. And you're in if you want to be. I didn't have to ask what she meant. <sighs> I moved into the house that night. I didn't attend any classes that summer. This man you speak of, his name was Larry? Yes. And his last name? I didn't know it at first. Monica never mentioned it. Everyone just called him Larry, that was all. I didn't know his last name then. But you know it now, Bonnie. Yes, I know it. So, what's the big deal? What was his name anyway? Who even cares? He was just some hippie creep. No. Larry was more than that. Much more. Not just a creep. Worse than that. And not a hippie. The hippies preach love, remember? Larry preached something very different. Anna knows, don't you, Anna? You know his name. Yes, I think that I do. Then why don't you say it? No, Bonnie. I think it's for you to say. Larry. Larry Jordan. Larry Jordan? He was the guy who... Murdered 12 people. He gave the orders to do it, and his orders were always obeyed. Believe me, I know. But you weren't... I mean, you didn't... Kill for him? No, I didn't. I left that house before anyone died, but I didn't leave it soon enough. I went home to Oregon. I didn't return to school that fall. And in December, just before Christmas, the stories of the murders began to break in the papers. At first, I couldn't believe it. But then I knew it was true. I never told my folks or anyone about that summer. Until now. But you never really did nothing. Nothing to blame yourself for. But I lived there with those people, those horrible people. I could be in prison right now like Monica is. Monica, who was always giggling and playing with her silver puzzle ring, in prison for stabbing three people to death. That could have been me. I could have stayed. You could have, but you did not. Still, I felt marked spoiled by what had happened. I quit college. It was as if I felt I didn't deserve to go. I've allowed no one in my life, no one to love me, because I didn't feel I had the right to be loved. It's not so, Bonnie. You deserve to be loved. You have the right to love. What Anna says is true, kid. Don't be so hard on yourself. Look at me. I forgive you. Thank you, Ernie. Anna. It's been a long night. What is the time now, Ernie? Uh, it's almost six. You think I should hit the alarm? I mean, you know, maybe my luck is changing. Maybe just this once, Bascom will be on time. A little early, even. Try and see, Ernie. Uh. Hey! Hey, somebody! Hey, anybody there? Uh, I guess maybe my luck hasn't changed all that much. Is somebody there? Somebody! Hey, in here! We're stuck in the elevator! Who is it? It's me, Matrano. Matrano? I've been looking all over for you! I got two ladies in here with me. We've been stuck all night. Don't sound like too bad an arrangement. <laughs> funny, real funny, Bascom. You think you could get us out of here? I just hold on, Matrano. 
I'll go down and see if I can get the building maintenance guys on the phone. Just hold on now. <laughs> Luck really has changed. I'll bet that's the first time Bascom's ever been early for work in his entire life. <laughs> All I wanted this whole night was to get out of here. <laughs> it's funny, now that we're going to, I almost don't want to. I feel very much as you do, Bonnie. Yeah, I guess I sort of do, too. Listen, if I was a little rough at times, you know, I, I'm sorry. You were fine, Ernie, just fine. I want to always remember this night and the both of you. We won't forget, will we? Tomorrow, next week, or next year, we won't pass each other in the corridor and not speak, will we? No, this we will not forget. Nah, I won't forget the two of you. And I'll talk to you when I see you, but one thing I ain't gonna do again in a hurry. What, Ernie? I ain't gonna climb into an elevator with you again, okay? <laughs> oh, that'll be Baskin from the security desk. He wouldn't climb ten flights of stairs if his grandmother was stuck in here. All right, Baskin, what's up? Well, I talked to the building maintenance guy. And? Well, they're going to get here as soon as they can. The one guy told me they could probably take you out one by one through the shaft. Otherwise, it might be an hour or more before they could get the elevator running again. We'll wait. What are you, nuts? What do you mean you want to wait? We'll wait and go out together. Yes, yes, together. Mm, suit yourself. Together, huh? <laughs> Boy, there ain't no understanding some people. I can't believe they can do it for $19.99. Installed? The Illumini Sears Muzzler is only $19.99 installed. And listen to the Muzzler promise. Sears promises that the Muzzler will last as long as you own your American-made car. Or return it for refund or replacement free. And if Sears installed it, they'll install the new one free. Well, you can't beat that. I think it's fantastic. It's a great promise. The Muzzler, just $19.99 installed. Clamps if needed, 99 cents each extra. Sizes to fit most American-made cars. Prices may vary in Alaska and Hawaii at most Sears Tire and Auto Centers. To look the height of fashion wherever I go requires many coats. But for home, I need only one coat fashion surrounding me. Sears Best Easy Living Interior Paint. One coat of easy living on the walls and every room looks stunning. While I entertain or just relax. Choose from 24 decorator colors in easy living flat latex and semi-gloss. Plus bright white ceiling paint for your home. Because with Sears Easy Living Paint, all you need is one coat. When used as directed at most Sears retail stores. Come, spin the wheel of fashion. Discover a fortune of spring separates at Sears Junior Bazaar. Ah, silk blend skirt and pants in dusty pastels. A blend of polyester, rayon, and silk, making them easy care, wrinkle resistant. Top them off with white on white polyester and cotton blouses. Fashion is your fate at Junior Bazaar. Available at most larger Sears retail stores. Dear, today I found the bedroom suite of my dreams at a great price. That's a coincidence. I found one that has all the features. Well, mine has authentic country styling. So does mine. Does yours have a beautiful 26-step finish? Nothing but, and I get a choice of 13 different pieces. All built to last for a long time? Yes, with sturdy tongue and groove construction and dovetail jointed drawers. <gasps> Is yours Sears, Sears open, open hearth, hearth bedroom, bedroom furniture? furniture? Sears open hearth bedroom collection. Expert craftsmanship at a reasonable price. Select from 13 different pieces. Now at most Sears retail stores. You've been listening to Sears Radio Theater, brought to you five nights a week by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops. The Long Night was written by Pamela Russell. Produced and directed by Fletcher Martel. Your hostess was Cicely Tyson. Our stars were Naomi Stevens, Vic Perrin, and Jennifer Penny. Also heard was Jerry Hausner. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. Art Gilmore speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. 
What's your trivia specialty? Entertainment, sports, recent world history, or maybe potluck? Hi, I'm Bill St. James, and beginning Monday between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. on my show and the William B. Williams Show, you'll get a chance to test your skills when we play the trivia game. To become eligible, just send a card to Trivia, WNEW, 565 Fifth Avenue, New York, 10017. Be sure to include your name, address, phone number, and the category you'd like to be trivial in. Entertainment, sports, recent world history or potluck. If your card is selected, Willie or myself will ask you a trivia quickie. If your answer is correct according to our sources, you'll win $10 and a shot at a Jim Low trivia tuppy worth $100. And all contestants who play become eligible for a weekly drawing when we'll give away a complete AMFM stereo music system. The triviality starts Monday. So get your name, address, phone number and trivia category in the mail to Trivia WNEW 565 Fifth Avenue, New York. It's fun! The price is right, and who knows, you might even learn something. certain foods, plants, and animal products you can't bring back to the U.S. You can't because they're prohibited. They're prohibited because even one of these foods, plants, or animal products might carry a disease or pest that could spread to our crops and gardens and animals with devastating results. You haven't been everywhere on the globe yet, but there's always tomorrow. And before you go again, write for the free booklet that explains the law. Even one can hurt. Write for Traveler's Tips. Write to Traveler's Tips, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington, D.C., 20250. I'm lost and lonely, scared and sad, trembling at the thought of making you mad. My love is yours, but at times you're so cold. If life's like this, take me before I grow old. This song was written by a man now serving time in a state prison. Most of the men and women in prison today were abused children, and many abused children grow up to abuse their own children. Child abusers can be helped. Find out how. Write Prevent Child Abuse, Box 2866, Chicago, Illinois, 60690. Please stop the hurt. I've suffered since my birth. Join the abused child's fight. A message of the Ad Council and the National Committee for Prevention of Child Abuse. Tomorrow, the Sears Radio Theater is an adventure story with Richard Widmark as your host. Let's listen. Did you get that, Mr. McGuffey? McGuffey? Get what? I said the opium shipment will put in a Djibouti. Instead of Mombasa. So be sure and tune in tomorrow to the Sears Radio Theater. I'm Charles Scott King, WNEW News. At nine minutes past ten, time for Sears Radio Theater. the theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight is a story of adventure with Richard Whitmark as your host. Did you get that, Mr. McGuffey? McGuffey? Get what? I said the opium shipment will put in a Djibouti instead of Mombasa. The Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. <laughs> Association says smoke's not just your affair. That smoke screen that you puff around pollutes non-smokers' air. It's bad for kids and older folks with lungs not up to par. It's damaging for you, of course, but your smoke travels far. Your lung association says please keep this thought in mind. It's double damage all around and doubly unkind. So try to keep the habit and give want a break. Please do it for your life and breath and everybody's sake. Your lung 
Association and you know that cigarettes are a breathing hazard. Smokers, please don't add that extra offense. Give us a break for life and breath. This is Richard Widmark. The man sitting in the small whitewashed room under the slowly rotating fan is Arnold McGuffey, an American. We're in East Africa. McGuffey might be poised there before a battered desk staring at an ancient typewriter for any number of reasons. He could be a hunter preparing to write a letter home about the kill. He might be a journalist about to write the first of a devastating series of articles on poaching. Or he could be a novelist composing the landmark book on man's attitude when he at last faces death. Mr. McGuffey? Not now, Miss Genera. It will only take a moment. Not now, Miss Genera. Not just right now. The beautiful girl hesitates in the doorway, then impatiently waits as Arnold McGuffey strikes the keys of the battered typewriter. To the Drug Enforcement Administration, Washington, D.C. Attention. General Director Dexter Hamilton. Subject, intersect of opium shipment. Which answers the age-old question, what's Arnold McGuffey doing in East Africa? And that's only the beginning of our story. Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening, brought to you five nights a week by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops. Your hosts, Lorn Green. I'll bring you stories of the Old West and the New. Andy Griffith with a look at the funny side of life. Vincent Price with tales of mystery and suspense. Cicely Tyson with stories about love and hate, and related things. Richard Whitmark. I'll bring you stories of pure adventure. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis' production of The Sears Radio Theater. Our story, The McGuffey Connection, by Ted Sherdeman. Our stars, William Shallert, Peggy Weber, and Ben Wright. Come, spin the wheel of fashion. Discover a fortune of spring separates at Sears Junior Bazaar. Ah, silk blend skirt and pants in dusty pastels. A blend of polyester, rayon, and silk, making them easy care, wrinkle resistant. Top them off with white on white polyester and cotton blouses. Fashion is your fate at Junior Bazaar. Available at most larger Sears retail stores. Convenience and security. The Sears Best Garage Door Opener is just that. Digital control lets you select your own key signal from 512 different transmitting codes. Sears Best Garage Door Opener has a vacation switch that'll lock out stray signals when you're away from home for long periods of time. Of course, when you're home, you won't have to get out of your car to open up that heavy door. Sears Best Garage Door Opener, featuring digital control, gives you convenience and helps you feel secure. Available at most larger Sears retail stores. The word's out and spreading fast about the jeans from Sears Men's Store that grow old beautifully. It's a sure sign they're feeling fine and feeling good. For the denim that keeps going strong a long time. Get them trim cut, regular cut, even get them pre-washed. The jeans that grow old beautifully. Now at most Sears retail stores. What would it cost to replace your car's muffler, including installation? Oh, I'd say about $50. No, wait, $45. Give me around $30. I guess about $40. The Illumini Sears muzzler is only $19.99. That's half of what I guessed. It's hard to believe. On a Cadillac? That's a terrific price. With installation included. Yes. Should have known it. Sears. The muzzler, just $19.99 installed. Clamps if needed, $0.99 cents each extra. Sizes to fit most American-made cars. Prices may vary in Alaska and Hawaii at most Sears Tire and Auto Centers. It's almost as though 
Oh, they've been waiting for us. The stunning Miss Elena, impatiently standing at the open door, while Arnold McGuffey labors at his typewriter. I can no longer wait. This will only take a moment. Can't you see I'm busy? This is to let you know I have not heard from my contact yet, and now doubt I ever Mr. will. Mr. McGuffey, please. I have to get this report off to my boss, Elena. That can wait. There's someone here who wants to study the termites in Kajiado district. And the eyelets are due to emerge from the mounds in a few months. I'm writing about intercepting an opium shipment due to arrive any moment, and she's talking about termites and... What do you call them? Eyelets. Uh. They are the winged male termites. And the person inquiring needs a teacher. And I need a guard at the door to keep you from barging in. Winged male termites of all... Can we supply a teacher? Answer, yes or no? No. Now get out of here. Maybe I'll send him to the International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology in Nairobi. Miss Genera, please, just leave and close the door. I didn't know termites had been around for 250 million years. My word. Please advise how on earth, without my contact, I am to intercept, confiscate, and destroy a shipment of opium before it reaches Marseille in France to be converted into heroin. Your instructions used to be very clear. For instance, when you first gave me my orders back in Washington. And we believe the freighter will first put in here, at Mombasa in Kenya. As you can see by the map, it's in East Africa. Where's the ship coming from? From Rangoon. That's in Burma. I know where it is, Dexter. Why is it putting in at Mombasa? Well, I don't know. The operative in Burma thinks the ship is going through the Red Sea, the Suez Canal, and then on to Marseille. Who's the operative? Well, that's top secret. Uh, your contact will get in touch with you about the freighter's arrival. And what am I to do in the meantime? Well, we've arranged a cover for you. Not like the last time, please. What was that? I was an American bullfighter in Spain. <laughs> oh, that. Well, I no. wound up being gored by a bull, Dexter, in Seville. Yeah, yeah, I remember now. Well, you won't be gored by anything this time unless you bleed when you open a school book. I beg your pardon? Uh, you're to start a school in Kenya. Start a school? Yeah, that's right. Under the auspices of some church. What church? Well, we'll, we'll make one up. Maybe we'll call it the, the Church of Faith. <laughs> What's funny? <laughs> that I should be a churchman running a school. That's better than bullfighting. Not much. And that's my cover, a school? Yeah. I've arranged for the army to supply you with a lot of self-teaching textbooks. Here's your plane ticket to Nairobi. Uh, You'll be met by one of our agents there, Perry North. Does he know about this cockamamie cover? No, no. Bring him up to date and uh, keep in touch with me. Mr. McGuffey? I'm Arnold McGuffey. I'm Perry North, sir. Welcome to Nairobi, sir. <laughs> Thanks, but my name's Arnold McGuffey, not sir. Yes, sir, Mr. McGuffey, sir. Did you have a nice flight? Good enough. <laughs> Why the frown, Perry? You have several cases of school books. I thought we were to work on a drug shipment from Burma. We are. Any word from the contact yet? No, Mr. McGuffey. See, the books are our cover while we're waiting. <laughs> we're going to start a school run by the Church of Faith. Yeah? Wherever we please, Nairobi, Mombasa, wherever. I lean toward Mombasa. It is cooler there because it is on the Indian Ocean. It's also where the opium ship is due to put in. Ah, uh, yes. And the school is to be our cover. That's right. <laughs> Can you imagine a couple of narcotics enforcers posing as churchmen and starting a school? <laughs> You're not laughing. I have a master's degree in education. It was once my dream to teach illiterates how to read and write. How come you ended up a narc? Ah, how come people generally end up doing something they were never trained for? <laughs> Good question. The point is, I have to clear the way to let the Church of Faith start a school. I can help you with the authorities. Good. Then to get in touch with the contact so we can act when that opium shows up. What now, Perry? Oh, just thinking, sir. Uh, maybe I'll finally get a chance to use my flashcards after all. What are you talking about? The school, Mr. McGuffey. The school. <laughs> Perry North was invaluable. 
Both in clearing our cover with the authorities and in organizing the school, we took a building near the waterfront in Mombasa. From my office on the second floor, I had a fine view of Kilindini, the spacious harbor. I was observing various ships through binoculars one day when Perry North knocked politely at the door. Come in. You heard yet, Mr. McGuffey, sir? From the contact? Not a word. <laughs> the names they give some of these ships. Humperdink Rosnovic. And it's a cruise ship to boot. <laughs> Imagine saying, I'm sailing on the Humperdink Rosnovic. <laughs> oh, <laughs> why I'm here. Uh, we need to teach the subjects the books don't cover, like riveting, welding, Kenyan economy, uh, accounting. We've got textbooks on accounting. Uh, yes, but they are in dollars and we are in Kenya. We use pounds here. Ah, I see what you mean. Well, do what you want about it. It's up to you to run the school. I think we should divide the school into three parts. Three parts? I will act as dean of the primary school, teaching illiterates to read, write, and do simple sums. Then we need a dean of the technical school and a dean for advanced education. What is advanced education? Anything that doesn't fit into the other two schools. Like typing. <laughs> so line up your deans. I have, but there's one problem. The dean of the technical school also wants to be a student in the primary school. Wait, wait. Let me understand this, Perry. The dean of the technical school can't read or write? No, Mr. McGuffey. But he's a genius at fixing motors, air conditioners, and so on. His name is Logan Peebles. A Kenyan? No. White, Englishman. He's employed at Cannot Go Taxis. Oh. And the dean of what you call advanced education? She is Indian. She? Her name is Olena Janeira. She's employed by the High Commissioner. How come you picked a woman? Well, I heard her on The Voice of Kenya one night being interviewed, and she said she was very interested in doing something for our country. So I contacted the radio station, found her, explained the school, and uh, she's very pretty, too. Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> That's why she's Dean, because she's pretty. Uh, uh, because she's bright. <laughs> She also works part-time as a Red Cross volunteer at the Catherine B.B. Hospital. Well, Perry, it's up to you. Uh, when do classes start? Uh, next week, I hope. Would you like to meet them? Meet who? It's the dean. They're waiting outside. <laughs> okay. Would you like to come in now? Thank uh, you. Uh, Mr. McGuffey, uh, this is Miss Olena Janera and Mr. Logan Peeble. How do you uh, do? How do, you do? How do you? Nice to meet you. Uh, I have to get back to the hacks. Uh, Mr. North explained you were employed by a taxi company. For the time being. And you'll get instructors and teach yourself? So long as he can teach me reading and writing. Yeah, I can teach you, Mr. Peoples. Um, well, do, do I have to join your church? North here said you were operating this here school under something called the uh, Church of Faith. Oh, well, we, we are, but you don't have to join it. Nobody does. Uh, unless he wants to. Oh, I don't want to. And I cannot. I am Hindu. And a very pretty one. So I have been told, Mr. McGuffey, numerous times. Well, uh, is this it? Uh, can I go back to my job now? Absolutely. Just wanted you to meet Mr. McGuffey, head of the operation. Oh, we'll see you next week, then. So long. Goodbye. A few questions, Mr. McGuffey. I'll try to answer them, Miss... Uh... Uh, Genera. Olena Genera. Mm -hmm. I can teach shorthand and typing in Swahili, Arabic, or English. Which do you prefer? Well, uh, take it up with Perry here. I mean, whatever you decide is okay with and me. And I, I had some thoughts on the technical training, things Mr. Peebles cannot handle. Oh, well, what thoughts? Uh, refer students who want such things as mechanical drawing, for instance, to the Mombasa Technical Institute. That's an excellent idea, Olena. Miss Genera, if you please. Uh, Miss Genera. Good idea, eh, Mr. McGuffey, sir? Oh, splendid, Mr. North. Mr. McGuffey, what are the binoculars on your desk for? Well, I, uh, I like to look at the ships coming and going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bon voyage, Mr. McGuffey. Mr. North? See you next week? Of course. Goodbye. I'll see you back to your office, Miss Janera. I have a moped, so it is not necessary, Mr. North. You, you didn't tell her the real reason I was here, Perry. Oh, of course not, Mr. McGuffey. Well, then why the crack about the binoculars? Oh, maybe she was just curious. <sighs> She's certainly pretty. I wish you luck. <laughs> The 
school, Dexter, seem to be doing a thriving business thanks to the efforts of Perry North, Logan Peebles, and especially Olena Gennaro. The three deans and I met each night to discuss the progress of the students, but I listened with only half an ear because I remained anxious about intercepting that opium shipment. Spent most of my time looking at the ships as they came into Killandini Harbor. I also kept watch on the seagoing dows in the old harbor of Mombasa for my daily walks to the bottom of Nkrumah Road. It wasn't until Perry North asked me to have a look at his class in illiteracy that I even began to take an interest in the school. Now, class, pick up your pencils. I will show you a drawing, a picture of an object. Then turn over the card, and you will see the letters that spell the object's name. You are then to write the letters after I turn the card face down on this table. Clear? Buona, teacher? Yes, Troika. Are we to write in English or Swahili? Either one, though I recommend you write both. The cards are printed in both languages, like this. English, and below it, Swahili. Clear? Nadio, Buona, teacher. Okay. Now, here is a picture of a lion. Does everyone see it? Now, I turn it over and you see the letters. The first is in English, L-I-O-N. Beneath it is Swahili, S-I-M-B-A. Okay, now write it. To look the height of fashion wherever I go requires many coats. But for home, I need only one coat fashion surrounding me. Sears Best Easy Living Interior Paint. One coat of easy living on the walls and every room looks stunning. While I entertain or just relax. Choose from 24 decorator colors in easy living flat latex and semi-gloss. Plus bright white ceiling paint for your home. Because with Sears Easy Living Paint, all you need is one coat. When used as directed at most Sears retail stores. When my brother was my age, being in style meant wearing old jeans and about a pound of dirt. But today, us guys are more sophisticated in our style. And that's why Sears has Style Works. A guy can pick up on the latest styles in jeans, tops, sweaters, and dress your clothes like vested suits. I can depend on the Style Works shop at Sears for just about everything to keep me looking great. And the prices? Pretty reasonable. My folks like that. Style Works. Today, style's all in one place. At most larger Sears retail stores. Can't believe you owe the IRS that much. Well, when things just don't add up, you can count on a Sears desk calculator to help you. Add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Then read the figures two different ways. 12-digit lighted display and tape printout for your records. There's a two-memory system that helps ease multi-step problems, plus its many extras make it a great time saver. Now at most Sears retail stores. Sears two-memory desk calculator. Cut $25, just $99.99 through March 10th. Prices and dates may vary in Alaska and Hawaii. What's the best way to save on new clothes? Sew them. Start by saving $40 on a Kenmore sewing machine at Sears with a convertible free arm for narrow sleeves, cuffs, and legs, a built-in button holder, even six stretch stitches. This free arm Kenmore, just $199.95 and save $30 on a wood veneer sewing cabinet. Sale ends March 31st. Prices and dates may vary in Alaska and Hawaii. Available at most Sears retail stores. Kenmore. Solid as Sears. Though the school was only his cover for the opium shipment he was in Mombasa to stop, Arnold McGuffey's interest grew after he visited one of Logan Peebles' classes and heard the Dean of Technical Education say, We're going to keep on studying carburetors till you learn what they're for, what they do, and how to fix them. Now, which one of you remembers how many different kinds there are? Uh, you there with your hand up. Uh, three types are used in internal combustion engines, surface, wick, and jet. Correct. Now, what's this here thing here? That's a metering pin, Buana people. He asked me, not you. Why did you not answer him then? But, oh, hold, hold, hold it, hold it, hold it, break, break it up! Now, if that happens again, I'm throwing you two out of this class. Is that clear? Dio, Buana. Yes, Buana. I have to go to my own schooling now, so my assistant will take over. Uh, you, okay? I need old Buana, peoples. Now, if anybody gets out of line again, you come tell me, clear? Yes, Buana, peoples. Oh, uh, 
Hello, Mr. McGuffey. I just thought I'd look in on your class for a while, Logan. Oh, sorry about that rumpus. We don't have them as a rule. Sorry you can't stay. I have to learn to read and write. I know. It was part of our deal, remember? I know, and it's all right. Uh, see you and the other two deans after school's out. Yep. Logan Peebles was the dean of technical education, although he was also one of Perry North's students. Perry, the dean of primary education, had the largest class, nearly 50 adults he was teaching to read and write. The pretty Indian girl, Olena Genera, who was also the dean of advanced education, taught shorthand and typing to a small group of Kenyans, Asiatics, and Europeans. What do we give the students when they complete a course? Well, I, uh, <laughs> I hadn't thought about it. Don't you think you should? Well, we can't give them jobs. Of course not. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe a certificate of some kind that states each student has completed whatever course he took. They've worked hard, studied as if their lives depended on it. They should have real diplomas, a real graduation exercise. Do you realize these people have never graduated from anything? Where would I get diplomas? The same place you get those silly certificates you were talking about. I don't even remember what a diploma looks like. I have several. Or you can go to any doctor's office. Well, bring one of yours in. Oh, excuse me. Hello? Uh, Church of Faith? Oh, yes. Uh, this is the Church of Faith. McGuffey? McGuffey speaking. This is Dexter Hamilton. Oh, yeah. Hello. Uh, excuse me, please. If that means for me to get out, it is not necessary. What does that mean? Uh, what do you mean, what does that mean? I wasn't talking to you. Well? It is not necessary for me to leave. What does that mean? That's the second time you said that. I wasn't talking to you. And the second time for that, too. What do you want, Dexter? I have the contact for you. The name is Tawawa. You got a pencil? You got a pencil? Here. The name is Tawawa in Mozambique. Got it. This is private information. Huh, private is he to get in touch with me or I with him? And where? No, no, Tawawa will get in touch with you. Uh, is there something wrong? Yeah, I need diplomas. Diplomas? For the school. Now, now, don't forget what you're there for. I won't, but I still need diplomas. Look, will you forget about the diplomas and let me know as soon as Tawawa gets in touch with you that opium must be stopped before it reaches Marseille and's turned into heroin. Uh, look, the, the line is noisy again. I'm going to hang up now. Okay. Look, Miss Genera, when this phone rings and I ask you to excuse me, it means you're to let me have my privacy. Under normal circumstances, I would let you. But this is silly. What do you mean, silly? I was talking to my boss. The director of the Drug Enforcement Administration. The direct... How did you know that? Mr. McGuffey, what do you think we Kenyans are? A bunch of children? Go on. You are like many foreigners who think of Kenya as a nation of illiterate blacks and a land of big game for you to hunt so you can hang animals' heads on your walls. We all speak Swahili, but most of us also speak English. How many in your country are fluent in more than one language? What's that got to do with it? The Church of Faith, it makes us laugh. We have Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Hindus, Muslims, and the mosques, temples, and churches to prove it. The Kenyan government was delighted to let you start a school, especially glad of Perry North's efforts. But how did you know I was speaking to the... The plans for that shipment of opium have been known for months. Kenyan authorities are on the lookout for it 24 hours a day, and not only in Mombasa, but up and down the coast and in Nairobi in case the smugglers try to send it in by air. But it's going to... <sighs> Never mind. I know. It is destined for Marseille to be turned into heroin. Mr. McGuffey, we've known about it all along. But the school is more important. Hmm. Maybe a mapping outfit. Seems to me I saw one in Zanzibar Road. What are you talking about? The diplomas. Maybe a mapping outfit can make them up. Good idea. Listen, do you know the name of my contact, too? No, but the Kenyan authorities probably do. <clears throat> we, uh, we keep this a secret between us about the opium shipment. It is all right with me. The problem uh, is, 
How does one keep a secret when hundreds already know about it? Good question. Well, <clears throat> I think I'll go call on that mapping outfit. And I will go to the hospital. It is my Red Cross day. <laughs> I suppose Olena Genera is telling me that she and lots of others knew of the opium shipment should have upset me, but it didn't. Maybe because the school had become important to me. I was now determined to give the students a graduation exercise they'd never forget. However, I spoke to Perry North in my office about Olena's knowledge of the opium shipment. He wasn't surprised. As I said, Miss Genera is a very bright girl. Did you know the Kenyan authorities were onto this, too? Oh, yes, Mr. McGuffey. Why didn't you tell me? You're supposed to be my assistant on this thing. Well, I knew you'd find out in time anyway. Excuse me, Perry. Oh, don't leave. Hello, Church of Faith here. Mr. McGuffey. McGuffey speaking. This is Mr. Wawa. Miss? You're a girl? I was the last time I looked. A girl? I'm a woman, Mr. McGuffey. But, but you're supposed to be my... Are you in Mozambique? I am. And I'm your contact. The opium shipment will put in at Djibouti, not Mombasa. Perry, has Dexter lost his mind using a girl to contact me? I don't know, Mr. McGuffey. Did you get that, Mr. McGuffey? McGuffey? Get what? I said the opium shipment will put in at Djibouti. Instead of Mombasa. Yes, yes, Djibouti instead of Mombasa. The change was necessitated by the activity of the Kenyans. Does Hamilton Dexter know you're a girl? She knows I'm a woman, yes. And he hired you anyway? Mr. Dexter has used my services before, Mr. McGuffey. Maybe, but, but, but this could be dangerous. And, and you're a girl. I am a woman, and I will contact you when I have a date for when the ship from Rangoon puts in. At that time, we can arrange a meeting in Djibouti. Goodbye, Mr. Mogufi. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I wanted to talk to you. She hung up. Well, perhaps she said all that was necessary. I can't believe it. A girl contact. I mean, I've heard of women's lib, but this is ridiculous. Why are you so surprised, Mr. McGuffey? I'm supposed to sneak aboard some unknown ship or freighter or whatever they're using, get several kilos of opium and destroy it so it can't wind up on the U.S. streets as heroin, and, and she talks about going with me. What are you doing? Oh, looking at the diploma you got from the mapping firm. Oh, uh, you know, I, I don't think it should have that heading, do you? Olena said the Church of Faith was a laugh. Yeah, she was right. It shouldn't read School of the Church of Faith. Mm. Uh, maybe something like University of the Tropics? Mm. Hey, how about calling it the Equatorial University? Ah, I like that, Mr. McGuffey. Equatorial University. And I want these students to have a graduation exercise that's meaningful to them, Perry. A valedictorian, a blessing by a man of cloth, a guest speaker. Uh, do you think you could get the president? I can try. The way his eyes lighted up when I told him we were going to teach people to read and write, I can try, Mr. McGuffey. And each dean will hand out the diplomas. Hey, we're going to need something to wrap them in. Ah, uh, mine was tied with blue ribbon. Mm hmm And how about the soccer stadium as a place to hold it? Oh, just fine. Uh, when does the opium arrive in Djibouti? I don't know. Tawawa doesn't know. Tawawa. A woman. A female contact for a drug shipment. Uh, wait a minute. Rather than climb the walls, I'm going to order the diplomas and try to get a churchman to give the blessing. <laughs> I decided to go to the Anglican Cathedral on Nkrumah Road and tell my story to the archbishop there. A few days later, he gathered some five religious leaders together, and I explained what I wanted. To my amazement, they all wanted to give the blessing, claiming that the students shouldn't be restricted to just one faith. What do you think, Mr. McGuffey? But we only have room and time for one blessing, Your Grace. Ah. Uh, then it's up to us to decide who gets the job? Well, yes, sir, but only one can do it. I see. Uh, does each of you gentlemen have a shilling? Uh, yes. 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 Mm, fine, then we shall toss for it. Heads will be the first winners. Very well, gentlemen. Toss. Ah, you have tails, so you are out. 
And you? And you? Oh. Hmm. That leaves me and the father here. <laughs> Very well, father. Toss. Tails, you lose. Hence, I win. Oh. Please remember, gentlemen, Mr. McGuffey came to me first. <laughs> I could have just taken this assignment, but I did not. I called you all together here. It was resolved, fair and square. The idea of five churchmen gambling to see which was to deliver the blessing on graduation day was a wondrous thing to me. And to Perry North, Elena Genera, and Logan Peebles when I told the three deans of the school about it. <laughs> they actually tossed shillings to see who got it. They did. <laughs> and the archbishop won. So we'll have an Episcopal blessing. At least I'll understand it. So will the students, Logan. The diplomas turned out fine, Mr. McGuffey. Now, each dean is to sign them for his or her students. We understand. What, what about the blue ribbon to tie them with? The Red Cross had only yarn at the hospital, so I got some ribbon from the Kenya Rayon Mills on Chongomwi. Twenty yards of it. Yay, white. Good. Uh, how'd you make out getting a guest speaker, Perry? The president will try to make it, but if he's held up in Nairobi, Mr. McGuffey... He'll send the vice president. Good. Now, all we need to get is a place to hold the graduation and a valedictorian. I think I've got one for you, Mr. McGuffey. Who? He read his speech to me and, uh, well, it's important. Who is it? Stryker. The big Kenyan who broke up the dice game. But he's illiterate, isn't he? Not anymore, Mr. McGuffey. And the title of his speech, which he wrote himself, is What Education Means to Me. Sears Radio Theater will return after this message from your local station. Here's a tip from your Better Business Bureau. Are you looking for a nursing home? Well, here are a few tips. Start by getting a list of the licensed facilities in your area from your local health department. Find out whether they are certified to receive Medicare and Medicaid payments. Also, talk to your friends and talk to your neighbors who've placed a family member in a home. You see, it's important to visit a nursing home to check the facilities and the services. For example, food handling, patient care, in-service staff training, housekeeping, and patient activities. Now, before you sign an admission agreement... You read it carefully, including the fine print, and ask a lot of questions about what's included in the price. A number of nursing homes charge extra for such items as wheelchairs, air mattresses, and personal laundry. A tip from your Better Business Bureau. What if you went off to college and found that you were different from everyone else, and everything was designed for them, not for you? Suppose you went to the library and all the books you needed were in Braille and you were the only one who couldn't read. You'd feel left out, wouldn't you? And what if you went to class and found that there were no chairs because all the other students rolled in with their own wheelchairs? Suppose one of your professors gave his lectures talking with his hands, only his hands, and everyone understood sign language except you. You'd think it wasn't fair. Well... That's how handicapped people feel now when they go to college and find extra handicaps. But things are changing, and we have free information that can help. Write Closer Look, Box 1492, Washington, D.C., 20013. A public service message on behalf of the United States Office of Education. <laughs> Widmark again, and here's the concluding act of the McGuffey Connection. Equatorial University. Equatorial University? I was calling the Church of Faith. Who is this? Who is this? Arnold McGuffey. Is this Miss Tawawa from Mozambique? It is, Mr. McGuffey. Now listen carefully. I am not a male chauvinist pig, but I won't stand still when they send a woman to do a man's work. Correction, you are a male chauvinist pig, and it's not a man's work. It's anybody's work. I just happen to be a woman. That's not my fault, and I will I not... I will meet you in Djibouti the morning of the 10th of next month. The ship is due at the port in the evening. Have you heard what I said, Mr... 
I'm Andy Fisher, WNEW News. At seven minutes past ten, time for the Sears Radio Theater. That's the theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight, a story of the West with Lorne Green as your host. Here's a preview. You and I share a common love, Mr. Nugent, this country. You're the only man who can help me do what I came here to do. What are you here for, then? To stand on the summit of Long's Peak. The Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. If trivia turns you on, turn on William B. Williams and Bill St. James every weekday when they may give you a chance to win WNEW cash for the answers to trivia questions from any one of four categories, and you pick the category. To be eligible to play, send your name, address, phone number, including your business number if you work between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., and your favorite category, pop luck, sports, entertainment, or recent world history, to WNEW right away. Now, if William B. or Bill call you, you'll win $10 for a trivia quickie answer or $100 for a Jim Lowe trivia toffee. The question may be trivial, but the cash is not. And by the way, whether you answer your question correctly or not, you're eligible just for playing to win an AM-FM stereo system in a weekly drawing. Better get those cards in right away to Trivia, WNEW, 565 Fifth Avenue, New York, 10017. I wonder what the longest-running play on Broadway was, after all. And Break the Bank, wasn't that Burt Parks? And who was the last hitter to hit 400? I did not either. You're crazy. Oh, man, don't give me that. Hey, who's that guy over there with the dog? Oh, that's Mr. Kessler. Uh, Mr. Kessler! Hello, gentlemen. Bugsley, say hello. (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Kessler had a heart attack last Christmas. Says that's why he's out with Pugsley every night. What for? He's got exercise. Build his heart back up. How do you know all that? My mom is a volunteer for the Heart Association. She told me. He doesn't look sick to me at all. People are successfully recovering from heart attacks in far greater numbers today than ever before. The American Heart Association has fought long and hard against heart disease, funding important heart research, developing emergency rescue procedures, and establishing guidelines for the rehabilitation of heart attack victims. But the fight is far from over. Supporting the American Heart Association is like a long-term investment in your future. We're fighting for your life. This is Lorne Green. It's autumn, 1873. We are in the Colorado Rockies. A rider on horseback approaches along the rough trail, sitting expertly astride a Mexican saddle and wearing an incongruous, tropical weight Hawaiian riding costume. It is Miss Isabella Bird, the English gentlewoman whose exploits as a world traveler were recently the subject of an article in Greeley's Tribune. Invalided for much of her life by a spinal disease, Isabella left her native England a year ago to embark on a sea voyage for her health. Along the way, she cheerfully weathered a hurricane, then spent six months in the Hawaiian Islands, most of the time in the saddle, where her health continued to improve as she camped out of doors in a drenching rain and roaring typhoon on the rim of an active volcano. Now, Isabella has ridden here to the Colorado Rockies of the far west to continue her astonishing cure with an attempt to climb America's Matterhorn, the 14,700-foot summit of Long's Peak. She rides leisurely, overcome by her first glimpse of this wild, rocky mountain country with its loveliness to bewilder and grandeur to awe. shot rings through the clear mountain air. Isabella feels the bullet whiz past her ear and looks up to see a man on horseback on the trail above. Such a man as she has never seen. Shaggy-haired, thick-mustached, one side of his face cruelly scarred with a patch over the eye, a knife at his belt, a rifle across his saddle, and a pistol in his hand. (laughs) He rears his horse against the sky, rents the air with the unbridled cry of a savage, and thunders down the craggy slope toward his enemy. The Englishwoman spurs her horse, wheels it sharply off the trail, and down the perilous slope below. The chase 
classic ingredient of any worthwhile adventure of the West has begun. And so has our story, which is in most respects a true one. Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis' production of The Sears Radio Theater. Our story, The Lady and the Outlaw, by Shirley Gordon. Our stars, Antoinette Bauer and Len Berman. The Sears Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company, where value is your byword. Sears, where America shops. Hurry, hurry, step right up to most Sears retail stores for the Sears National Hardware Week sale. Take aim for special savings on these items. Save $40 on a fully automatic garage door opener. Save $10 to $15 on several handy and versatile bathroom storage cabinets. Get $40 off a 14-inch lightweight chainsaw with its own carrying case. Take home big savings, real straight shooting at the Sears National Hardware Week sale. Hurry, hurry. Prices may vary in Alaska and Hawaii. Nearly everyone at our party mentioned our new Sears Dream Supreme carpeting. Did anyone say anything about my rutabaga dip? Marvin said Dream Supreme looks so thick and luxurious. He loved its velvety soft plush pile. What about my rutabaga dip? Eloise adored the color. Of my rutabaga dip? I told her that avocado lime is just one of Dream Supreme's 20 lustrous colors, and when Doris heard that Dream Supreme is so reasonably priced and treated with Scotchgard brand fabric protector... Okay, what about my tuna fish upside down cake? Dream Supreme carpeting in most larger Sears retail stores. The word's out and spreading fast about the jeans from Sears Men's Store that grow old beautifully. It's a sure sign they're fitting fine and feeling good. For the denim that keeps going strong a long time. Get them trim cut, regular cut, even get them pre-washed. The jeans that grow old beautifully. Now at most Sears retail stores. One of Miss Isabella Bird's gifts to the future was her journal. Contrary to its reputation, I had found this wild country a place where ordinary crime hardly existed. Doors were never locked, property was safe, and a woman might ride anywhere alone. And so I hardly anticipated being pursued down the side of a mountain. Please, let me in. What's after you, woman? A grizzly? No, put down your gun. Don't fire. It isn't an animal, it's a man. I can see for myself now that it's more an animal than a man, I'd say. Come inside, miss. The sight alone of that one is enough to drive your sanity from you. It was Mount Jim up there, wasn't it, Pa? Was he coming to get us, Pa? Was he? Now, those are your mother's wild stories, not mine. I have a good deal worse to tell of that varmint. But there are no tales for the ears of babes. Catherine, we've a guest. I see that, Mr. Evans. Rest yourself, love. I'll fix you a cup of good, strong tea. Thank you. Wherever is it that you've uh, ridden from, ma'am? Far. Quite far. You're English? Yes. My name is Isabella Bird. Griff Evans here. My wife, Catherine. Our sons, Richard and Thomas. I must say I'm happy to have found you. Whatever is it that's brought a lady such as yourself riding alone and into this wild country? Let the poor woman rest from your questions, Mr. Evans. Savor your tea, Miss Bird. And Thomas, you and Richard, go see to our visitor's horse. I hope that old outlaw don't carry us off and eat us. He is an outlaw, then, this mountain, Jim. I thought so. He had the word desperado written all over him. In blood, ma'am. He's renowned in these parts. Rocky Mountain Jim Nugent. A man to stay clear of, Miss Bird. I'm not easily intimidated by untamed man any more than untamed country. 
Mr. Nugent merely took me by surprise. Well, all the same, I suggest you stay on your guard as long as you're in these parts. And that you give thought to not remaining here long. Oh, not that you're not welcome. My husband doesn't mean that. I only meant the winter snows will be coming soon. I'll be taking my own wife and children down to Denver before the month is out. Only the men stay on here then. I shall be staying until I've done what I came to do. Which is what, ma'am? To climb to the summit of Long's Peak. Good Lord, woman, that's a blamed foolhardy notion. My husband puts the truth too bluntly, Miss Bird. But it's true that only one other, a man, has ever made that terrible climb. And the bloody fool like to never got back down alive. Whatever put that idea into your head, miss? Long months of being a prisoner in my bed, Mr. Evans. Oh, you were an invalid, Miss Bird? And still would be if I hadn't had the foolhardy notion of getting up one day. Well, I'll not encourage you in your plan, but while you're here, you're welcome to the use of the little cabin on our land, if you like. You have a cabin I can use. Oh, how perfect. I'm afraid you'll find it far from perfect. I have just dropped into the very place I have been seeking. This country offers everything that is rapturous and delightful to me. Grandeur, cheerfulness, enjoyment, novelty, freedom, and health in every breath of air. I have a log cabin raised on six posts, all to myself, with a small lake close to it and a skunk's lair underneath it. Miss Bird? It's me, ma'am, Griff Evans. Yes, Mr. Evans. I was just thinking you'd like to be out enjoying the sunrise, ma'am. Oh, yes, it's beautiful. Thank you for rousing me. As a matter of fact, I was also thinking, uh, that is, having seen the way you handle a horse... Well, the thing is, miss, I could do with a hand to help me round up the cattle. Mr. Evans, you couldn't think of anything that would please me more. The only way to enjoy a sunrise is riding out to meet it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. it with the quaintness and charm of Sears Jenny Lynn's crib dresser and chest. Your baby will be secure in our old-fashioned crib built with high sides and a safety drop side latch. And each handsome maple color piece comes in a non-toxic finish. Sears Jenny Lynn dresser and chest is furniture that will adapt gracefully as baby grows older too. So visit us soon because Sears has baby buys bundled up. Available at most Sears retail stores. What's the best way to save on new clothes? Sew them. Start by saving $40 on a Kenmore sewing machine at Sears with a convertible free arm for narrow sleeves, cuffs, and legs, a built-in button holder, even six stretch stitches. This free arm Kenmore, just $199.95 and save $30 on a wood veneer sewing cabinet. Sale ends March 31st. Prices and dates may vary in Alaska and Hawaii. Available at most Sears retail stores. Kenmore. Solid as Sears. Hurry, hurry, step right up to most Sears retail stores for the Sears National Hardware Week sale. Save $3 a gallon on easy living flat semi-gloss and ceiling paint. Now only $9.99 a gallon. Save $100 on a 10-inch radial arm saw with leg set. Just $279.95. Save $30 or $40 on two crystal glass chandeliers. Now $59.99 and $79.99. Take home big savings. It's Sears National Hardware Week sale. Prices may vary in Alaska and Hawaii. I tell you, Catherine, Miss B here is as good as a man on the range and a blame sight better than some I've had. <laughs> I learned to sit a horse when I was a small child, riding with my father around his parish. I was sickly even then, but my father wisely prescribed the out of doors. Being finally confined indoors to a bed must have been terrible for you. Lying straight and lifeless as a board, with my head held rigid in a steel net to relieve the pressure from my spine. But it was my spirit that was dying. It's hard for me even to imagine. Seems as though I've just never had the time to be sick at all. Nor will I ever again. 
All those doctors who used to hover around my bedside trying to force a cup of broth down my throat. Oh, they should see me now. Putting away a ranch hands portion without a qualm. <laughs> Eat hearty, Miss B. You've earned it. And a day of rest as well. Tomorrow's Sunday and we'll let the cattle be. Well, then tomorrow I shall ride purely for pleasure. Well, I caution you again not to go riding off alone in this country. I've never feared to ride alone anywhere, Mr. Evans. Tomorrow I shall seek some wild, lonely place where I may offer my Sunday worship. Nature's Cathedral is the only church that suits my fancy. Then I say you'd better tote a gun to church. Mr. Evans, I may work the range like a man, but I have an aversion to masculine women. A gun which I've no need of and wouldn't know what to do with shall never become part of my attire. Very well, Miss B. Suit yourself if you will. But keep in mind, Mountain Jim is just as accustomed to having his way as it appears you are to having yours. The dense, ancient, silent forest is awe-inspiring to me. Surely the Most High dwelleth here, in a temple not made with hands, and with no distracting back view of ladies' hairstyles and bonnets. Who's there? Mr. Nugent? You can't frighten me a second time, Mr. Nugent. for your ready gun, Mr. Nugent. Although I am sorry you had to kill him. Well, let's see. I just settled an old score. Your eye. The wounds on your face. It was a grizzly. Who are you? The name is Isabella Bird. What are you doing here? Enjoying your country, Mr. Nugent. This is my country. Mine and his, the grizzly. He's beautiful. Well, all things are. Yes, Mr. Nugent. Except. Tell me, Miss Burden. My face, does it repel you? I never look at faces, Mr. Nugent. I look behind them. Uh, what do you see behind this one? What do you think you see? A man who cares and kills. And cares still. If you're squeamish, better move on. I'm going to skin me a bear. I don't blame you. It's a handsome pelt. Tell me, Mr. Nugent, is it your custom always to welcome a stranger to your country in the manner you received me? Didn't know you were a woman. I can see well enough now that you are. Good day, Mr. Nugent. You have my gratitude for my life. So you see, Mr. Evans, I now owe my life to that outlaw you told me to fear. Oh, thank God he was there this time. Oh, I'm not saying Jim Nugent doesn't sometimes show a better side to his nature. His face is a reflection of the man right enough. One side handsome as a god, the other the depiction of evil itself. It must have been a terrible thing, his battle with the grizzly that did that. Don't waste your sympathy. There are plenty to swear to the pain Mountain Jim has inflicted on others, equal to what that grizzly gave him. I won't doubt the word of what you say. Nevertheless, I can only judge a man as I find him. Miss B, I've no right to be telling you what you should or shouldn't do. I've learned that no one has that right for another. But I'd be neglecting my duty if I didn't urge you to again leave here with Catherine and the boys when I take them down to Denver tomorrow. I told you, Mr. Evans, I shan't leave till I've done what I set my heart on. Good heavens, woman, winter's coming on. You can't still be thinking of scaling Long's Peak. There is nothing, nor anyone, that could deter me with that magnificent crest in my sight. Then I fear for your life. Don't you see? At this moment, the mountain is my life. Oh, Isabella, I beg you all, so please be careful. Look, I'm grateful to both of you for your concern, but you must understand... I've spent too much of my life being careful, as I was told, and I found it slow death. Humor me, my dear friends. Let me climb my mountain. 
But to undertake such a climb, a woman alone... Not alone. I shall seek someone to accompany me. Well, that's some relief, at least. Though I can't imagine who it'll be. There is only one it can be. Jim Nugent? Good God, woman, you are mad. Challenging hell with the devil himself at your side. If it is hell I'm challenging, as you say, Mr. Evans, then I could have no better companion than the devil himself. <laughs> Radio Theater will return after this message from your local station. What if you went off to college and found that you were different from everyone else and everything was designed for them, not for you? Suppose you went to the library and all the books you needed were in Braille and you were the only one who couldn't read. You'd feel left out, wouldn't you? And what if you went to class and found that there were no chairs because all the other students rolled in with their own wheelchairs? Suppose one of your professors gave his lectures talking with his hands, only his hands, and everyone understood sign language except you. You'd think it wasn't fair. Well, that's how handicapped people feel now when they go to college and find extra handicaps. But things are changing, and we have free information that can help. Write Closer Look, Box 1492, Washington, D.C., 20013. A public service message on behalf of the United States Office of Education. This is Bucky Dent of the New York Yankees. I'm proud to be a member of a great team, and I'm equally proud of my family, Stormy, my wife, and our two children. They're both healthy, normal kids. But you know, there are some children in this world, in your neighborhood, who are not so lucky. They were born with handicaps, injured in accidents, or disabled by illness. All they want is an equal chance with other children to work, to play, to learn, and to feel they will have a place in the world when they grow up. The Easter Seal Society is preparing both children and adults for tomorrow, rehabilitating them, giving them a chance to become self-respecting citizens. That's why I support the work of Easter Seals. As a member of the National Easter Seals Sports Council, we hope you support your local Easter Seals program. It's a great way to help handicapped people. If a single word could describe Miss Isabella Bird, it would be dauntless. Miss Bird once she set a goal for herself, was unstoppable. Here's how she described her first sight of Jim Nugent's cabin. It was a rude black log cabin with smoke coming out of the window and out of the mud roof, covered with lynx, beaver, and other furs laid out to dry. Beaver paws were pinned out on the logs, a part of the carcass of a deer hung on one side of the cabin, and a skinned beaver lay in front of the door. It looked like the den of a wild beast. Shut up, Mr. Nugent? It's you. I've come to ask something of you, Mr. Nugent. Uh, come inside if you want, though it's not fixed up for a lady. Thank you. And that old log does for a chair. It's quite comfortable. I can offer you a drink of fresh mountain water. I am thirsty from my ride. Thank you. Don't suppose whiskey strikes your fancy? I've seen it to be only a curse, Mr. Nugent. <sighs> it's been my curse right enough. You haven't come to ask me to give it up, have you? I doubt that whiskey would mix well with what I've come to ask of you. Can't imagine what business you and I could have together. You and I share a common love, Mr. Nugent, this country. You're the only man who can help me do what I came here to do. Now, what are you here for, then? To stand on the summit of Long's Peak. Oh, you're no ordinary woman, I knew that. Will you accompany me, Mr. Nugent? <laughs> so that's all you wanted me, to risk my life long with your own. 
I thought it might be an endeavor that would appeal to you. A mountain is no ordinary match for a man. Or a woman. And uh, when are you planning this undertaking, Miss Byrne? At once. I think it's imperative not to delay the attempt any longer. <laughs> it's imperative, all right. Will you do it, then? Well, I don't suppose I got anything better to do. Thank you, Mr. Nugent. Mm, doubt there'd be any stopping you. By sunlight or moonlight, the splintered grey crest of Long's Peak unfailingly arrests the eyes. From it come all storms of snow and wind, and the forked lightning plays round its head like a glory. It is one of the loveliest of mountains. The ride was a series of glories and surprises, of park and glade, of lake and stream, of mountains on mountains. From the dry, buff grass of the park, we turned up a steep, pine-clothed hill and down to a small valley whose deepest hollow contained the Lake of the Lilies. From this, we rode upwards through the purple gloom of great pine forests. The pines grew smaller and more sparse as we passed the timber line. But yet a little higher, a slope of mountain meadow dipped towards a bright stream trickling under ice and icicles through a grove of the beautiful silver spruce. We'll camp here for the night. A group of small silver spruces away from the fire was my sleeping place, but I could not sleep. I was anxious about the ascent, for gusts of ominous sound swept through the pines at intervals. Wild animals howled, and it was strange to see the notorious desperado stretched out against the firelight, singing a mournful song to his dog Ring. Hang me, oh hang me, until I'm dead and gone. I don't mind you hanging me, it's laying in the grave so long. And then, sleeping as quietly as innocence sleeps. There's thin ice ahead. You better ride my horse. She's lighter. I'll lead on foot. Come on, Ring. It's all right. She'll hold for a while. She'll hold... At last, arriving at the notch, a gate of rock, we found ourselves absolutely on the knife-like backbone of Long's Peak, only a few feet wide and covered with colossal boulders. Two thousand feet of solid rock towered above us. Four thousand feet of broken rock shelved precipitously below. The climb! It begins! Here, tie the other end of this rope securely around your waist. I'm starting up. At last, with throbbing hearts and panting lungs, we reached the top of the gorge, squeezed ourselves through two gigantic rocks that brought us by an abrupt turn to a narrow shelf, rugged, uneven, and so overhung by the cliffs above that it was necessary to crouch to pass it at all. Below the most tremendous precipice I've ever seen descended in one unbroken fall. One slip, and a breathing, thinking human being would lie 3,000 feet below, a shapeless, bloody heap. As we crept from the ledge round a horn of rock, I beheld what made me perfectly sick and dizzy to look at. The terminal peak itself. A smooth wall of pink granite, as nearly perpendicular as anything could be yet still be possible to climb. Scaling, not climbing, was the correct term for this last ascent. It took one hour to accomplish 500 feet, with the only footholds, narrow cracks or minute projections on the granite, all the while tortured with thirst and gasping for breath. But at last, the peak was won. At last, to stand upon the storm pent crown of this lonely sentinel of the rocky range, uplifted above love and hate and storms of passion, calm amidst the eternal silences. I am 
once more in your debt, Mr. Nugent. I in yours, Miss Byrne. However so. Well, you're the first man or woman for many a year who's treated me like a human being. How sad. Spare your pity, I've earned the treatment I'm given. If you want to know how nearly a man can become a beast, I'll tell you. No, please. Oh, I had a proper enough beginning. Soldier father and a loving mother, too loving. I took advantage and she spoiled me right enough. It is sad to see what one sometimes does to another in the name of love. But we were a proper family, Miss Bird. Church every Sunday. That's where I first saw her. I a was uh, 17. A girl. An angel. I wanted to see her more, to, to see only her for all my life. I was forbidden. But you were young. There was time. No, there was no time. One Sunday in church, I looked for her. Gone. That lovely presence. She was an angel, and the Lord had called her early. Oh, how awful for you. I found a way to get back at them, at my family, my mother, with this. Whiskey. At 18, it became my one true friend. A mistaken notion that you were just a boy. I warmed my belly with it and left home. Trapped for the Hudson Bay Company a while. Became government Indian scout. And performed many brave deeds, I have heard. I did my job well enough. Like earning a reputation, a name, Rocky Mountain, Jim Nugent. I soon made it a name to be reckoned with. A name written across this country in blood. Mr. Nugent. Oh, there was a time when you should have seen me. Before the grizzly took my eye, sixteen golden curls across my shoulders in my scout's uniform with a bright red sash about my waist. Soon enough stained redder with blood. Please, Mr. Nugent, I don't wish to hear more. But you shall. I'm determined you shall hear it all. His story took hours to tell crowded with illustrations of a desperado's career, told with a rush of wild eloquence that was truly thrilling, as his proud, fierce soul poured itself out with hatred and self-loathing, blood on his hands, murder in his heart. He made me promise to keep one or two things secret, whether he were living or dead, and I promised, for I had no choice. But they come between me and the sunshine sometimes. Where are you going? Out there. I shall stay out on the open range until I know you're gone from my sight. Perhaps I shall lose myself, as I am already truly lost. I should as quickly as possible grant Mr. Nugent's wish of having me gone from his sight. For with the ascent of Long's Peak accomplished, there was nothing more to detain me in this wild mountain country. Our family is growing pretty big these days. We've got family members in nine different states, and Sears sure comes in handy. We can select gifts at the Sears near us, then bring them along on visits to our daughter in Seattle and my brother in Miami. And if what we bought isn't just right for them, they go to the Sears near them and exchange it. That's Sears. In their stores or through the catalog, Sears is where America shops. Sears, 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 where America shops. Understand you type fast. Yes. Accurate? Well... That's okay. You'll be typing on Sears' exclusive corrector electric typewriter with easy correction and more. It's Sears best. Try typing Sears' corrector typewriter. Whoops. Now, first, Sears is S-E-A-R-S, not Z. So, backspace to the incorrect letter. Tap the correction key. Now the mistake is blocked out. Next, type the correct letter. Then proceed. Yes, Daddy. Hey, look. In here, inside this stylish man's dress shirt. 
I'm a Sears Value Dress Shirt label, just popping with pride. Because Sears Value Dress Shirts are sure to be popular for a number of reasons. They have fashion spread collars, come in classic patterns and solids in short sleeves. You'll appreciate the permapressed polyester or polyester cotton blends for easy care. Plus, at low value prices, what a buy. Just look for me, the Value Dress Shirt label at Sears Men's Store, where style, sense, and satisfaction combine to label me right for you. <laughs> Lorne Green again with the concluding act of The Lady and the Outlaw. I wish there was a way to stop you, Miss B. There is no way, Mr. Evans. The winter is far from finished with firing or ammunition, you know. I shall be fine. And I'll give your love to Catherine and the boys when I pass through Denver. They shall be glad to see you, that's for certain. Thank you again for my Rocky Mountain home. Mind my little family of skunks for me, won't you? I will that, by keeping my distance. Goodbye then, Mr. Evans. Godspeed then, Miss B. Everything was buried under a glittering shroud of snow. The babble of the streams was bound by fetters of ice. No branches creaked in the still air. No birds sang. No one passed or met me. There were no cabins near or far. The only sound was the crunch of the snow under my horse's feet. There was the flash of a pistol close to my ear. I looked up to see what I took to be a stranger, strikingly youthful and handsome, with 16 golden curls falling down the collar of his Indian scout's uniform and the bright red sash about his waist. Mr. Nugent! I scarcely recognized you. Looking now as you once did, splendid in your scout's uniform, but would you send me out of your country in the same manner you welcomed me to it with a bullet? You're a foolish woman, Miss Bird. Even I, an old mountaineer, would be wary of riding down to the plains before winter is safely over. I shall fare as well as I see you have fared your stubborn winter's exile, Mr. Nugent. We are alike after all, you and I. We do what we fancy, when we fancy. It is time for me to leave your country, Mr. Nugent. Then I am here to escort you, Miss Bird. The trail becomes steep here. Watch your horse. I appreciate your providing me such a handsome escort into town. Mm, never thought I'd have occasion to ever don this uniform and sash again. And I must bring my riding skirt from my pack and subject my protesting spine to riding side saddle through the town. It is my one compromise with civilization. I must ask you to make another. Tomorrow, you must wear this. But I've never carried a gun. Not even in the wildest country, let alone in town. You've never ridden into town in such company before. You can conceal it beneath your skirt along with your old riding breeches. <laughs> accustomed to stairs as I rode into towns, but now riding into town alongside a notorious desperado, I saw more than curiosity in people's eyes. I saw fear and their own inclination to kill. There's a yard's good store, Mr. Nugent. My riding clothes are in sore need of mending. Well, go on in then. I'll wait out here in front. Stay, Ring. I won't be long. I'd like three yards of this material, please. Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, right away. Uh, uh, here you are, ma'am. How much do I owe you? Uh, owe me? Uh, oh, uh, no, uh, no charge. Uh, no charge. My pleasure. Oh, but I don't understand. Here. No, no, that's, that, uh, that's all right, ma'am. Uh, please, uh, just don't shoot that thing. Oh, the gun. I'm sorry, I, I don't usually carry... No, uh, you just take anything in the store you want, ma'am. Uh, uh, everything's fine, Mr. Nugent. She'll be right out. I'm very sorry to have caused a disturbance. 
Good day, everyone. Here, Mr. Nugent, please take your gun back. <laughs> and let's get out of here quickly. <laughs> should be just down this street, I think. Griff Evans' family will be surprised enough when they see me, but I imagine quite startled when they see you. <laughs> the boys will no doubt think I've come to eat them. Hello, Thomas. Uh, hello, Miss Bird. Who's that with you? This is Mr. Nugent. I doubt you've ever had a formal introduction. Mr. Nugent? Mountain Kim. It can't be. Pleased to meet you, Master Evans. You too, sir. Miss Bird. Oh, what a joy to see you again. I bring you Mr. Evans' love as well. Oh, and I've been kindly escorted down from the mountains by Mr. Nugent. You see, Mama, it's Mountain Jim. We've never formally met Mr. Nugent. I'm Catherine Evans. My pleasure, ma'am. And this is my youngest son, Thomas. He's a little frightened of you. He's heard stories. It's all right, young Thomas. I've sworn off eating little boys. Richard, you and Thomas, see to the horses. And uh, see to ring here as well, will you? <laughs> He's sworn off eating little boys, too. Come in, Miss Bird and Mr. Nugent. <laughs> Fancy, Miss Bird, all of Denver's going to turn out for the gala dance this evening, all in your honor. And you won't join them. I do wish you would. Of all people, I'd like you to be there. My husband, my son's a good friend or two. This is all the company I wish. All that I can take. I understand. The solitude of a mountaintop appeals to me far more than this evening, I assure you. But can you imagine, Mr. Nugent has agreed to endure the evening with me. I marvel at the great change that's come over the man. He's only returned to himself. Still, he is too quick with his gun. And I'm concerned about what could happen tonight if someone should anger him, or if he should drink too much whiskey. It's strange. He told me he had a dream. A dream? While we were camped out, on the night before we rode into town... He dreamed there was going to be a dance. But he couldn't have known. It wasn't planned. No one knew you were arriving. During the dance, in the dream, someone gave offense to me and Mr. Nugent felt obliged to kill him. But it... It was only a dream, after all. Yes, of course. It was only a dream. Right now, I'd better see to getting dressed. surely doesn't suit you. I have no need or liking for guns. They are only for cowards. But even I will have no need of one tonight. In your honor, I shall wear no weapons to the dance. Oh, Mr. Nugent, I'm so relieved. Well, you should be. I'll be much lighter on my feet. <laughs> Our fair city is honored by your presence, Miss Bird. Thank you. May I introduce Mr. Nugent? Well, I've, I've, I've heard of Mr. Nugent, but I... Uh, Never had the pleasure. Uh, you needn't worry. Any of you. Uh, out of deference to Miss Bird, I'm traveling light this evening. I'm here just to enjoy the festivities. May I, Miss Bird? Bloody disgrace. That's what it is. How's that? A countrywoman of mine in the arms of a common ruffian. A man who's run rampant over the countryside, killing, thieving, assaulting women. I ask you to unhand that lady, sir. You talking to me? Mr. Nugent. As you can see, the lady and I are having a dance. Uh, if you just simmer down and let the boys play their music... Shall we try again, Miss Bird? Sir, I insist on defending the honor of my countrywoman. <laughs> Why, now? <laughs> you wouldn't want to soil your lace cuffs and clean yellow gloves now, would you? <laughs> 
Relax, folks. Our young English dandy here is just feeling a little too big for his fancy britches. <laughs> oh, Mr. Nugent! Oh, shut him. Mr. Nugent. Too late, Miss Bird. Yes. Too late. Mr. Nugent, it's dark. It won't stop howling. I know. Take it back up to the mountains with you when you go. It is a child of the mountains, as he was. I wish you would stay a while longer, Miss Bird. He said we were alike. We do what we fancy when we fancy. I must get started if I want to make Greeley by sunset. is a playground of texture at Sears Junior Bazaar. Our classic blazer is touchable in cotton and polyester terry. Push the collar and the sleeves up, wrap it close, or let it breeze open. Slip a saucy pointel top underneath and you've got contrast. Or let each go solo in the sunshine. Finish with crisp coolness in polyester and cotton, poplin wrap skirts, and pleated pants. All mix and matchable in neutral and earthy tones from Junior Bazaar at most larger Sears retail stores. Hurry, hurry, step right up to most Sears retail stores for the Sears National Hardware Week sale. Take aim for special savings on these items. Save 40% on total regular separate catalog prices for a 70-piece mechanics tool set. Now just $59.99. Save $40 on a 5-horsepower rototiller and $25 off an attractive 20-inch bathroom vanity and top. Take home big savings. It's Sears National Hardware Week sale. Hurry, hurry. Prices may vary in Alaska and Hawaii. Join millions of Americans and shop the easy way with a Sears credit card. All you do to apply is call toll-free 800-526-0444. It's your entry to shopping convenience and quality merchandise. Your card will be accepted at over 3,600 Sears stores across the nation. And you can choose from over 100,000 Sears products and services. Even use it for your catalog orders in the store or over the phone. Just say charge it. Call 800-526-0444. New Jersey residents call 800-652-2777 for your Sears credit card. The Sears Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company, where our policy is satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Sears, where America shops. The Lady and the Outlaw was written by Shirley Gordon, produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Lorne Green. Our stars were Antoinette Bauer and Len Berman. Also heard were Norman Alden, Virginia Gregg, Brian Miller, Ben Wright, and Vance Colby. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. Art Gilmore speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Here's an important tax tip from the Internal Revenue Service. If you're 65 or older, there are some special tax breaks that you can claim. Like a double personal exemption. That's right, an extra $750 for yourself, and still another if your spouse also is 65 or older. And there are advantages if you decide to sell your home and move to a smaller place. There's also a tax credit for the elderly. They're all spelled out in one of IRS's free publications, number 554, Tax Benefits for Older Americans. You can get copies by calling the IRS toll-free number listed in your telephone directory, or you can order by mail. There's even an order form just for that purpose in each tax package. Use it to send for the Older American publication or any other IRS publication or form you need. Tax Benefits for Older Americans. Get all the details now so you can take advantage of the benefits on your tax return. Your long association.
Russian says smoke's not just your affair. That smoke screen that you puff around pollutes non-smokers' air. It's bad for kids and older folks with lungs not up to par. It's damaging for you, of course, but your smoke travels far. Your long association says please keep this thought in mind. It's double damage all around and doubly unkind. So try to keep the habit and give everyone a break. Please do it for your life and breath and everybody say. Your Lung Association and you know that cigarettes are a breathing hazard. Smokers, please don't add that extra offense. Give us a break for life and breath. Tomorrow's Sears Radio Theater will be a comedy with Andy Griffith as your host. Let's listen. What's the matter, Carl? You nervous? Nervous? Why should I be nervous? Well, maybe you think Marianne's going to tell you that she likes me better. Ha! This girl's got taste, believe me. I'm just wondering how we can restrain you after she chooses me. So be sure and tune in tomorrow to the Sears Radio Theater. I'm Charles Scott King, WNEW News. At nine minutes past ten, time for the Sears Theater. That's the theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight is a story of adventure with Richard Widmark as your host. What's that? Take your seats. What is it? I don't know, but fasten your seat belts. The ship is quivering. It, it may be an earthquake. If this ship falls over on its side, we've had it. Hey, rain! The sky was clear as we came through. Well, you can see for yourself. It's still clear above the trees. What kind of weather do they have here? The Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. Yeah, that was about two weeks after Dad had his stroke. Did he have high blood pressure? Don't know. He's doing a little better now, but he can't speak too well. Has trouble walking too, doesn't he? Yeah, it's truly a shame. You have high blood pressure? I don't know. I feel okay. I'm not high strung like Dad. Whether you're high strung or low strung, whether you feel just fine or not, has nothing to do with high blood pressure. High blood pressure is a major risk factor in stroke and heart attack, but it has no obvious symptoms. It can only be detected by a simple, quick, and painless test. The American Heart Association also wants you to know that black Americans, as a group, are more likely to have high blood pressure than whites. We don't know why. But high blood pressure can usually be controlled if it's detected. For more information, contact your American Heart Association. We're fighting for your life. This is Richard Widmark. Do you hear that? It's silence. We're in deep, dark space, and we hear nothing but silence. But there's a spaceship silently coming toward us. We can make out the name on its bow, the Omega. And there's a man looking out a forward port. He's in a vehicle that is moving almost with the speed of light. Yet he's as comfortable as if he were in an easy chair at home chatting with friends. I thought we were supposed to be the first ones up here. We are, Sloan. Then what's all this junk mean? He's right, Austin. There's a lot of space junk outside. Let me see, Stuart. Maybe it's from something we launched earlier, Sloan. Maybe, Ruth. No. No, we haven't sent a ship this far into space before. Somebody sure has, Austin. Look at all the junk. Well, maybe it came from that planet ahead. That planet's dead as it can be, Commander. No atmosphere around it. No nothing. We haven't seen the other side of it yet, Sloan. But it doesn't rotate, Austin. It'll be as dead on the other side as it is on this. Oh, speaking of dead, I'd better water the algae so we can keep breathing. I'll help, Bonnie. Uh, Stuart, try to reach headquarters by radio again. We'll call, Commander. Omega calling space agency. Come in, please. Omega calling space agency. Come in. Uh, 
Afraid it's the same story, Commander. It still doesn't work. Stu and I have even been outside, Commander. We've gone over the transmitting system with a fine-tooth comb. The agency isn't getting through to us, Austin. But maybe we're getting through to them. Send in hourly reports anyway, Stuart. We'll go, Commander. A spaceship with a crew of five, including two women. A radio that doesn't work. Space junk that nobody can account for. Oxygen supplied by algae. A dead planet that doesn't revolve and has no air around it. And that's only the beginning of our story. Sears Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Brought to you five nights a week by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops. Your hosts, Lorne Green. I'll bring you stories of the Old West and the New. Andy Griffith with a look at the funny side of life. Vincent Price with tales of mystery and suspense. Cicely Tyson with stories about love, hate, and related things. Richard Widmark. I'll bring you stories of pure adventure. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis production of... The Sears Radio Theater. Our story, Then There Were None, by Ted Sherdeman. Our star, Keith Andes. Dear, today I found the bedroom suite of my dreams at a great price. That's a coincidence. I found one that has all the features. Well, mine has authentic country styling. So does mine. Does yours have a beautiful 26-step finish? Nothing but, and I get a choice of 13 different pieces. All built to last for a long time? Yes, with sturdy tongue and groove construction and dovetail jointed drawers. Is yours Sears, Sears open, open hearth, hearth bedroom, bedroom furniture? furniture? Sears open hearth bedroom collection. Expert craftsmanship at a reasonable price. Select from 13 different pieces. Now at most Sears retail stores. Darling, I'm a mattress who knows what to wear. Solid color placale sheets from Sears Medley Collection, of course. This gorgeous sheet I'm wearing speaks for itself. The color is called Indian Sand. Isn't that stunning? I wear sheets of royal blue, lemon yellow. Sears has a dazzling selection of up to 24 colors. And the fit? Well, just look. I can't understand why mattresses wear anything but these smooth permapress sheets. Honestly, darling, I wouldn't wear anything else. Sizes from twin to king in most Sears retail stores and in the catalog. Sears Budget Shop has a vested interest in value. Vested dresses and vested skirt and pants sets in sizes 8 to 18. Styled just right for spring. They're romantic flounce dresses topped by vests. Tunic pantsuits coupled with vests. Also the tunic and skirt smartly finished with a vest. The vest, the season's fashion basic. Lots of exciting print and solid color combinations. So you can be choosy. Invest in fashion. Invest in value. Vested dresses and vested skirt and pants sets in the Budget Shop at most larger Sears retail stores. I can't believe they can do it for $19.99. Installed? The Illumini Sears Muzzler is only $19.99 installed. And listen to the Muzzler promise. Sears promises that the Muzzler will last as long as you own your American-made car. Or return it for refund or replacement free. And if Sears installed it, they'll install the new one free. Well, you can't beat that. I think that's fantastic. It's a great promise. The Muzzler, just $19.99 installed. Clamps if needed, 99 cents each extra. Sizes to fit most American-made cars. Prices may vary in Alaska and Hawaii at most Sears Tire and Auto Centers. The spaceship Omega speeds silently through the stillness of space. Its commander, Austin Baker, peers out a port at the dead, dark planet they're approaching. His attention is taken by Ruth Beatty as she offers him a pill. Time for dinner, Commander. Here you go. <laughs> I keep thinking this is an aspirin tablet. I can't get used to just taking a pill instead of having a meal. Yeah, me either, Sloan. But I must say, pills take up a lot less space aboard this craft. Takes up a lot less space in your stomach, too. I'm with Sloan Overton. I'll never get used to them. Yeah, they're convenient. Oh, may I have some water, please, Ruth? Oh, sure. Here. Uh, me, too. Thanks. Thank you, Ruth. You're welcome. These meal pills rob you of all the things you associated with eating. Like what? Conversation? 
I never conversed anyway. Usually read the paper, the ads in a cereal box, or watched TV. Oh, you must have been a scintillating dinner companion. You don't get command of a spaceship like the Omega by being a scintillating dinner companion. Maybe not, Sloan, but the thing that really worries me about these pills is where do I get the bulk, the fiber I'm supposed to have? Uh, it's in the pills. This little thing? Not a chance. Hey, Commander. Yes, Stuart. To the left of the planet. The entire left side is bathed in light. We'll be at the lighted edge in a moment. Want me to circle around it? Yes. You and Bonnie keep an eye out for launching sites. And Ruth, prepare to make photographs. We'll call, Commander. I'll slow the craft down and pass around the lighted edge. Same altitude, Commander? I think so, Stuart. I see the source of the light, Commander. So do I, Stuart. It's, it's that star. It looks dead down there, sir. Yeah. So it seems, Sloan. Well, what's that planet nearby? Well, it uh, it doesn't show on any of our charts, sir. For that matter, neither did this dead one. Well, that near planet must have atmosphere around it, Austin. It appears so, Stuart. And it rotates. That, that star must be its sun. Bonnie and I have seen no launching sites that could even come close to putting out all that space junk. We've seen no launching sites, period. The planet below us is dead. Well, let's have a closer look at that nearby planet. There's a lot of cloud cover, Austin. Yes, Ruth. But through it, you can see land masses and long stretches of what appear to be seas. Or water of some kind. And both ends of that planet appear to be covered with snow and ice. Like our polar caps, alone. Those are seas, Commander. Yeah, appear to be. It's very blue, isn't it? Hmm, one of the signs of a breathable atmosphere. Oh, by the way, the algae beds are doing beautifully, Commander. <laughs> Since they provide the oxygen we breathe, Bonnie, let's be grateful. Oh, I am. I even made some soup out of some of it. Ah, uh, at my urging, Austin. I can't stand those pills either, Commander. And they're more nourishing than algae soup. And don't taste as bad. How do you know, Sloan? It hasn't finished cooking yet. At least Ruth will get her bulk. No, right now, get to your cameras. I want a full record of this planet we're approaching. We'll call, Commander. We'll call. I'll take over the controls now, Stuart. Right, sir. We'd better slow our descent. Uh, give me some forward jets. We'll call, Commander. We're slowing, but not enough. More, Stuart. That's strange. We're at a... 100 kilometers now, Commander. I'm trying to hold it that soon. 95, 94, 93. More forward jet power, Stuart. Are we still losing, Sloan? 88, 87. We're caught in that planet's gravity field. 83, 82, 81, 80. I'll try full power, sir. Go ahead, Stuart. What are the readings, Sloan? 75. 74, 73, kill the jets. Switch to atomic power, Stuart. I'll try to turn the ship. 65, 64, 63. The atomic power is useless. What can we do, sir? The only thing we can, land. Use the power to land tail first. Now, if I can turn this thing... 57, 56, 55... There's a city below. See it, Bonnie? I can see vehicles, Ruth. They're on what looks like our freeways at home. They sure do. Call off the altitude, Sloan. One kilometer. In meters, Sloan. Six hundred meters. 500 meters. We're touching down in a forest of some kind. Well, let me know when we have ground contact. 200 meters. We must be getting close. The trees are towering over us. 100 meters. Get ready. Ground contact. Close jets. We're still in one piece. We're in a forest. I've never seen anything like it. It towers way above us. And it's so green. Take air samples, Stuart. We'll call, Commander. How come you landed here, Austin? I didn't have any choice, Ruth. We weren't supposed to land on any planet, just observe. I know. We got caught in this planet's gravity field. That's what the commander meant by saying he had no choice but to land. And uh, thanks to your skill, Commander, we were able to do it. 
Well, one thing I can say for it. You certainly picked a remote spot. I don't think anyone saw us land. I hope not, Bonnie. Ruth and I saw a city on our way down. We made photos of it. I'll give Stuart a hand, Commander. These trees, they're, they're like our grass, but so much bigger. Do you suppose they give off oxygen? Uh, can I give you a hand, Stuart? Well, I'm just drawing some of the air into this test flask from the outside. Uh, now, to test it. Uh, write down what I find, Sloan. Fine. Nitrogen, 78.9. Uh-huh. Oxygen, 20.95. Hey, that's good. So far. Argon, 0.93. Carbon dioxide, 0.03. Very good. Water vapor, about uh, 2%. Maybe a little less. Oh, not very humid then, huh? No. There's some dirty stuff mixed up in it. Uh, minute particles of suspended... Uh, yeah. Carbon and sulfur. What we call smog back home. Well, buddy, they've got it here, too. But the air is breathable. Well, Commander Austin Baker will be glad to hear that. Can't think of anybody who won't be. You know, I can't tell whether there's bark on these trees or not. We're up too high in the spaceship to see. Ah, Stuart, what did you find? The air is very breathable, Commander. We won't need helmets or oxygen units to support us if we go outside. No life support systems required. None. What's that? Take your seats. What is it? I don't know, but fasten your seat belts. The ship is quivering. It may be an earthquake. If this ship falls over on its side, we've had it. Hey! Rain! The sky was clear as we came through. Well, you can see for yourself. It's still clear above the trees. What kind of weather do they have here? It's ended. Stay in your seat, Ruth. You too, Bonnie. All of you. Weird. This ship has stopped shaking. Yeah, I know, Sloan. What do you make of it, Stuart? I don't know. The way that water started coming down, I thought we were in for a big one. I know. Shortest rainstorm I ever experienced. Me too. Oh, I guess it's safe enough now to unbuckle the seatbelts and leave the chair. Yeah. <clears throat> you want Sloan and me to look around outside, Commander? Yeah, we'll have to sooner or later. The sooner the better, Austin. Take a life support system with you just in case. It's not necessary, Commander. Arms, yes, but we can do without the life support system. All right. But check the breathability of the atmosphere before you venture too far away. We will, Commander. Come on, Sloan. And keep in touch with us by radio and pick vision. We'll go, Commander. Now, coming, Stuart. We'd better stop at the armory first. Right. <clears throat> Laser pistols. Three grenades apiece. Well, that should do it. And I'll take an atomic rifle just in case. Okay, Sloan, that does it. The personal radio's working? Well, we'll soon find out. The Sloan to Commander Baker. Do you read me? Read you fine, Sloan. And the thick vision is good. Stuart and I are going out now. Right. Now keep in touch at all times and turn back if you're attacked. We want the inhabitants to know we're friendly. Right. We won't use weapons unless necessary. Use weapons only to protect your own lives. Wilco, Commander. Out. Well, Stuart, let's go. Air is as breathable as we said it was. Right. Uh, we'll make a circuit of the ship, then head due north. Right. Let's go. From Sears, passion that fends off the storm, salutes the sunshine. Step out, military flair. These double-breasted trench coats get down to details. Choose olive green or khaki tan Dacron polyester and cotton, sizes 8 to 18. Another fashion winner, the new quilt trim sheared shoulder coat with self-belt. In chino beige polyester and cotton, sizes 6 to 16. Both coats come with a nylon lining. Fashion that fends off the storm, salutes the sunshine. In the coat department at most larger Sears retail stores. Light it, clean it, and love it during Sears Home Center Sale. With lighting buys that shine. Save $10 on four chandeliers with colonial, transitional, or country moods. Your choice, $29.99 each. And save over 20% on a 15-pound box of Sears laundry detergent. It removes more soil than the nation's leading detergent. So light it, clean it, and love it during Sears Home Center Sale till February 24th at most Sears retail stores. Prices and dates may vary in Alaska and Hawaii. Can't believe you owe the IRS that much? 
Well, when things just don't add up, you can count on a Sears desk calculator to help you add up what you don't owe. Add, subtract, multiply, and divide, then read the figures two different ways. 12-digit display or tape printout. There's a two-memory system that helps ease multi-step problems. Plus, its many extras make it a great time saver. Sears two-memory desk calculator now cut $25, just $99.99 through March 10th at most Sears retail stores. Prices and dates may vary in Alaska and Hawaii. Oh, here I go again. It's time to rent one of those steam-type carpet cleaners. Why rent? Now Sears puts power in a carpet cleaner you can own yourself. The power spray from Sears for easy home carpet cleaning. Power spray sprays hot water into your carpet, then sucks up the dirty water. You can see the dirt you get out, dirt you didn't even know was there. The Power Spray Carpet Cleaner, a convenient carpet cleaner you can own yourself. Available at most Sears retail stores. Kenmore. <coughs> Solid as Sears. The spaceship Omega rests tail down in a forest of green fronds. The air is breathable on this strange planet, however, and Sloan Overton and Stuart McGill are on an exploratory trip. They're armed with laser pistols, grenades, and an atomic rifle as they make their way through the jungle of towering green trees. They are watched and listened to on a pick vision tube in the control room of the spaceship by Commander Austin Baker and the two women, Ruth Beatty and Bonnie Clare. Well, we, we, we should have brought machetes to hack our way through this stuff. Take more than a machete to cut through these trees. Chainsaws would be more like it. Well, there's no bark on these trees. They've no trunks at all. They're green all the way to the ground. Yeah. What's this? A steel wall? Oh, it's, a, it's a metal of some kind. Help me scale it. Can you reach the top? Okay. It's uh, it's kind of flanged up here and almost a meter in width. And, hey. What do you see, Sloan? Well, it it ends right down there or, or begins. It, it begins there and there's another wall across from this one. It's identical and, hey, wait a minute. There are, there are divisions here of, uh, of wood or something that looks like wood and... Do you suppose this is a railroad track? I'll go to the end and try to get up there with you. Uh, uh, Commander Baker, uh, do you read me? Loud and clear, Sloan. Is the picture clear, too? Very clear, and the girls and I agree with you. It is a railroad track. Yes, I agree. For extremely large people, no doubt. No doubt. Uh, Stewart's coming into the picture now. Yeah. Oh, I, I see you made it all right. So that end down there, it has no bumpers. But you're right, Sloan. This must be a railroad track. And these are ties. Follow it. Uh, we'll go, Commander. Come on, Stuart. Uh, uh, there are signs of rust. Maybe this was abandoned. Oh, why was it ever put down in this jungle of green trees to begin with? I don't know. But it was constructed by a race of giants, that's for sure. Well, let's hope we don't run into any. Oh, man. Can you imagine how large their trains must be if this is just the track? No. And I don't want to. How, uh, how far apart would you say the rails are? Oh, ten meters. About. We should have brought a tape so we could get accurate measures. Do I see the end of this track? Well, uh, you sure do. We see the end of it, too. What do you make of it, Commander? I don't know. That track begins nowhere and comes to an end nowhere. Doesn't make sense. Whoever put it down must have had a change of mind. Well, at least they didn't skimp on it. It's, uh, it's beautifully built. Even at this end, as well built as the other. I'll help you down, Sloan. Uh, no sweat. A slight jump ought to do it. Okay. Come ahead, Stuart. Sloan, Stuart, I think you'd better come back to the Omega now. Whatever you say, Commander. Uh, we'll go, Commander. If we keep that wall... Oh, I, I keep calling it that. Uh, that, uh... That rail to our right will uh, we'll wind up at the spaceship. Right. Let's go. Commander, I made a map of this area, what we've seen thus far. Good, Ruth. I don't know what good that'll do. Well, Bonnie, it at least can go in the log to show what we saw right after we landed. Well, it's all I did it for. I... Oh! 
Oh, well, there it is again. Fasten yourselves in your seats, girls. Sloan, Stewart, take whatever cover you can. Another quake. It's a clear sky above the trees. Maybe we don't get... I was wrong. We get rain again. That was shorter than the other one. It's real strange. I, I can't explain it. This ship began to sway like crazy. If it goes over on its side, we've had it. I know, Stuart. Well, the ship is steady now. Yes. Take off the seat belts. Uh-oh, strap them back on. Here we go again. This swaying is making me sick to my stomach. Well, if we fall over, you won't have that to complain about anymore. Well, we've lost the picture. Can you hear me? Stuart, Sloan, come in, please. Come in, please. Oh, uh, our radio's out, Stuart. Probably this downpour. I don't understand well, it. The sky's clear as a bell above the treetops. There's not a cloud in sight. I'm drenched. Uh, there's no shelter around, that's for sure. I don't understand it. What's going on? These earthquakes followed by short torrential rains. Oh, buddy, don't look at me for an explanation. I think we better get back to the spaceship. We turn south at the end of this wall, or track. Uh, Commander Baker, do you read me? The ship can't hear us. That means the pick vision is gone, too. Oh, meaning the commander can't see or hear us. That's right. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What's that? Where? I, uh, I thought I saw something moving off, uh... Off to the left. I don't see anything, Sloan. I don't either right now. Come on. Let's keep going back to the Omega. I can see the end of the wall ahead, Stuart. The track, Sloan. I see it, too. We turn south there. Do, 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 you, do you see what I see? Where? Oh, my God. Stuart, I, I... I don't know what it is. It, it looks like a giant dinosaur of some kind. We'll take cover. I'll use the atomic rifle on it. It's a lizard. Or a reptile of some sort. It's gigantic. But nothing can survive this atomic rifle. You hit it, Sloan. It's... It's, it, it's not going down. Another hit, but, it, but it's coming this way. Use your grenades and your laser pistol. The atomic hits have only angered it. Can you see through the smoke? It's still coming toward us, Sloan. Maybe a blaster in this laser pistol. Sloan, run for it. The beast is still coming. Just a few more grenades. Stuart! Stuart, where are you? Over here, behind this tree. I can't see you. I'm right here, Sloan. Oh, my God! Can you hear me, Sloan? Stuart? I've checked the circuits, Commander. I can find nothing wrong. We still have no sound or pick vision, Ruth. How long has it been now? Exactly three and one half minutes, Blunny. Well, they should have been back by now. Want me to check the entrance hatch? No, Ruth. Hey. Hey, here's our trouble, I think. A huh? fuse blown. Oh, I'll get an extra commander. Right away. Wonder what happened. The quakes? Well, maybe. But it's the first time. Here's a new fuse, commander. Oh, thanks, Bunny. Now to try it. Sloan, Stuart, do you read me? Hey, we're getting a picture again. I hear you, Commander. Am I coming in? We hear you fine now. And we've got a picture, too. Sloan's gone. Gone? Sloan? What happened, Stuart? I... I don't know what it was. A, a dinosaur, a lizard, reptile, whatever. It was gigantic. We hit it with everything we had. The atomic rifle, laser pistols, grenades. All they did was anger the beast. It... It got Sloan? It had this long tongue, and it it, it swallowed him whole. Oh, how horrible. Oh, it makes me sick. We see you clearly, Stuart. Where you are and all. Walk straight ahead, and you'll be in the Omega within minutes. I can't see the spaceship from here. But we can see you. Keep walking. I, 
I can't stop thinking of a Sloan. Keep walking. I am, I am. I, I can't see the spaceship. Well, it's probably hidden by the trees. Come straight ahead. The atomic rifle, the grenades, the laser pistols, they only infuriated the, the months. Keep walking, man. He's in a day. The atomic rifle is supposed to destroy anything. He said it was a dinosaur. Or lizard. Or a reptile. Whatever. It must have been gigantic to withstand a hit from an atomic rifle. What's he walking into? Stuart, what is that? Well, I, I, I don't know. It's sticky. I, I walked right into it before I ever saw it. Stuart, look out. What is it? It has six legs. Shiny black. Look on its stomach. An hourglass of red. I, I, I can't get loose from the stuff. Use your last grenade and the laser pistol to defend yourself. Oh, it's like a huge giant spider. Yeah. I, I can't get loose. Stuart, I've got to help him. It's too late, Commander. The spider has stung him. Stuart, Stuart, can you hear me? He's dead. Oh. No, the spider... Oh, I can't watch. He's gone. Stuart's gone. Uh, what kind of planet have we landed on? I... I don't know. Giants. All carnivorous giants. First Sloan, now Stuart. There are only three of us left. That's right. You, Ruth, and me. How do we get out of here? That's a good question, Bonnie. I don't know. Gravity forced us to land here, and gravity may keep us here. Oh, these giant creatures, they're impervious to our weapons. Nothing we do has any effect on them. Maybe... Maybe what, Austin? I was just thinking maybe Sloane and Stewart haven't died in vain. Maybe we can learn something from their deaths. Like What? Well, to keep away from these giant creatures, we must not antagonize them in any way with our weapons. What do you plan to do? We can't stay in the spaceship indefinitely, Ruth. It's only a matter of time before one of those creatures discovers the Omega. That's exactly what I was thinking, Bonnie. Well, then what's your idea, Austin? To find or, or dig a cave someplace. We'll live off the land as long as we can, but we can't stay here. Take your seats. Strap down. Oh, yes. Oh. Just another reason for leaving this ship. If one of these quakes should tip us over, we've had it for sure. Sears Radio Theater will return after this message from your local station. Here's a tip from your Better Business Bureau. Are you looking for a nursing home? Well, here are a few tips. Start by getting a list of the licensed facilities in your area from your local health department. Find out whether they are certified to receive Medicare and Medicaid payments. Also, talk to your friends and talk to your neighbors who've placed a family member in a home. You see, it's important to visit a nursing home to check the facilities and the services. For example, food handling, patient care, in-service staff training, housekeeping, and patient activities. Now, before you sign an admission agreement, you read it carefully, including the fine print, and ask a lot of questions about what's included in the price. A number of nursing homes charge extra for such items as wheelchairs, air mattresses, and personal laundry. A tip from your Better Business Bureau. If you have a child with a handicap, we have some good news. And some very good news. The good news is there's a new law that guarantees your child the right to the special education he needs. Evaluation procedures conform to the corresponding requirements in the final regulation of Section 504. But here's the very good news. The term continuum, as with least restrictive environment, is commonly used by... You don't have to hire a lawyer to explain how this rather complicated new law can help your child. It is in accordance with specific performance criteria related to the program objective. We can explain the law. In clear, simple language. Free. Information under sub-clause E of clause 1 of subsection B. The commissioner there... Just will. write Closer Look, Box 1492, Washington, D.C., 20013. That's Closer Look, Box 1492, Washington, D.C., 20013. A public service message on behalf of the United States Office of Education. <laughs> Come
Commander Austin Baker of the spaceship Omega doesn't face an easy decision. He and the two women left on the spaceship Omega are doomed. So their only possible choice is to leave the craft and seek survival in a cave that they can either find or dig themselves. I don't know what good our weapons may be against the hideous creatures we may find, but well, being armed will make us feel better. You know how to use this atomic rifle, Ruth? Yes, Austin. Bonnie? We went through the same training with them as you did, Commander. Yeah, a training that never prepared us for this, unfortunately. Laser pistols, grenades. Uh, if we have to dig a cave, we should have entrenching tools. Yeah, I thought of that too, Ruth. For you, for Bonnie, and for me. What about food? I've got vials filled with meal pills. At least we won't starve, Bonnie. Well, I guess we've got everything. Let's go. That's what I like about you, Austin. He closes the doors if he was coming back. <laughs> Who knows? We may. <sighs> All set? Ready. Set as possible. Nothing outside. Come on. I'll take the lead. Follow me. The trees are even taller than they seem. Hold it. I see some of that sticky stuff Stuart got caught in. Where? Right ahead there. Any sign of that spider-like creature that got him? I don't see it. Oh, me neither. All right, follow me closely. I'll try to lead us around the stuff. It seems to be web-like. Uh, these trees are so thick. Keep your eyes open for that giant spider. Uh, don't worry. I am. Yeah, we're nearly around the sticky stuff now. Well, is, is that the railroad track ahead there? Yes. Is that the same one we saw in the pit vision? The same. I don't know whether we'll find one, but keep looking for a cave. We've been walking nearly an hour, and we're still in one piece. Well, that's something, Ruth. Wait. Cross down. Um, what are those things in the distance? I don't know, Bonnie. But they're walking in a line. They're following each other. Well, there must be... I've lost count of them. Well, they're huge. Oh, horrible things. Yeah, they're like... Well, at home, they were tiny insects called ants. See the mandibles and antenna? Oh, these are anything but tiny. Oh, they're so big. Edge back so and see us. Oh, we were lucky we weren't attacked. Attacked? Ruth, we'd have been carried back to their nest and fed to their queen. What's this? Wait, it, it, it seems to be rubber of some kind. It goes up so high. Why, it's even higher than the trees. Is, is that material of some sort above the rubber? I think that's a canvas like cloth. At least it's not alive. And look there. Bonnie, don't go wandering off by yourself. There's there's round, shiny metal with something through it. Do you know what we found? What? I think it's a shoe, like a sneaker. An abandoned shoe? I think so. Look at the length of it. A sneaker-like shoe from some giant. And that material from the round eyelets. I, I guess those are laces. It's so big. Oh. <gasps> We took photographs of a city on our way down. So Bonnie told me, Ruth. What, you think this is a shoe from one of the inhabitants? That's my guess. It's a pretty good one. I'll buy it. I, I, I think we'd better find a cave before we get stamped on. Oh, I'm for that. Follow me. Is there no end to this bar? What? Oh, I, I didn't say anything, Ruth. Well, at least we haven't been attacked by anything. Like poor Sloan and Stuart were. No, but stay alert, Bonnie. <gasps> oh, uh-oh. But there it goes again. Lie down. Bonnie, lie down before you're knocked off your feet. The earth is shaking. It's another quake. There's the rain again. Oh. Uh, we're in for a soaking. It's a deluge. Wait, wait, be still a moment. 
I heard gurgling. There must be an underground river beneath us. I can hear the water rushing through. I can feel it. I'm soaked. Well, we're on top of an underground river. I don't hear it anymore. Can we get up? The earth has stopped shaking now. That's strange. The sound has stopped. Uh, what did you say, Ruth? I asked if we could get up now. Oh, yeah, sure. I don't understand it. Oh, I'm soaked through and through. I heard water flowing like a, an underground river. Didn't either of you hear it? Oh, I was trying to keep from drowning. Me too. Well, so was I, but I still heard it. Well, we'll, we'll try to find higher ground. Follow me. The trees are still dripping from that last downpour. Do you suppose we're in a rainforest, Ruth? I don't know. Maybe if I scaled one of those trees to see where we are. Well, how can you, Austin? There are no branches on these trees. I know, Ruth, but... Oh. Huh? Oh, no. They've spotted us. All three of them. Oh, what oh, are those things? I don't know, but they're gigantic. Oh, shiny and black. And look oh, at those mandibles. Like monstrous beetles. Oh, use the grenades first. Oh. Take that, you hideous creatures. The grenades had no effect on them. Oh. Use it! I Neither can I! Frank, where Me. are you? Um, backyard, water beetles all over the place. Did you get them? Yep. Well, what the heck is that? Oh, piece of track. There's a dumb kid's tennis shoe. Dunk on it. What else did that boy leave outside? No. Oh, here's another one of his toys. Well, his mother's got some answers to do, believe me. Laura! All through, Frank? Yeah, I'm through. Would you come here? I want to talk to you. You know, it's just ridiculous. Are you all through fixing the sprinklers? The sprinkler timer, Laura. The timer was screwed up. The sprinklers work fine. Well, the timer then. You fixed it? I said I did. Now, look there. Where? On the table. Oh, Frank, how many times must I tell you not to put your shoe... Why, oh, it's Junior's sneaker. Mm-hmm. He's been looking all over for it. You know where I found it? Where? In the backyard. Oh, he'll be so pleased. Well, I'm not. You're not? Do you have any idea of how much these cost? What with inflation and What was it doing in the backyard? I don't know. All right, where's the kid now? Oh, play. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe.